All right, so we want to welcome everybody. We'll call to order the Metropolitan Planning Commission meeting for June 22nd, and we'll welcome everybody, and I hope everyone is having a good start to your summer. Um, and commissioners, uh, we are on item B, which is the adoption of the agenda, and the agenda was sent out earlier uh, and posted, and so is there a motion to adopt the agenda? A motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and the agenda is adopted. Now we are on item C, which is the approval of the June 8th, 2023 minutes, and those were also posted and sent out earlier. And is there a motion to adopt the minutes? There's been a motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And the June 8th, 2023 minutes are adopted. So now we're on to the item D, which is the recognition of the council members. But before I get to, to that, I'm going to, commissioners, I'm always going out of order sometimes. I apologize. But I do want to just take a quick minute to recognize um, two new commissioners to the commission. And the first one is here. And his name is Denny Marshall. If you'll raise your hand, say hi, wave to, to everybody. Well, welcome, Denny. Commissioner Marshall has been involved in this community for a really long time. And um, in getting to know him, uh, he graduated from TSU in 1978. He's been watching us and uh, the city grow. Uh, has been a um, mortgage banker in the city for over 37 years and been in finance um, industry for over 43 years. So we, uh, we're getting another expert, um, another really good person that loves this community. And we just want to welcome you to the commission. We appreciate your willingness to serve as a volunteer like we all are. And if you just want to say a few. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that introduction. And certainly look forward to working on the commission and getting to know each one of you all much better and certainly look forward to serving this community i love this community i've invested in this community my family is growing up in this community so therefore i have the same interest that the community have is to see a good vibrant community nashville is i've been offered positions to move all over the country i'm not going anywhere this is where i want to be this is where I want my family to be. So thank you all so much. Look forward to working with you. Thank you, Commissioner. We appreciate that. The uh, other commissioner who is not here uh, tonight, his name is Matt Smith, and we'll recognize him uh, when he's here. But Matt confirmed on Tuesday, he was confirmed on Tuesday night. Um, prior to his appointment, he let us know that he had a previous conflict with being here. And so I just want to make sure we'll introduce him uh, when he's here in person at the next committee meeting. Uh, at the next commission meeting. So we just want to make sure uh, we're glad to have uh, Commissioner Marshall. Thank you. All right. So we are now on to the recognition of the council members. And uh, we just call you when we see you all come in first, first come, first basis. So I saw um, Councilman Campbell. Where's Councilman again? There we go. Come on up. Welcome. If you want to come. Thank you for hearing me today and thank you for your service. I want to speak briefly about number 30 on your agenda. It's a request uh, to rezone from commercial to mixed use, no, no short rent term rental for a property located at 1259 Dickerson Pike. Dickerson Pike is a major uh, fairway in District 3. It's a four lane uh, road state route. And uh, this project proposes to build 60 units of uh, four sale units, 12 of which would be live work units, uh, the rest townhomes and cottages. So it's a bringing a diverse mixture of housing options uh, to this area that we don't currently have. Uh, we had one community meeting about this project uh, and there was no opposition expressed during that community meeting and I haven't received any emails in opposition uh, since then. The developers have worked with uh, myself and the community in addressing concerns related to density. I think the initial proposal had 79 units and they came down uh, to 60. Also making sure that uh, they are addressing infrastructure 
uh, needs around the property in regards to uh, stormwater and, and sidewalks. Uh, we're excited about that. So for those reasons, I support the project and ask for your support today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. I appreciate that. And just a reminder to the commissioners, you have to be real sensitive on the pushing of the button. So you got to go slow. Just a reminder. And then another one last reminder is if everybody puts their phone on, on silent, we, we really do appreciate that. So there's no interruptions when you all speak. All right. So next we saw Councilmember Rutherford. Come on up. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the commission. It's good to be with you today. Um, my, uh, the item for my district, I believe, is item number seven on your agenda. And uh, I, can, I can say that this has been something that's been in the works for um, a little while now, um, dating back several months, maybe up to a um, um, year, year and a half or so from the in initial inception. There's been a lot of um, community engagement with this, several community meetings. And uh, I can uh, attest to there being uh, quite a bit of support in the area for it. And uh, I have received a little to, to, to no um, uh, uh, negative response. I've had a few folks that have reached out in terms of uh, asking some questions, but in terms of uh, uh, actual opposition. Um, there's been little to, to, to none uh, to this point. Um, there is a, an email, a rather lengthy email showing support that I received on, uh, literally as I got here and I decided to forward it on to you. You probably haven't had a chance to read that yet, but uh, you, you have had it. I wanted to show that to you because it was, uh, uh, it gave some good uh, detail and good insight uh, as a uh, supporter of the uh, uh, project. And uh, the uh, development team on this is uh, no stranger to the district and is no stranger to the um, uh, to building in the district. And so I think that's a factor as well in terms of uh, those who have shown support um, because of the work that's been done previously uh, in the in the area from this team. And so I think that's a positive thing in general. And I'm just here to, sh to show you my support for for what they are proposing and encouraging you to move it along in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. That was item 7A and 7B, I believe. Yep. Okay. All right. I saw Councilman Rosenberg. You want to go now? Come on. Up. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thank y'all very much. Good to see y'all. I'm here to speak on item one, uh, A and B. It's the Bend at Bellevue and community plan amendment. Um, comes with a positive recommendation. I'd like to, again, give, uh, offer my strong support for the proposal. Comes with really great public investment, um, parks, greenways. Um, it's well, it fits well into the community. It'll be very good for the community, and I'm excited to see it move forward. Um, after it leaves the Planning Commission, there'll be additional community engagement on it. Councilmember Hauser and I are co-hosting a community meeting next week to uh, give residents a chance to uh, address concerns related to social media rumors, um, learn more about the plan, and um, discuss ways to make it even better. Um, so I, I would appreciate your support tonight so we can continue that conversation, and thank you all for your service. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate you coming down. All right, next to us, uh, Councilman Murphy. Where'd she go? There she is. Welcome. Good to see you. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to address, there's item 15 on your agenda. It is uh, to defer to the July 27th Planning Commission meeting, but I just wanted to let you know that uh, they have not been seemingly to take, they haven't been super open to taking the, the community plan and staff's feedback, and they haven't had a community meeting in two years. And so the, just the proactive communication hasn't been there, and I've told them they just need to wait for the new council member and start the community process over there. So I hope that helps your staff, and I wanted to just go ahead and get that on the record that maybe that could get moved out of the way for your future meetings, because I know we have a lot going on in the next couple weeks. Um, so then I also wanted to address item number 33, which is the St. Thomas Hospital District Amendment. This is one that um, I did initiate the amendment to this SP, and I really appreciate that St. Thomas is here, um, and we have been working together. We have a little bit more to work out, but I believe that if y'all would allow Jim 
Murphy to either speak or give a thumbs up or a nod that we are um, that they are okay to move this forward tonight um, and we're going to work out a little bit of details on the conditions once we get to council um, and so this is the one that I'm just trying to get some of the commitments that were made in public and at community meetings and things in writing given the um, the the extensive hours that that my community put in on the nearby property the Bellmead Plaza we learned a lot from that and so looking at this SP I just wanted to get some of that in writing and so I don't know if y'all are would be willing well, to hear from him or just a so council since you requested it as a council member and um, he they don't want to pull it off the consent so our rules don't really allow him to speak right now but I think we, I could ask the commissioners if there's an objection, if there's not an objection, and we generally don't do this because anything that we do creates precedence. Exactly. But since you requested it, he can't speak until if we, unless we pull it off right. and have a public hearing. To me, that, that makes sense and would be okay. Now, commissioners, is there an objection? Seeing no objection, just a very... One minute, Mr. Murphy, because you lawyers get crazy up here. Okay. I All promise right. I'll be quick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. As Councilmember Murphy indicated, we've been working with Councilmember Murphy and planning staff to try to get a better understanding of what the scope of this amendment is. Uh, and we have reached agreements on many of the conditions. We've still got a little bit more work to do, but we're not in a position to be in opposition or in support at this point. And so in order to say that, I didn't want to take it off the consent agenda, which made it look like we were in opposition because we're not, we're trying to come to an agreement that works for both of us. We are supportive of the goals she has indicated that she's trying to achieve. And we just want to make sure that we can get the details right so that my client can be comfortable. Thank you. Publicly supporting. Thank you. Perfect. Council lady, I think that worked out fine. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. And then I'll stay, I'll stick around for the uh, last agenda in my district. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Director, do you see any other council? Oh, council member Tooms, there you are. Come on up. Welcome. I'm trying to look around the whole room. You're right there. Councilwoman Hauser and Councilwoman Evans are also here. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. Uh, I have several items on your agenda. Item two is a plan amendment to change one of the neighborhoods in my district from T4 mixed use to T4 neighborhood maintenance. The trajectory of this neighborhood has been very dense housing on narrow streets. Much of the zoning in the area allows for STRs, which contributes to the intense density and crowding on narrow streets. Residents in the area have asked for a more neighborhood feel for them and their families, reducing the intensity of the density will allow this. Item number 19, the applicant for 840 Young's Lane met with the residents of Lathan Court, an area recently placed under a conservation overlay, which is right next uh, to this address to get feedback so that the design uh, could be created that didn't impose on the neighbors. I also held a community meeting where the applicant presented. There wasn't any opposition. Consequently, I support this project. Item number 23 is the Ewing Drive and, and Knight Road. I continue to receive feedback and opposition to this project, primarily from the same neighbors and some new ones that have um, reached out to me recently. There is confusion in regard to the graves on the site as well as the proximity to the Rock Quarry. The applicant needs to clarify what will be done with the existing graves and that no buildings will go on top of any of the graves. Additionally, clarification is needed in regard to the required distance between the Rock Quarry and new construction. There also continues to be concern about traffic. However, what the applicant can build by right will also bring additional traffic to the area. If the commission determines that the project fits within the land use policy, I am comfortable having continued community meetings to discuss the density and the traffic. Uh, given the opposition that I continue to hear, but also looking at the uh, applicant who continues to make good faith efforts, I don't have a position for or against the project at this time. Item 35 and 36 are contextual overlays for the Hillhurst and Oak Park subdivisions, respectively. I've done multiple contextual overlays during this term. Both Hillhurst and Oak Park are established neighborhoods and are a couple of the first neighborhoods that allowed African-Americans to own homes. Both remain majority African-American neighborhoods. 
Both are well kept and the neighbors take great pride in their community. Many residents in both neighborhoods have expressed to me a desire to maintain the character of their neighborhood. So of course I support both of those. Item number 41 is a plug cancellation. It is part of a larger project in my district for which I have held multiple community meetings to get the project to a point that the majority of constituents could support it. So I support the plug cancellation. Item number 44, this rezone request involves multiple parcels close to the intersection of Old Buena Vista Road and West Trinity Lane. There is significant development on either side of these parcels. I am pursuing the rezone of the parcels so that future development of those particular parcels is consistent with surrounding development but respects the existing neighborhood that is on Old Buena Vista Road. And that's it. Thank you. That's a lot, Council Aid, but that's, that's okay. All right, Council Aid Evans, you want to come on up? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, commissioners, for uh, allowing me to speak today. I've got two items on your agenda that will actually be on your agenda, not deferred. Uh, the first is item number 17, 13, 25, Tulip Grove Road. This is a project that um, is adjacent to a church. It was church, uh, the church owned these parcels. Um, they worked with the potential developer to come to a determination about what they'd like to see adjacent to the church um, and held, we held a community meeting um, last year, uh, or actually it was earlier this year. My years are blending together, but we did hold a community meeting specifically about this project um, with folks within the thousand foot boundary um, of the project. And I had a couple of residents that had some very minor concerns, which were addressed as part of the, um, the, the comments from planning um, and so I've not received any negative feedback about this particular project and I am in support. Um, item number 22, Misty Cape Cove. Um, this is an infill project that will allow additional density uh, within an established kind of cul-de-sac basically. And um, this project has had a couple of rev revisions and comments from planning uh, and I'm in support of the revisions uh, that the owner has made. Um, the only negative comments I've heard have really been about some properties that are adjacent to the parcel, which is really more about the construction process as opposed to kind of the land use or the policy. So I am in support of this project as well. And thank you. Thank you, Council Lady. Next, I saw Council Lady Hauser. Welcome. Good lovely afternoon, folks. I don't have anything in my district on your agenda, but I wanted to take this time. I had sent to you all an email, which you may or may not have a chance to read, that there's a project that's right next to my district that impacts my district. And I wanted to make sure that you and everyone here that has any questions or concerns about the ARISA project knows you are going to have an opportunity next Thursday, a week from today, uh, at six o'clock at the Bellevue Community Center, we are having a question and answer session that there will be people from planning, from NDOT and the developers to actually be able to answer the question. So the people with the, the answers will be in the room and the whole purpose of that meeting, it's not a presentation, it's answer all the questions. So before this comes before council and the public meeting at council, there will be this opportunity. And I just wanna take this time to let both the commissioners and anyone here that has uh, any questions about the ARISA project to know, they will have another community meeting opportunity prior to the community meeting at Metro on the 6th. Thank you, Council Lady. And, and you're speaking of item number one, correct? Yes. Sir. Okay, excellent, thank you. All right, so I saw Council Member Hall. Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here on items 37 and 38. These are two contextual overlays for adjoining neighborhoods. Um, we've had a few of these in the past. The only difference between these two items is um, because earlier this year, we had some folks in one of these projects or one of these areas have issues with wanting to subdivide some lots. And we realized that land policy didn't match with that. And you had neighborhood maintenance bumped up against neighborhood evolving. But you've got a lot of new construction, new bills, um, averaging three times what the average home price is in the area now. And so this just comes in and over top of that says that 
for that area for the Fairview Creekwood um, contextual overlay that you won't be able to do any multifamily. And that's all this is, is keeping it to single family homes and not subdividing those lots multiple times, um, which is in line with Nashville Next and what we learned or took away from those earlier rezones this year. The other one for Enchanted Hills, Ashland City Highway, um, this is just connecting to one that Council Member Toombs did earlier in the year for the what's formerly known as the Gold Coast. Um, that area averages 2,700 to 3,500 square foot homes on an acre lot. And what this overlay does is come in and just creates a floor. It's capping us at 2,100 square feet, um, not going over two and a half stories. If it's already there, it can stay there, but it keeps that neighborhood from being like some of the others that we've seen um, over the last few years, where somebody will come in and pick up two houses in a neighborhood that have an acre plus each and level them and put eight or 10 in between those. So this just keeps that historically black community and Gold Coast the way it is moving forward. Appreciate you guys' support. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. All right. All right, excuse me. Now, this is a good time to remind everybody that we're a professional group. We're volunteers. We're citizens just like you. There's no clapping, cheering, booing, disrespecting anyone, or we'll stop the meeting, clear everyone out, and then when we get the chaos under control, then we'll start the meeting again. So we want everybody to speak, and that you have to follow the rules of the commission. And so no clapping, no cheering. I appreciate it, but this is the wrong place. It's not a place to clap or cheer, and it won't help honestly, so keep it professional, everyone. And I know you can do it. That's our contract together, okay? All right. Okay, so director, I think, I don't think I see any other council members. You could throw a rock in here and hit a couple council members. There's so many of y'all. All right, I don't see any other council members. There's some former council members, a lot of those too, but no current council members. Okay. All right. So we are on item E, which is items for deferral or withdrawal. Lisa, are you going to take us through those or, oh, it really is. Okay. Excellent. Okay. <clears throat> item E, items for deferral or withdrawal, starting on Page four of your agenda. Item number three, 2023 CP 014002 Donaldson Hermitage Old Hickory Community Plan Amendment. Staff recommendation is to defer to July 27th. Item number four, 2023 Z003 TX001. Staff recommendation is to defer, defer to October 26th. Item number five, 2014 SP 050002. 4214 Central Pike Amendment. Staff recommendation is deferred to July 27th. Item number six, 2015 SP 069003. Shelby Woods East Nashville Amendment. Staff recommendation is defer indefinitely. Moving on to page five of your agenda, item number eight, 2023 SP 019001. The Meadows staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number nine, 2023 SP 032001, 316 Homestead Preliminary SP. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. On page six of your agenda, item number 11, 2023 SP 041001, 330 and 332 Homestead Preliminary SP. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. On page seven of your agenda, item number 15, 2023 SP 054001, Charlotte Pike Mixed Use SP. Staff recommendation is deferred to July 27th. Item number 16, 2023 SP 056001, Reserve at Harpeth Lake. Staff recommendation is to withdraw. On page nine of your agenda, item number 24, 2018 S059003, Orchards Phase 3, staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. 
Item number 25, 2018 S059004, Orchards Phase 2. Staff recommendation is to defer indefinitely. Item number 26, 2019 S039002, Payne Road Subdivision. Staff recommendation is deferred to July 27th. Item number 27, 2023 S026001, Martin Reserve Subdivision. Staff recommendation is deferred to July 27th. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 29, 2023Z037PR001, staff recommendation is deferred to July 27th. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 34, 2023SP005001, Riverside at Metro Center SP, staff recommendation is deferred to July 27th. On page 13 of your agenda, item number 46, 2023Z078PR001, that's a rezoning at 99 Bridgeway Avenue. Staff recommendation is to defer to September 14th. And that concludes our items for deferral withdrawal. Thank you, Amelia. And so commissioners, the items for deferral or withdrawal are the following, and Amelia, make sure I get these correct. They're items number three, four, five, six, eight, nine, 11, 15, 16, 24, 25, 26, 27, 29, 34, and 46. Is that correct? That's correct. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items for deferral withdrawal. Is there a motion? There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it, and those items are deferred or withdrawn. Now we're on to item F, which is the consent agenda, and Amelia will lead us through that again. As noticed to our public, items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the audience or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. I will run through all of the items on our tentative consent agenda and ask if anyone is in opposition. Um, if you are here in opposition and would like the item to be presented, um, please raise your hand and we will note that that item uh, will be heard tonight. Um, if no one is in opposition to the item, the item will be on the consent agenda. Okay, starting on page four of the agenda, item number two, 2023 CP003004, Bordeaux, Whites Creek, Haynes, Trinity Community Plan Amendment. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the tentative consent or on the consent agenda. Hold on, Amelia. I think, uh, is anybody here in opposition for item number two? I thought I saw a hand. No? Okay, perfect. Okay. We will, no, thank you. Um, we will keep. Hold on, we need to check one more time. It, is anyone in opposition here for item number two? Y yes. There's one hand, yeah. Okay. Take it off the consent. That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Um, on page five of your agenda, item number 7A, 2017 SP087004, the Hill Property SP Amendment, and the associated case item 7B, 2023 SP016001, the Village at Autumn View. Is anyone here in opposition to these items? Okay, don't think I saw anyone. The item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 10, 2023 SP 040001, 4057 Maxwell Road Residential SP. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the consent agenda. On page six of your agenda, item number 12, 2023 SP 043001, Nolensville Pike SP. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 13, 2023 SP 051001, Bell Center Place. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. 
Item number 14, 2023 SP 053001, Davidson Street SP. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. On page seven of your agenda, item number 17, 2023 SP 060001, 1325 Tulip Grove Road, lots one through four. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 18, 2023 SP 061001, Music Circle North. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. On page eight of your agenda, item number 19, 2023 SP 062001, 840 Young's Lane. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 20, 2023 SP 063001, Hamilton Village SP. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 21, 2023 SP 064001, SNAP Housing, 429 Humphreys. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 22, 2023 SP 065001, Misty Cape Cove. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 23, 2023 SP 068001, formerly 2022Z 109PR 001, Night Drive and Ewing Drive SP. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. On page nine of your agenda, item number 28, 2023 S063001, Thornton Grove PUD phase 4A. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 30, 2023-Z054-PR001, a rezoning at 1259 Dickerson Pike. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 31, 2023-CP005-001, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 32, 2023-Z006-TX001, an amendment to Title 17. Um, is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 33, 2013-SP018002, St. Thomas Hospital District Amendment. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. On page 11 of your agenda, item number 35, 2023-COD004001, it's a contextual overlay. Um, is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Item number 36, 2023-COD005001, a contextual overlay district. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Item number 37, 2023-COD006001, a contextual overlay district. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Item number 38, 2023-COD007001, a contextual overlay district. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? Same 37 and 38? Yes, okay, that item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Thank you. On page 12 of your agenda, item number 39, 2023 NL001001, uh, John E. Lawrence and Sons Grocery Neighborhood Landmark Overlay. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. 
Item number 40A, 2023-Z080, PR001, and the associated case, item 40B, 177-74P008, Lakeview Century City PUD cancellation. Is anyone here in opposition to items 40A or 40B? Those items will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 4168-85P003, Cumberland Terrace PUD cancellation. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 42, 2023-Z063PR001. It's a rezoning um, in Wedgwood, Houston. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be on the consent agenda. Item number 43, 2023-Z072PR001. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 44, 2023-Z073PR001. It's a rezoning on Old Buena Vista Road. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? That item will be placed on the agenda to be heard. Item number 45, 2023-Z077PR001. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? Item 45 will be placed on the consent agenda. Item number 47, 2023-Z079PR001. It's a rezoning along McClellan Avenue. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. And on page 14 of the agenda, item number 48, 2023-Z083-PR001. That's a rezoning along Cleveland Street. Is anyone here in opposition to this item? This item will be placed on the consent agenda. Um, so that concludes our tentative consent agenda run through, and then I'll run through it um, with the captions now. Thank you, Amelia. Hold on one second. To clarify, item 49, the renaming of Forest Avenue, was that, were we planning to present that one? Can we just confirm um, the process there? Because that's a little bit unusual. Yes, on street renamings, um, if we receive, if we receive um, notes in opposition, uh, we send out notification and give people a certain amount of time to send in comments. If we receive notes of opposition, then we're required to hold a public hearing. Okay, so 49 would be not on consent. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, at the end of the council term, just so that both commissioners and the public know, we just get a heavy volume of, of bills. So this is a little bit heavier than normal. And so uh, appreciate everybody's patience. It's gonna be a, um, a little longer meeting, but it's normal for the end of the council term. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So for item, the items for uh, the consent agenda, which is um, passage as a group are the following. And so Amelia, if, just make sure we keep me straight, okay? Yeah, I'll actually go ahead and run through all of the ones that were put on the consent agenda. Oh yeah, I'm jumping ahead. So um, thank you. Eager to so get So you're recognized started. again. Okay. Um, as information for our audience, um, if you are not satisfied with the decision made by the Planning Commission today, uh, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the Planning Commission's decision to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met. Please be advised that you should contact independent legal counsel. Um, so now we will run through all of those items um, on the consent agenda with a brief caption. Starting on page five of your agenda, item number 7A, 2017 SP 087004, the Hill Property SP Amendment. This is a request to amend a specific plan along Warbler Way. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and to disapprove without all conditions if the associated SP is approved and disapprove if the associated SP is not approved and that Associated item is 7B, 2023 SP 016001, the Village at Autumn View. That's a request to rezone from AR2A and SP to SP. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. 
Item number 10, 2023, SP 0400014057, Maxwell Road Residential SP. That's a request to rezone from AR2A to SP for properties at 4057 Maxwell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page six of your agenda, item number 12, 2023 SP 043001, Nolensville Pike SP. That's a request to rezone at 21 a request to rezone to SP at 2180 Nolensville Pike and 2182 Carson Street. Uh, staff recommendation is to approve with the conditions and disapprove without all conditions, including the modified conditions in the memo that you received um, this afternoon. Item number 13, 2023 SP 051001 Bell Center Place, a request to rezone from AR2A and CS to SP for properties along Bell Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page seven of your agenda, item Number 17, 2023, SP 060001, 1325, Tulip Grove Road, lots one through four. That's a request to rezone from RS 7.5 to SP for properties along Tulip Grove Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 18, 2023, SP 061001, Music Circle North. That's a request to rezone from ORI to SP for properties along Music Circle North. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page eight of your agenda, item number 19, 2023, SP 062001, 840 Young's Lane, SP. That's a request to rezone from RA to SP for property along Young's Lane. Staff recommendation is approved with conditions and disapproved without all conditions. Item number 20, 2023, SP 063001, Hamilton Village, SP. That's a request to rezone from AR2A to SP for properties at 3654 Hamilton Church Road. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 21, 2023, SP 064001, SNAP Housing, SP at 429 Humphreys. That's a request to rezone from MUL to SP for property at 429 Humphreys. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Item number 22, 2023, SP 065001, Misty Cape Cove, a request to rezone from R15 to SP for properties at 200 to 204 Misty Cape Cove. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. On page nine of your agenda, item number 28, 2023 S063001, Thornton Grove PUD phase 4A. It's a request for a final plat approval to create 29 lots along Brick Church Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. On page 10 of your agenda, item number 30, 2023Z054PR001. That's a request to rezone from CS to MUNANS for property at 1259 Dickerson Pike. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 31, 2023CP005001, East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. That's a request to amend the East Nashville Community Plan Amendment. Um, Sorry, that's a request to amend the East Nashville Community Plan. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 32, 2023Z006TX001. Uh, this is a request to amend Title 17. Staff recommendation is to approve the amendments to Title 17. Item number 33, 2013, SP018002, St. Thomas Hospital District Amendment. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions, um, including those modified conditions in the memo um, that you received today. On page 12 of your agenda, item number 40A, 2023Z080PR001. That's a request to rezone from RA to ORI for property at 15th Century Boulevard. And the staff recommendation is to approve in the associated case item 40B, 17774P008, Lakeview Century P City PUD cancellation. The request is to cancel an existing PUD at 25th Century Boulevard and a portion at 15th Century Boulevard. Staff recommendation is to approve if the associated rezone is approved and disapprove if the associated rezone is not approved. 
Item number 416885P003, Cumberland Terrace PUD cancellation. That's a request to cancel an existing PUD along West Trinity Lane and Buena Vista Pike. The staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 42-2023-Z063-PR-001, that's a request to rezone various properties in the Wedgwood-Houston-Chestnut Hill area. Staff recommendation is to approve. On page 13 of your agenda, item number 43-2023-Z072-PR-001, that's a request to rezone from IR to MULA and S for properties along Hagen Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 45, 2023-Z077-PR-001. That's a request to rezone from RS5 to R6 for property at 2400 Buchanan Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Item number 47, 2023-Z079-PR-001. That's a request to rezone from R7.5 to R8A for property along McClellan Avenue. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions. On page 14 of your agenda, item number 48, 2023-Z083-PR-001. It's a request to rezone from SP to RM15A and S for properties on Cleveland and 5th Street. Staff recommendation is to approve. Um, and then items on... Um, under H, other business, item number 50, new employment contract for Anna Catherine Atkinson. Item 51, bonus height certification memo for second and stockyard. And item 56, to accept the director's report. Thank you. And I think we have some additional information on item two. Director Kemp. Yes, uh, Chairman, it's my understanding that item 2, 2023-CP-003-004, the Bordeaux, Whites Creek, Haines, Trinity Community Plan Amendment in Councilwoman Toombs' district may also be included in the consent uh, items. So let's just make sure. Is there anyone in the audience that objects to item number two? All right, seeing none, without objection, we'll put it on the consent. Will you read that item, Amelia? Yes, item two on the consent agenda, item on page four of your agenda, 2023 CP003004, Bordeaux, Whites Creek, Haynes, Trinity Community Plan Amendment. That's a request to amend the community plan in the Bordeaux, Whites Creek, Haynes, Trinity area. Staff recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Without objection from the commissioner, seeing no objection, we'll put item two back on the consent agenda. And so, Amelia, let's go through these slowly to make sure that we have the correct items to be passed on the consent agenda. The items are the following. Items number 2, 7A, 7B, 10, 12, 13, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 28, 30, 31, 32, 33, 40A, 40B, 41, 42, 43, 45, 47, 48, 50, 51, and 56. Is that correct? That is also what I have. All right, commissioners, you've heard the items to adopt on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Is, is there a motion? Motion, second. Second, any other discussion? Saying none, all in favor say aye. Opposed, no. Eyes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. Chairman, forgive me for interrupting. It sounds like there might be another staff update on items to go back on consent. Okay, Lisa, uh, we sometimes, uh, as information and the council members talk to folks that they see in the audience, which we really appreciate, um, is there an update on any other item potentially going back on the consent agenda? Um, yes, Councilmember Toombs was able to speak with the person that had a concern and related to item number 44. Um, and during that conversation, um, it was determined that they do not have a concern with item number 44 and that that one can go back on consent. All right, let's, so commissioners, I, I just wanna make sure, cause we wanna, so, Item number 44, will you read that, Lisa? Yes, uh, that is 2023-Z073-PR-001, a rezoning on Old Buena Vista Road. So is there anyone in the room objecting to item 44? 
Seeing none, is there a motion to put from the commissioners to put item 44 back on the consent agenda? There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Opposed no, ayes have it. Item 44 is adopted on the consent agenda. And for the record, the staff recommendation was to approve. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. All right, Commissioner, so the, this, these will be the items to be considered tonight on public hearing. That's items number 1, 14, 23, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 49. So we have nine items tonight to be considered. And so before we do the presentation. This is just some of, there's some people that have never come. We have, um, uh, they have attended uh, the meeting. And so very quickly, this is the, the process. Number one, like I said, keep it professional. Everybody has time to speak under our rules. Um, we do, the staff will do a presentation on the item. We'll open the public hearing. The applicant has 10 minutes to speak and they can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. And then we, we have anyone that's wishing it to speak in support first and everybody will line up behind the microphone so that we, because we have so many items, we ask that you line up when we call the item. And then anyone wishing to speak in opposition, will have everybody line up behind the podium and everybody wanting to speak in opposition will go. Then we'll have, uh, the applicant will have a two minute rebuttal and then the council member uh, goes and then we close the public hearing and that's when the commissioners deliberate. And so we've, on a few items, on one item in particular, item one, we have already had the public hearing. Uh, we've had, and so we're, that portion is closed to public comment at this time. There'll be more public hearings, one at the council. There's gonna be a listening session as we learned tonight. Um, and so that particular item, item one is, uh, we are on deliberation and we have finished the public hearing at this uh, public at the Planning Commission. So we are ready for item one. Although, wait a second, hold on. Before we get going, I did see the councilman. No, nope, councilman. Kevin Roden, you need to, we always let the council members go, but, well, that's weird. He's got nothing to say, a council member. Can you believe that? <laughs> Thank you, councilman. We appreciate you very much. <laughs> he's talked out. Eight years later, he is talked out. All right, thank you, Councilman, appreciate it. He's a good friend of ours, we appreciate him. So, all right, so we're on item one. Anita. Hi, Commissioners. I'm Anita McKegg with the Community Plans team, and I'll be presenting item 1A, request to amend the Bellevue Community Plan. You heard these presentations back in March, but especially since we have a couple of new commissioners, we thought we would do a brief uh, refresh, brief presentation. So this property is located uh, in Bellevue, Highway 70 off Highway 70. Here's the uh, one Bellevue place, which is the former Bellevue Mall. You've got Interstate 40, the Harpeth River and Coley Davis Road. This is the property, 44 acres, and it's adjacent to approximately a 51 acre new park. So the policy today is rural maintenance and conservation for the floodplain. Staff recommendation is to approve a policy change. So we analyzed the request for suburban neighborhood evolving policy and is it appropriate? So let's discuss a little bit of why staff feels that a policy change is warranted. So as I mentioned, rural maintenance is the current policy today. It was um, put in place with the last comprehensive update of the Bellevue plan. That time access is key, it's critical here. Currently the property is accessed by the end of Morton Mill Road. A gravel driveway goes across at grade the CSX railroad tracks. And so because of limited connectivity, this property and the one next to it had rural maintenance applied. Since that time, the property adjacent property has been uh, donated to Metro Parks and has become a new park. 
So when the applicant requested suburban neighborhood evolving policy, what does that really mean? It means it can allow a variety of housing types, but it also meant they needed to solve the connectivity question. So in order to do that, we recommended that they explore building a bridge that crosses the Harpeth to connect to Coley Davis Road. As part of community engagement, planning uh, staff facilitated two community meetings. There also were a number of other meetings held by the council members Rosenberg and Hauser. Um, as we mentioned, as previously mentioned, the council districts are split along, the, along that line, along Coley Davis and Morton Mill. So different factors we look at when we analyze a property change, a policy change, sorry. From the big level picture, big picture, Nashville next, then the Bellevue Community Plan, all the way down to the location of the property, its geographic characteristics, and the surrounding context, open space mobility networks. So let's start with Nashville next, growth and preservation concept map. You look at this map, and here's the property outlined in red. What you see is part of the green network for floodplain and uh, sensitive natural features. Then you see it's adjacent to a center, a mixed use center, uh, possibility for transition infill along Highway 70, another center here, large residential areas uh, with small neighborhood centers shown by the pale yellow neighborhood policy. But you can see quite a bit of green network and open space uh, network along here. So when you go down the next level to the Bellevue Community Plan and you look at the land use policy context, once again, that's refining the big picture. So you start to see, okay, here's the, the open space adjacent, the new park here, the soccer fields here, here's a mixed use center. Here's Highway 70 with its access to Interstate 40. And you also can see from this that the orange and yellow represent the suburban transect. So you can see that this is a suburban area predominantly. Once again, with a lot of natural features. And you look at the, the aerial of the existing built environment and you can see different lot sizes, big box stores with the mixed use center, I-40, the interstate, road networks. Now we also did an analysis of density in the surrounding area. And so in looking at this, we said, okay, what's the current density look like today? And you can see the brown uh, six to 11 dwelling units an acre. You can see the mixed use center in red there. And so we pulled the number then from what the development was proposing, what their density is proposing. So what does it look like? Would it still fit in? And so it fits within the brown as the adjacent surrounding areas do. Next, we look at the open space and mobility networks. And you can see here, as I mentioned, the main issue and problem to solve was the connectivity. So if you build a bridge, connect to Coley Davis, then you're also close to a WeGo Park and Ride. You're also close to a bus line along Highway 70, a commuter route along Interstate 40. But what else, you know, you're limited in how you can connect streets. So what else can you connect? And there is um, segments of the Harpeth River Greenway that can be connected. So we ask that, that those segments be connected. You can help improve access to the new park, which currently doesn't have access and is not programmed. And so when you put all those together, you've got the makings of the open space and mobility network. So in analysis and the summary, we felt that uh, T3 neighborhood evolving policy, suburban neighborhood evolving policy is appropriate. It supports greater housing choice adjacent to a national next center. The conservation floodplain area is preserved. It fits in with the surrounding context of suburban policies. Streets in the nearby I-40 interchange provide access. Multimodal bridge connects to Coley Davis. And as I mentioned, we go park and ride, greenway access, connect greenway segments, and the applicant is providing several public benefits, which Logan will go into a little bit more detail. Staff recommends approval of the policy change for the non-floodplain portion of the property to suburban neighborhood evolving. And commissioners, just a reminder, we're hearing both 1A and 1B, and Logan's gonna take us through 1B. And yes, we'll, thanks. we'll uh, the discussion will be both, but then we'll take a vote separately. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. My name is Logan Elliott, the Planning Department, and I'll present one of the, the associated rezoning case, the Bend at Bellevue SP. The request is to rezone property from AR2A to SP zoning to permit a multifamily development, and staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions if the associated community plan amendment is approved, and if the associated community plan amendment is not approved, then staff recommends disapproval. Uh, the site is currently zoned AR2A. It's approximately 44 acres to the south in the Harpeth Crest subdivision is RS20 zoning. Uh, to the east uh, across the Harpeth River is RM9 multifamily zoning. And to the west on Coley Davis Road is a mixture of low density residential uh, designations. And Coley Davis Road is an arterial boulevard in the major and collector street plan. Uh, the policy, as Anita described, is proposed as suburban neighborhood evolving with conservation policy remaining on the floodplain areas. Um, here is the site plan again, running through this quickly. The orientation has changed so that now north is on the right side of the screen where Coley Davis is shown. Um, and the plan includes 417 multifamily units across seven buildings. A bridge is proposed to be built from Coley Davis Road to the subject site, and this bridge would be built by the developer as a requirement of the zoning and would be within public right of way. And this bridge would also provide access to the adjacent 51 acres that uh, has been donated to Metro Parks and would also provide access to the 20 acres of floodplain on the subject site that is proposed to be dedicated to Metro Parks. Uh, the bridge would cross the western edge of the Harpeth River Park um, and a turn lane is shown onto the bridge there and that would need to be coordinated with NDOT at the final site plan review process. Um, looking at the site plan, the two buildings closest to the bridge from Cully Davis Road on the right side of the screen here would be four stories and the remaining five buildings would be three story buildings. Uh, they're centered around interior courtyards with surface parking and garage units wrapping the buildings. Uh, the at grade crossing that currently exists would be converted to an emergency access only uh, access point and this would be a typical fire emergency access situation. Um, the application includes elevations to show the architecture style and massing of the proposed buildings. Uh, the application also includes renderings now. Um, so we'll go through the three renderings that have been provided. The first you see is looking from Coley Davis Road interior to the site. This is that uh, rendering. The second rendering is internal to the site looking south towards Morton Mill Road. And then the third rendering is from the end of Morton Mill Road looking into the site here. Uh, the plan, uh, the property here is identified in the Metro Parks Master Plan as having priority greenway. Um, the extension from the current terminus to the Bellevue Center is identified as a priority greenway. And the applicant proposes to build this greenway across the, the current rail line as a component of this project and staff is recommending that this be a condition of the zoning. Uh, there's two options currently identified in the SP for ways to cross the railroad. One is a tunnel under the railroad and the other is an underpass bridge situation under the, the rail bridge. Um, and an update following the May 25th staff presentation, um, CSX has provided an additional letter indicating that uh, they've reviewed the SP plans and that CSX will review the engineering plans for both proposals if the SP is approved um, and that the review would be contingent on CSX conditions. Um, and this is, uh, this is clarifying information that staff previously presented where uh, concerns were previously raised by CSX with the tunneling option, uh, where now CSX is clarifying that both options are essentially on the table for review with the final site plan application. Um, so just highlighting the, the greenway components of the site, um, the applicant would be building the greenway extension, building a greenway along the Harpeth River frontage of the property and setting up for future extension on the 51 acres to uh, set up a potential complete loop in this bend of the Harpeth River. Um, 
So in addition to the Greenway, uh, the plan also proposes to raise Coley Davis Road out of the 500 year floodplain. Um, looking here on the screen, you can see the dashed lines that indicate where the 500 year floodplain is located. Um, the lowest point is by the curve in Coley Davis Road. Um, and in response to this current e existing condition that will sometimes leave uh, Coley Davis Road inaccessible during rain events, the applicant is proposing to raise Coley Davis Road above the 500 year floodplain elevation for this entire area. Uh, this is about three feet in the lowest location and is about half a mile of public roadway that would be improved. Um, Metro stormwater is requiring that any floodplain modifications associated with the raising of this would be offset on the, the subject property so that there'd be no floodplain volume decrease. And uh, the applicant has also provided a draft analysis demonstrating the impacts to the flood mapping of the Harpeth River associated with this project. And that draft analysis shows no downstream or upstream impact to the regulatory 100 year floodplain. Um, and this would need to get reviewed by FEMA and ultimately by water services at a later date, but they have provided the draft analysis. Um, additionally, Coley Davis Road, uh, when it was, when it's raised would be improved with multimodal conditions and the final conditions will still need to be worked through with NDOT, uh, as the engineered plans are prepared. And it's likely that the multimodal features will be focused on just the Southern side of the road away from the interstate. So to summarize the offsite improvements, um, the applicant would be crossing the railroad with the construction of a greenway, uh, identifying the master plan. They would be providing multimodal access to the 51 acres of Metro Parks property. And in addition to 20 acres that is being proposed to be dedicated to parks, they would be raising a public roadway out of the 500 year floodplain and improving the multimodal conditions on that roadway simultaneously. Um, so in staff's review of the application, staff finds the proposed SP to be consistent with the suburban neighborhood evolving policy. Uh, the residential land use and suburban development pattern are consistent with the guidance providing the community character manual. And staff finds the subject site to be an opportunity to introduce a moderate density and suburban housing type. Uh, given the site's context and it, the connectivity that is being provided with the SP plan. Um, additionally, the conservation policy is being addressed with the preservation of the floodplain areas. And, um, and that completes staff's recommendation. Thank you, Logan. And so a reminder to the commissioners before we start discussion side on, we have finished the public hearing. We're currently in discussion. Uh, and on 1A, we need six votes. And then also, I do want to say and ask that Commissioner Marshall watched, is it, uh, did you watch the video concerning this? We just need it on record. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. All right, and so we'll start, um, since we have so many items, Commissioner, we'll try to do it like we usually do instead of calling on each of you. We'll start with Commissioner Tibbs, and then if there's more discussion, uh, after that, Commissioner Tibbs, you want to start us off, and then we'll see if there's anybody else. Um, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, it's, and I'm going to first just really quick say I agree with the uh, the policy change based off just that that area. Um, so moving on to the SP, and then someone else may talk more about that. Um, and I, uh, well, let me just say I I agree with it too based on the policy change. I uh, still, if there was a little bit more openness to the rest, I think it'd be something that the uh, applicant could look at. But as far as disapproval, you know, I, I do support it. I won't try to belabor with a lot of words to that. But but definitely with all the conditions of being um, uh, the greenways and uh, the bridge and everything, I think, is, and which is all part of it. So I don't need to reiterate that. But I think it's when you put all the benefits together that... Uh, that it makes it make a lot more sense. Uh, so I'll keep it short. That's uh, I'm uh, agreement with staff recommendation. All right. Any other discussion? I just want to uh, want a clarification. You mentioned the CSX railroad issue. Can you expound on that a little bit more for my benefit? And then also 
um, in 2010, this property flooded and this 500, uh, changing it to the 500 year flood plan will cure that problem going forward. Uh, so to address the 500 year flood plan question first, the, the applicant is proposing to raise the road out of the 500 year flood plain, Coley Davis Road, which would reduce the likelihood of that road flooding. It's still possible that it could flood under an extreme rain event, but it would be reducing the likelihood that it floods. Um, concerning the, the CSX item in the Greenway, um, the Greenway currently stops at the rail line and this applicant has engaged with CSX to try to identify options for crossing the rail line with the Greenway. Um, and CSX doesn't typically get involved in development review necessarily. Um, so it, it's been a challenge for them to kind of review a plan that's still on the table uh, with, with Metro and their zoning review process. But they have uh, now given Metro a letter indicating that both of the options identified in the SP plan are, are uh, options that they're willing to consider and review with more detailed and engineered plans at a later date and that they would first want the zoning to be put in place. So th there's been a process of working with CSX to understand what they would be willing to consider and what they would not. And at this point, they've confirmed that both of the options in the SP plan are are something they're willing to consider for crossing the rail line with the Greenway. I will just say, having worked with CSX a fair amount, typically they want information in the inches and feet. I mean, it's a very detailed level of review that's typically much more detailed than what we would have at a preliminary SP phase. And so that's why we condition that if for some reason we're not able to reach an agreement, then the project you know, can't move forward with that condition. And so um, I think this is the best that we can get from CSX at this, with this level of information, the applicant will have to provide a lot greater level of detail to the inches and feet um, to get CSX ultimately to a place where they would say, yes, that's an option we would consider or not. Anything else, Commissioner? <laughs> Commissioner Clifton. <clears throat> Well, we've heard this twice before. Um, originally, um, it was pretty astonishing how much the developers had done and how much they wanted this, but what its streams they went to in terms of raising this out of the floodplain. And I, sorry, just a, in my review of input from the community, um, people whose primary concerns were environmental, um, fairly much went away with that fairly uh, dramatic <laughs> uh, move on their part, um, without which this can't be done, as I understand it, won't be done. Um, so I was feeling better about it than the, the last time it came up, there was uncertainty about CSX and, <clears throat> and I have, was unable to um, support, it, support it at that time for various uh, reasons of uncertainty uh, about what would happen. It was, unclear to me at the meeting, but clearer now that if CSS comes back uh, and says, well, we thought it would be okay, but it's not, then it's not okay. And it won't happen. And that's exactly what the situation is in spite of, uh, although there are people here who, who don't seem to believe that, they, uh, that that is the case. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So for the for all of those reasons, I'm, I'm supporting it at this point. Uh, and part of the, <clears throat> the other part of it is uh, the connectivity and the closeness to, to both um, bus tra transit and also the interstate. It really, the more you think about it from that standpoint, it is, it is a unique um, achievement that, that, that it's gotten this kind of, um, that they have made the kinds of concessions they have at the request of, of the city. Uh, so that's kind of where I'm at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, since then, you know, I'd like to think about it. And I think at the last meeting, uh, this is procedurally, we have to approve uh, community plan change first, and then SP. So I am still concerned, what if 
the developer meet all the condition or did not meet all the condition and you know uh, for whatever the reason uh, SP did not uh, come through but uh, T3 neighborhood evolving policy will survive and I talked about it in you know planning staff in the right mind will not put too much density without proper access so by doing so would that be possible you know since we are thinking about t3 neighborhood evolving policy would that be possible to kind of add a condition like a, such a supplemental policy if this sp does not come through regardless uh you know t3 evolving policy is condition of access such as bridge condition of uh, greenway connectivity a condition of uh, you know Corey Davis uh, road improvement if there is such condition uh, attached to with as a you know supplemental policy if as a commissioner we can uh, guide direct uh, the staff to put that supplemental policy I would feel much, much more comfortable to going and moving into that direction. So would you talk about that? Yes, I reflected on the discussion at the previous meeting and I, I, the, the commission has precedent in National Next to create supplemental policies that are more specific around areas such as connectivity and the like. And so if the commission wanted to entertain approving this policy uh, amendment before us and direct staff to ensure that the conditions are captured also in a supplemental policy, I believe that's in your discretion to do so. That would be great because one of the uh, you know concern is having uh, approving this and sometimes I hope you know, we are not approving for the developer to fail. We are approving developer to uh, bring a great uh, project to the community, uh, to the community's benefit. But sometimes it did not happen. And so years later, just the policy survive and there's no access, no improvement. Uh, that will be detriment to the community. So we'd like to uh, ensure that will not happen. So if, you know, at the right time, if, you're, if your colleagues agree, I would recommend approving the change of the policy to the suburban neighborhood evolving on the non-floodway portion of the property with a direction to staff to capture the conditions for greenway and mobility connectivity as a supplemental policy uh, within that policy, within that neighborhood evolving, and that would uh, be um, reflected in the National Next Update as part of this policy amendment. That's great. So thank you. So I will keep that in mind. And I think there was uh, additional, uh, you know, lots of public comment coming from the public in recent days. And although, you know, our I'm talking about SP now. We do have lots of condition uh, because this SP is based on the condition. If a project does not meet such as, uh, you know, approval or agreement from the CSX, uh, this uh, project cannot move forward. And also I understand there's some uh, pending uh, lawsuits uh, in regards to the easement. I just want to ask uh, our legal counsel, is it our purview to decide regardless of the uh, pending uh, lawsuits? That's correct. You can go ahead and make a decision today, regardless of that the lawsuits will run their own course. Thank you. So to reiterate that condition, so if lawsuits were successful and uh, applicant does not get access, so in that time uh, this project unfortunately cannot move forward but as a commissioner since it is a condition we can consider as a part of the condition and move forward that's correct you can place the conditions that you would like to place thank you so 
I think with that, you know, very airtight condition, because that is up to developer to do great job and provide great benefit to the community. And if uh, for whatever the reason developer failed to do so, unfortunately, this project does not move forward. But when, you know, uh, with added condition to if we were to move forward to approve it, I feel much better with added condition. So I'd be interested in if any other commissioner has additional comment. Any other discussion? Well, we'll need a motion. So who would like to make a motion? Commissioner Johnson, you wanna make a motion? So I would like to make a motion to approve one a with uh, added condition that uh, direct uh, staff to have supplemental policy with uh, listed in the condition. So probably or greenway and mobility, yes, right? Greenway mobility and, and CSA. Yes, CSX agreement. Okay, that's proper motion. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And Commissioner Johnson, you want to make a motion on 1B? Yes, uh, I will make a motion to move, approve uh, 1A with conditions. Oh, we already did 1A, so you'll be oh, 1B. I'm, I'm sorry, 1B. 1B with conditions. Thank you. That's a, that's a proper motion. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. And 7 0 on both votes, just for the record. All right. So. That concludes item 1A and 1B, and we are on item 14. And so we'll, I think a lot of people will be getting up, so maybe we'll give everybody just a one minute to get out of the room real quick. And if everybody could try to find a seat, we have plenty of seats now, and that way you're not, we're not blocking the entryway or anything. We appreciate it. The fire marshal appreciates it. If everybody could, could exit the room as quickly as possible, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, Donald, are you ready? I think we're good. Already, thank you. Um, good afternoon, I'm Donald Anthony with the Planning Department, and this is item 14 on your agenda. The request is to rezone four parcels with 15.55 acres along the south side of Davidson Street to SP to permit a mixed-use development. Staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. The subject property is currently falls within two zoning districts. Uh, the two westernmost parcels are zoned MUGA and the two easternmost parcels are zoned IWD. Adjacent zoning includes IWD, RS5, SP, and RS, uh, excuse me, and R6 on the north, IWD on the west, and R6 on the east. The surrounding area includes a mix of land uses. Uh, Shelby Park lies to the east. One and two family residential uses are prominent on the northeast and industrial uses are present on the west and northwest and the Cumberland River uh, lies to the south. The applicable policy for the subject property is T5 Center Mixed Use Neighborhood or T5MU. Please note that the policy map does show conservation on large portions of the property. The community character manual indicates that T5 areas should be focused on the built environment and not as much on the conservation policy. Um, with that being said, any development on the site will be subject to Metro's stormwater regulations and floodway and floodplain development standards. The T5 MU policy is intended to maintain, enhance, and create high intensity urban mixed use neighborhoods with a development pattern that contains a diverse mix of residential and non-residential land uses. 
The image on the screen shows the scope of the proposed SP. This is a regulatory SP. Um, you'll note that the eastern and western portions of the SP are not contiguous as the property at 1200 Davidson Street is not part of this SP. The image on the screen shows the site in relation to the river and it labels uh, the floodway and the associated buffer zones. The SP would permit all uses that are allowed in the MUGA zoning district with a few exceptions. Uh, condition one in the staff report lists several um, uses that would be excluded. These include things like car washes, pawn shops, and drive throughs There would um, also be a prohibition on short-term rentals. Specific uses and users have not yet been identified. However, the traffic Im impact study that was uh, scoped for this project included up to 1,750 multifamily residential units and 120,000 square feet of non-residential uses. The SP would require that 75% of the ground floor, ground floor frontage on Davidson Street uh, would be occupied by active uses uh, through most parts of the development. The SP is broken into four zones, which are shown on the screen. Uh, zones A, B, and C are on the west, and zone D is on the east adjacent to the park. Maximum building height would be determined based on the zone. Uh, the development would step down in height from west to east, such that the highest buildings would be farthest from the residential areas and the park. In zone A, which is the western edge of the development, building height could reach a maximum of 20 stories. That decreases to 15 stories in zone B and then seven stories in zones C and D. The site's location along the river places limitations on access and connectivity. All vehicular access to the site would be from Davidson Street. The SP shows as many as five new access points. However, um, I should point out that NDOT wants this number reduced and will work with the applicant through the final SP process to that end, and that is listed as a condition in the staff report. The SP includes a right-of-way dedication along Davidson Street to support a 10-foot sidewalk and bike lanes west of South 14th Street. Davidson Street actually becomes a local street east of South 14th Street leading into the park, and so no additional right-of-way is needed on that, on that segment. Uh, the SP application includes a viewshed exhibit, which is shown on the screen. Buildings would be spaced a minimum of 26 feet apart to preserve views of the river from public rights of way on Davidson, 12th and 14th streets. Those are uh, those viewsheds are represented by the, the pink arrows. A 14 foot greenway would be situated along the riverfront, likely within the buffer area and would have two public access points. Staff reviewed the proposed SP for consistency with the T5MU policy. The proposed development would consist of a mix of high density residential and non-residential uses. Active uses would be situated along the Davidson Street frontage. Structures would be built to the back of the sidewalk supporting an urban form. The policy supports minimal spacing uh, between buildings, but in this case, there would be spacing of 26 feet. This is done again um, to pr preserve view sheds from the, from the public rights of way. The policy supports high levels of connectivity with complete streets networks. In this case, opportunities for connectivity are somewhat limited due to the site's location along the, river, the riverfront. However, the proposed greenway, expanded sidewalk, and the bikeway would foster connectivity uh, for pedestrians and bicyclists. Finally, the T5MU policy supports building heights of 20 stories or greater depending on context. This SP includes building heights of seven to 20 stories with the higher buildings situated the farthest from residential properties on the north. Topographical changes should mitigate some of the height difference as uh, much of the subject property lies below the neighboring residential properties in most locations. Additionally, public view sheds would be preserved from public rights of way. Uh, because the SP is generally consistent with the T5MU policy, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Donald. And so commissioners will open this item for public hearing. And is the applicant, come on up. And uh, 10 minutes, and you can save two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal. Welcome. Yeah, turn it on. It's the, hold on. We'll get Amelia. It's our system's complicated. There you go. There we go. 
Good evening. My name is Erica Garrison with Bradley 712 Bowling Avenue. I want to thank the planning staff for their work on this project. We accept the conditions and we agree with the staff's analysis that this is consistent with the policy. We also thank the councilman for the many meetings he's had on this project to date. Uh, and for his support and guidance. The project is consistent with the policy, as I said. We think it will allow for development and density of housing where it should be on a corridor that can handle this level of density. The project began because we believed that something better could happen on this site. We met with the councilmen and members of the Shelby Hills Board and community beginning in January to see what they envisioned for the site. We quickly learned these were their priorities, access to the river, Greenway development, the prohibition of STRPs, an activated streetscape, and a mix of uses. So far, we have had at least six project-specific meetings concerning the site with the community and four visioning sessions led by the councilman beginning in January related to the development. And through that process, we have modified the design. We've made it better. We've been more responsive. This is a strong proposal. It's supported by staff and consistent with the policy. We ask that you move it forward today and allow the councilman to continue to work with us and with the neighbors on conditions for the bill. And I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeremy Ritchie. I'm with the Gresham Smith Architect. Uh, our address is 222 2nd Avenue South. Uh, first, I would like to say that we've had great community engagement process where we've received some meaningful feedback. And we'd like to address a couple questions that have come up. The first question we'd like to answer is, why are we asking for additional height? More than anything else, we want to create a vibrant mixed-use community that prioritizes visual and physical connectivity between the riverfront and the existing Shelby Hills neighborhood. Approximately 50% of the site area is dedicated to easements and setbacks, limiting the area where we place buildings. While this is great for flood control and maintaining the natural character of the river edge, it limits how the site can be developed. For example, to utilize the allowed developable area at 690 and 1106, we would need to build a seven-story extrusion of the building site area. While this type of building is permitted in the base zoning, it would do little in the way of creating ground-level public space, few quarters through the site, and pedestrian access to the river. To put our money where our mouth is, we are not asking for more development area. We're simply asking for a relaxation of height so that we'd free up space of the green ground plane. Simply put, we are shifting the shape of buildings, not asking for different, bigger buildings. We care about the ground plane because vibrant public life happens at the ground plane. Everything we love about living in urban areas is at the ground plane. The thing that is so exciting about this site in particular is the opportunity to create a series of riverfront public spaces with a distinct East Nashville character that connect the community back to the river. These types of spaces can only be realized if we have the height to create some space between buildings. The second question that we'd like to address is, what are we doing to mitigate the effect of taller buildings? We are aware that height is a sensitive subject and want to minimize the impact and have addressed this issue in the following ways. First, we're proposing setbacks to reduce the perceived height of the street wall along the entire length of Davidson. Second, we are proposed to limit the maximum building height to seven stories at 1200 Davidson, where the site is closest to single family homes in Shelby Park. Third, while there is no perfect place to locate taller buildings, the topic was discussed at several of the community engagement meetings, and it was generally concluded that if taller buildings are required to help create a vibrant ground plane, then 1106 and 690 were the preferred location. The consensus from those meetings was the height was more tolerable as you move west toward the city and farther away from single family houses. This is the preference that we have followed and was been proposed in the SP. Some other questions about the process have been brought up. So why do we think this approach to rezoning is most effective? The site area is 15.5 acres and will likely be phased and constructed over a longer period of time. This SP process is about organizing the site as a cohesive master plan that thoughtfully addresses building heights, the activation of the ground plane, open space, access to the river, view corridors, construction of the greenway, flood control, vehicular traffic, and pedestrian safety all at once for the entirety of the site. We have committed to meaningfully addressing all of these issues in the SP document and to the additional conditions recommended by planning.
Hello, my name is Beth Ostrowski and I'm a traffic engineer and PE with KCI Technologies located at 500 North 11th Avenue. For this project, as always, we have coordinated closely with NDOT throughout the process. Our study met the requirements set forth by them through project scoping and ultimately our study was accepted by them. The project reduces site driveways from eight down to four. One of the driveways shown on there is a temporary driveway that will be removed when the next phase is constructed um, and preserves and improves the well-loved cycle track. We have agreed to NDOT's conditions set forth for this project, and um, which includes improvements to the roadway cross-section, multimodal improvements, including pedestrian and bicycle facilities, and traffic calming. It's worth noting that the daily traffic volume on Davidson Street is currently quite low, meaning the road has abundant vehicular capacity. And in addition, the road has a wide right-of-way with the ability to easily serve all modes. With the addition of this project, the roadway capacity on Davidson Street will remain more than sufficient to handle the anticipated traffic. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Travis Todd. I'm with Thomas and Hutton, the civil engineers for the project. We're located at 615 Main Street in East Nashville. Between this project and several others, we have experience with the planning, design, and permitting of overall a mile of riverfront on the east bank of the Cumberland. We know how this river works. We are incorporating solutions that mitigate flooding impacts for the neighborhood. It's important to know that due to floodway and floodway buffers, only 53% of the site is actually developable. So our approach will be to give the bank back to the river. We will remove existing buildings and pavement from the buffers. We will be increasing the green area on the site significantly. Finally, there will be no impacts to surrounding properties as all of the on-site stormwater will drain to the river. We look forward to developing a project that will contribute to the health of the Cumberland River and bring people back to it. Thank you. Anyone else on the development team? All right, so you have, we'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Appreciate the request. All right, anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up and if y'all will line up behind the microphone, and as a reminder, please state your name and address. You have two minutes and the timer is right over here. And we appreciate you coming down. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Wendy Rutherford. I live at 1343 Kenwood Drive in Inglewood. Uh, however, my family and I have spent a great deal of time in East Nashville, Shelby Park area. And I am here today in support of this special permit for the Davidson Street River development. Uh, first of all, I support revitalizing the spaces that the city outgrows. And this project represents an opportunity for our community to revitalize an area that we have outgrown while maintaining East Nashville's reputation as a neighborhood of progress. This development is set apart from other developments in Nashville because of the commitment to community input. I know that anytime I think about development, I think about traffic um, as, a, as a member of this community. However, um, I am impressed that they're utilizing land on a collector road that's not often used, and it will provide housing options and allow the uh, existing streets to remain navigable. I view this proposal as a way for the city to continue to grow and create a community. Uh, we can expand one of the best neighborhoods in Nashville. I'm partial to it. Uh, I think that it's an opportunity to uh, support various lifestyles. This development will serve as communal space for families, professionals, and individuals seeking a place to call home. I think it's crucial that we prioritize updating spaces that no longer serve our community, such as the current older industrial buildings that border most one of the most popular areas in the city. This development represents the true power of revitalization and offers us a chance to reimagine and breathe new life into an area that's long been neglected. By repurposing this side of Davidson Street, we can continue to honor East Nashville's history and embrace Nashville's future. There are, diff there are real community benefits in this development. Is that, am I done? 
Time flies when you're having fun here at the Planning <laughs> Commission. So, yes. Well, uh, apparently I didn't speak fast enough. I just want to say yeah. one thing. It will also it will also revitalize the look from the river uh, when we're on when the General Jackson goes down. Thank what you. tourists are seeing is not good. I Appreciate know as a boater. Thank you. Welcome. She stole that line from me. I, I thought of that. Uh, my family and I, I'm Paul Rutherford, her husband. And uh, when I was born in 61, I was about three miles east of, of this site. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of this project. I do support it. Um, it's located on a road that's nowhere near its capacity. Uh, it's near other recent developments by the river. We are persuaded that this development will promote a vibrant community consistent with the character of East Nashville by concentrating density in this area. We need more dense housing uh, in the city to ensure there are enough housing options for our residents. The development has the potential for upwards of 1,750 housing units across these 15 and a half acres. It's crucial for the city to consider when and where we can responsibly add density to support growth. With the growing need for housing in Nashville, this project aligns perfectly with the goal of providing more housing options for our residents. Transforming this dilapidated site into a vibrant and attractive community makes sense to me. Um, it not only revitalizes the area, but it also preserves the natural environment along the river. The rede this redevelopment plan include removing the current buildings from the stream buffer, which will allow the developer to restore and return the stream buffer to its natural state. So this ecological enhancement will benefit the environment, provide green space for the city's residents. In addition to these advantages, the permit comes with guaranteed benefits. First, it eliminates short-term rental properties in entirely, removing any potential negative tourist impacts on the area. Second, the max, maximum commercial space allowed is set at 120,000 square feet, unless a comprehensive traffic study supports further expansion. For these and other reasons, I support this project. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Welcome. Hi there, my name is Catherine Barron. I own 908B Russell Street in East Nashville near the development. I'm speaking in support of the project. Uh, this project will create much needed housing in East Nashville. Uh, more housing close to the urban center is good for sustainability, mobility, and the cost of living for many. This will take a small step in housing, helping much needed affordable housing here in Nashville. Uh, the proposal adds height, by, uh, but has done so by opening up more ground level. I'm, I'm glad the development team has added the height thoughtfully and is providing robust ground level public space along the riverfront. I have no objection to the height proposals um, as a neighbor, and I'm excited about the natural way the development plans to engage with the river. I'm really excited about the increased green area and for the industrial areas to be removed and repurposed to be community space. Uh, thank you again. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Christian Cohen. Um, I currently live at 542 Fatherland Avenue in East Nashville, and I'm speaking in support of the project as well. As a longtime resident, I feel like that the evolution of areas in Nashville that have historically been neglected is um, the, one of the reasons why people love East Nashville. And for this project specifically, um, having office buildings bordering such a desired popular area of the town isn't reflective of Nashville as a city and reflective of East Nashville as a community that people like to live in. Um, secondly, the development also is adding immense amount of green space. And as a young person, as someone who cares about the environment, who actively walks in the greenways in Shelby Park, having that connected would be amazing for me and a lot of my neighbors and the family that I have that lives in the area as well. On top of all that, um, the housing crisis is affecting everyone, especially in East Nashville. Um, I know it's definitely bottom-legging younger professionals, people entering the workforce, um, not being able to find housing or being able to not have a roommate. Um, I think that solution is to create more housing in these desired areas and um, to do that in a reasonable, responsive way that also protects the environment and takes in the character of the community that they're developing in is an asset, in my personal opinion. 
Um, I also think that with all of these things in conjunction, I think with being responsible with the community, with caring about the environment and the culture of the community, I have to, I feel an obligation to say that people like this project and this is a project not only for this area, but thinking about the future of this community and how younger generations can populate this area. So thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Annie Claver. I've been an East Nashville resident for almost 20 years. I'm the owner and operator of River Queen Voyages, which is a downtown Nashville river recreation company. I'm a U.S. Coast Guard certified master captain, and I drive up and down the river um, all the time, every day. Uh, this project, I am in great support of. Um, as we talk about developing the riverfront in Nashville, we have Oracle, Newhoff, the East Bank, the Wharf Park project, and I see this as another piece of bringing the river um, to Nashville. We have traditionally neglected the riverfront and turned our backs to it and developments like this with green space, community activated um, places for people to play and walk and bike are essential to, to our city. Um, we operate right now in Cumberland Park, which is a very small piece of green space in downtown, and there's Shelby Park as well. We go between there all the time every day. We are on Davidson Street back and forth all the time. The street definitely has the space to um, to allow for this. Um, and just on a personal note, I know some of us have developer fatigue. I know this developer cares about Nashville, cares about the community, and cares about making intelligent, smart design uh, for the community. So I would like to uh, offer my great support for the project. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Adam Wright. Uh, I live at 936 Delmas Avenue in East Hill in East Nashville. I've been part of East Nashville since 2017. I frequent uh, Davidson Street, both foot, bicycle, um, active exerciser, uh, along that route, going all the way out to Shelby Bottoms. Uh, it's been a dilapidated industrial park that serves as an eyesore since, since I've been here in 2017. Uh, East Nashville is an amazing community um, that deserves continued growth and opportunity. Uh, this proposed site uh, be, be just that, uh, to finish out the river, um, keeping it brief, keeping it straightforward. I'm, I'm a uh, big supporter of, of this development and the fur further growth of East Nashville. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Lynn. I live on Cleo Miller Drive in the Greenwood neighborhood. Um, I'm here in support of the proposed Davidson Riverview development. I believe this project will have a positive impact on our community, including an increase in property values for homeowners and many potential new amenities. The addition of well-designed community amenities like greenways, sidewalks, and community spaces can significantly enhance property values. The introduction of a greenway could result in an average 20% increase in property values within a half mile radius of the development. Properties with river views can command even higher prices with values exceeding those of comparable properties with such views by as much as 30%. Transforming dilapidated sites into something neighbors use can also lead to an average increase of 10 to 15% in surrounding property values because of improved aesthetics and increased desirability of the neighborhood. The presence of mixed use development also has a significant positive impact on home appraisals and the community at large. Nashville properties located near newer developments have experienced an average increase of 10 to 20% in value compared to those near single use areas. This development would create density in the right place. It would not only help address Nashville's housing shortage, but also present an opportunity for substantial increases in property values. I urge you to consider the real benefits that this development brings, not only in terms of housing and environmental conservations, but also in terms of the positive impact on property values for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Nick Saragusa. Uh, I live at 2524 Flamingo Drive um, in East Nashville. And I wanted to express my support in this project um, because of the much needed housing that it provides um, along a significant corridor in our area. As Nashville continues to grow and existing residents are faced with rising costs, 
providing more options for housing will allow costs to remain reasonable and attainable for people that already call Nashville home. A mix of residential options is good for a neighborhood, especially one as interesting and diverse as ours. This project will set the framework for what creative housing opportunities look like in East Nashville. It will also help ensure that existing homes and neighborhoods are preserved by redeveloping underutilized, underutilized industrial land versus moving developments into existing residential areas. I ask you to review this proposal in light of the much needed housing that it will bring to our area. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Hannah Zicklemeyer and I live at 1041 East Trinity Lane in East Nashville. I am here tonight to express my support for the Davidson Street SP. In reviewing this proposal, I believe the development team has appropriately scaled and transitioned the height of the buildings by placing the taller buildings towards the East Bank area and the shorter buildings closing to, closer to the existing homes. This approach also provides a thoughtful transition of height near the entrance to Shelby Park. I am excited that the industrial nature of this street will finally begin to change, bringing much desired uses and amenities to our neighborhood. Thank you for your time, and I hope you'll support the efforts that this developer has put in to make sure that the redevelopment of this site is done with the highest quality. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Scott Humphreys. I live at Toba 5B Chester Avenue in East Nashville. Uh, my wife and I, especially our dog, uh, enjoy exploring the parks and greenways that we are blessed with in East Nashville and consider them a benefit to the entire community. However, the site of this proposed project is located in an area where industrial uses have cut our neighborhoods off from accessing the river, causing a dead end to the Greenway network. I'm here to express my support of the Davidson Street SP because of the way the proposal adds an abundance of green space and access points from the neighborhoods to the river to enjoy the future expression of the Greenway. While I understand some neighbors may have an issue with the height of the buildings being proposed, I would rather have new public access to the, enjoy the river in exchange for a few additional stories. What I would hate to see is a seven story building, one that could be built by right today under the current zoning that provides no neighborhood access to the river. This proposal provides great benefits to the community by allowing us to reconnect to the river instead of being cut off from it. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Allison Ford and I live at 1914 Shelby Avenue. Um, I'm speaking in support of the Davidson Street Riverfront development. This project provides a better solution to the street's current use. I think the development is planned exceptionally. It strategically places density where it should be and ensures that our resources and space are being used productively. The plan for this project matches the neighborhoods that are in close proximity and the layouts encourage walkability and visual continuity in the area. Everyone in Nashville knows that we have an immediate need for housing, and this project is dedicated to multifamily housing. It caters to the different needs of our neighborhood by providing different types of housing options, all while working to combat Nashville's current housing issues. It is imperative that we, as a city, deal with growth in a pragmatic way and examine the best way to address our problems. Transforming an older rundown site into a forward-thinking development is Nashville planning for our future. This project offers a solution to our growth, changing a neglected part of the street into something to enjoy. Not only does this project offer a solution that is beneficial to the community, but it also maintains the land and nature touching the river. In sum, this project prepares Nashville for its future in one of the fast growing areas of our city. It provides remedies to outdated zoning issues, addresses the housing shortage and promotes environmental growth. I urge all of my neighbors to join me in supporting this as it promises to bring immense benefits to our community now and for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up and uh, same thing. Please uh, state your name and address. And Hi, how you doing? I'm Nell Levin. I live at 1611 Forest Avenue where I've lived since 1996. My concern is affordable housing. So how many units of affordable housing are gonna be constructed in this building or are we can, gonna continue to build stuff that is unaffordable to the vast majority of people who actually run the city, right? The musicians, the janitors, all the people that run 
and run this city. So that's, that is, I can't say I'm completely against this project. I see the benefits of it for East Nashville, but is there going to be any affordable, is there going to be an effort to actually build some affordable units in this building? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Allison Letcher. I live at 919 South 12th Street, just a few houses up from Davidson. I also represent properties located at 108 South 11th Street, 1010 Ozark, and 1012 Ozark as property manager. Um, I am speaking in opposition to this case. Um, as an actual resident of this neighborhood, I do welcome thoughtful development on Davidson Street. But I'm absolutely opposed to the construction of these 20-story buildings right there. Um, the topography doesn't seem to have been fully considered or understood in the context of this proposed development. Um, so the development sits at the bottom of a very steep hill on which my neighborhood sits. Um, the, the grade of South 12th is like 17%. So we've got this, um, we've got Davidson here, we've got this steep hill where all these houses are just on the side of the hill facing out towards the development, towards the river. Um, the the, uh, the rental units are one story units, they're 80 feet up, which means they're looking out and, with, and if there's a 20 story building there, there's a wall that goes down 80 feet and then up 120 feet. It just really doesn't make sense for this neighborhood, for this location. It would be aggressive and oppressive, and I'm, I'm, I'm very much in opposition. Um, I'm also concerned about the loss of the sunlight to our neighborhood, as well as um, potential reflection from the windows in this building. Um, <clears throat> also, the increased traffic that would be caused by adding 1,750 multifamily residential units. This is an area with no bus service, minimal outlets. Really, you know, they're either going out uh, on Davidson towards downtown, or they're coming up my street on 12th or 14th. That's the only way you can get to the grocery store, 12th and 14th. Um, so I understand that both the shadow study and the traffic study were completed, but the neighborhood has not been able to view these studies despite requesting to view them. Um, transparency is necessary for true public comments, so I respectfully ask the Planning Commission defer this case until the traffic and shadow studies are made available. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, I'm Brian Kelly. I'm a 10-year East Nashville resident. I live on Ozark Street in the neighborhood directly affected by this project. I and my neighbors have submitted letters urging you to reject the applicant's rezoning request. We have cited numerous causes for our concern, which remain unresolved by either the applicant or Metro representatives. Today, at this decision point, we recommend a deferral from placing this case on the cons consent agenda. While there are facets of the plan that we, our neighbors, and I find attractive and beneficial, there are conflicts of interest that remain. This includes deviations from Metro's strategic intent, Metro policy, and overall aesthetics in placing humongous buildings adjacent to a community of modest homes. Yes, there have been community meetings with the applicant, but we still have grave concerns. The conflicts, inadequacies, and inconsistencies in the applicant's plan should be addressed after this deferral, all of it under the guise of due diligence. For example, the applicant does not include specifics in the proposed plan that are commonly provided in other requests. Specifically missing is an illustration in their plan that depicts the scale of the proposed buildings relative to the nearby homes. The scale of this enterprise, particularly the building's enormous sizes relative to the surrounding neighborhood, should have been a non-starter from the beginning. By the way, I've included these illustrations in my correspondence to you. In conclusion, we understand there's a profit margin that the applicant must meet to make their investment viable. Their singular profit-maximizing solution to building gigantic structures adjacent to humble one-floor homes should merit a deferral at this point. The applicant has the talent to get it right. We've met these folks. They're smart. Let's give them the uh, ability and the time to do it right. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Michael Basham. I live at 1107 Ozark Street. I'm next door uh, to Brian uh, Kelly, who just spoke. None of the people who spoke in support of this plan live in an area that is visible 
in that illustration that's on your screen. I do. These 15 and 20 story buildings are too tall for this location. This will create, because of the hillside of, uh, up from Davidson up to Glenview, this will cr create the Davidson Street Canyon. We will have 15 and 20 story buildings casting shadows. I have asked, I have attempted to find out the exact height of these buildings, 15 stories, that's great. There's a range in, uh, in the uh, plan. But uh, when I, the day that I received the uh, yellow card in the mail, uh, I, I called the, the applicant and I attempted to speak with Brandon Bell of Gresham Smith. And I told, uh, I left the voicemail message and gave my name and address and phone number and said I wanted to talk about this. I'm still waiting on that call back. The next day, on May 9th, I uh, initiated a conversation with my uh, city councilman. And despite my uh, expressed opposition, he graciously engaged me in conversation until I asked specific questions about the height of these buildings. Everything I can discern, everything that is available to me, tells me that this will put single-family, single-story homes along Davidson in darkness and that in the winter, at the winter solstice and on either side of it, I will be in darkness for a significant period of time, but I'm deprived of the information for precise measurements. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. My name is Nolan Crow. I live at 907 South 12th Street, so directly impacted by this. For reference to my neighbor's concerns, I live at the absolute top of the hill, and according to Metro GIS maps, it's approximately 106 feet down to the river. So if we look at the, the size and scale of a 20-story building, that's approximately 100, 150 feet that I'm then going to be staring up at the top of these. So the lack of clarity around height is a, a serious concern, to echo my neighbor's concerns. Most of the, the traffic commentary has centered on Davidson Street today, but we as human beings, we're all lazy we look for the most efficient path to get where we're going to the points about the grocery store if we if we look at this part of east nashville it's five points etc how do you get there from where these properties are located south 12th street south 14th street most most logical path to get there and it's going to turn those two roadways into thoroughfares and i don't think there's much concern for the impacts of folks like us that walk dogs we have kids people riding their bikes etc now it's going to be potentially impacted by up to 750 vehicles moving to and fro every day. And then lastly, there's the, the commentary around more housing units and how it will address affordable housing. I've yet to see anything specifically on this project actually bringing affordable units to the market. They'll probably be marketed as luxury condos, units, et cetera, um, which really don't do anything to address affordable housing, but attract more money in that then displaces more folks. So I think there's a lot of unanswered questions on this proposal at this point in time that I can't support it and also recommend the deferral with my neighbors. Thank you all. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, I'm Neil Woodward. I live at 113, 1113 Ozark Street, which is also on that map. I asked the commission to defer to their decision on the Davidson Street proposal. First, let me also say that I very much appreciate what the developers have done. This is a dilapidated area that needs redeveloping, absolutely. And we desperately need more affordable and middle income housing. Unfortunately, I think this SP could do more to address that shortage. By dominating the surrounding neighborhood, residential units in this SP will have unparalleled views of the city, Shelby Park and the river. They will be priced at the very top of the market. I get the height versus footprint trade off, but building up means fewer units on the lower floors and reduced overall affordability. Deferral would allow solutions to be assessed. For example, maybe the large view shed in zone A could be reduced so that the footprints of adjacent buildings could be increased. Even slightly reducing the height of the tall structures will improve the fit of the SP with the overall neighborhood and increase overall affordability. Unfortunately, for all I know, my suggestion could be unworkable. This raises another reason for deferring. The plan is not detailed enough to make an informed decision. No building plans are presented, only conceptual outlines are provided, and we have no idea how accurate they are. They're also inconsistent. The figure on page eight doesn't match the ones on page seven and nine. Page eight labels four view sheds, but it looks like there's five. How can the public in this commission evaluate the merits of the SP and actively contribute to the process 
when essential details are missing and unreliable. The lack of detail and transparency also breeds mistrust. This will be the largest development in East Nashville after redistricting. I know this is a regulatory SP, but greater detail is required. Let's take the time to make sure we get a plan that best suits the Shelby Hills neighborhood and the housing needs of the broader Nashville community. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal. Hi, could we please show exhibit E? We've created some diagrams. Uh, there's some comments on the shadow studies that we'd like to show. First off, we would like to say that the height that's being proposed is consistent with the policy. Um, and I think that most of the comments about height are actually about views looking through. So this is a section from, I think a lot of the folks who are commenting were up on o Ozark Street and up on South 11th, if you could see where that is. And then we've made a section through showing what that looks like. So we, next slide, please. So even at seven stories with MUG, MUGA, there's no view toward the river. It, it, it higher, it's also the same. Next. And again, we've put a seven story building on the site using Google Earth and just projected down at the exact same height that the houses are. Next slide, please. And this is the current state with the warehouses in place. Uh, no buildings there. This is just exactly what it is now. And there's really no view of the river. And the next slide, please. And this is with the seven story building, just an extrusion what we'd take to reach the achievable GFA. The shadow studies that were also mentioned, we'd like to represent those here today. Oh, is there another one? Sorry, it's an E. Okay, sorry, it may not be on this slide then. Okay, but I would like to comment on that. The shadows, um, they don't affect anyone on the hill, so it's really during winter solstice is the worst time of year, and there are some shadows casts on the very lowest edge. We've acknowledged that in the public meetings and went through with some of the property owners, in fact. Um, luckily, as you go up the hill, the shadows don't cast like up a, up a hill like that, and it just doesn't work like that. Even in the depths of winter, we're really just brushing off on the, the first edge of housing, and that's the transitory shadow. It's just moving across. So the sun's always moving across the south. Um, and I think where we're putting height, you could see that we're 150 yards away from the nearest house. So that's quite a long shadow. So even at a 45 degree angle that you're projecting, it's really not even gonna make to the first house because it's just the way shadows work. We'd also like to say that we're willing to talk more about this and have more community meetings about the height that's being proposed. It's, Thank you. Uh, we're open for suggestions on that. Thank you. Councilman, you're up to speak, but do you want to close the public hearing and then I'll just call on you first for discussion? Would that be okay? All right. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Councilman. Thank you, uh, Chair, and, and thank you to Commissioners, and thank you for everyone who came out tonight. Um, I had sent a, a letter, uh, at which which I I have in your packet, and I printed one out because I know sometimes it can be hard to pull all the, everything up from the, uh, from the SharePoint site. Um, but uh, as was mentioned, uh, as I mentioned, as I referenced in my letter, this area along the south side of Davidson, uh, when Nashville Next was adopted in 2015, uh, had the T5 policy on it. That was uh, the case at that time. The overwhelming majority of the rest, certainly of District 6, uh, has a T4 or T3. And in fact, it's T4 or T3 neighborhood of all uh, neighborhood maintenance. We do have a little bit of a Five points itself as a center policy area, T4. We've got a little bit of a corridor policy along Main Street, but almost the rest of East Nashville, uh, as we went through Nashville next, was um, uh, identified as neighborhood maintenance, T4, T3. But this area was selected for T5 at the time. And I think even at that time, this is way before, we'd had some very preliminary discussions about the East Bank, but long, long, long before any of that was discussed. But uh, I believe that when the commission adopted the update to the East Nashville Community Plan that included T5 here, it was in recognition of the fact that almost all of the rest of the community is T4 or T3 maintenance. We do need to allow density and growth somewhere. And also, I believe that it recognized that these industrial uses no longer coexist with residential uh, in a way that that was the case when they were originally constructed. Uh, and also that there are a large number of constraints on these sites, including a lot of utilities. And so from a feasibility standpoint of construction, whatever gets built there is going to be large. It's just the way it is. Um, so I believe that is why the T5 
policy was selected for this area at that time. And that's that's been the case for a long time. I was elected in 2015 um, when I was knocking doors and ran for office in 2014. Um, I really ran on the idea that we should try to preserve the character of our neighborhoods that have the maintenance policy. Uh, and we should focus growth and development on the areas in the community plan that call for growth and development. And this is exactly one of those areas that I'd always highlighted uh, and have kept talking about since that time. Um, so again, during the um, last couple of years in particular, we have started to see development interest pick up along the riverfront. And I've had more and more calls uh, from folks about uh, parcels in this area. And one of the things that um, I had been talking to the community about is to say like, hey, like if we move these to mixed use, would the community support that? These two parcels, uh, 698 um, uh, uh, were uh, the prior owner uh, of the industrial use had called me said, hey, what do you think you would support there? I said, well, we really don't know what exactly we want to see, but why don't you try a base zone? Um, they were looking to sell the property as well. And so I said, you know, probably I would support MUGA or something like that, but why don't you talk to planning staff and see what they think? Planning staff recommended that as well. Um, we did have uh, public hearings on it and they were uh, enjoyed the support of the community at that time to move away from industrial towards mixed use. So this rezoning of, of these two parcels to MEGA happened in 2020 and it's been sitting there for a while. Since it's been sitting there for a little while, I've had lots of folks, you know, ask me about it, like, hey, what, what, what do folks want there, right? And so um, I had uh, the buyer of this, these two parcels acquired them. Um, and said, you know, let us see if we can maybe get some other adjacent parcels to do a, a larger project. And I said, okay, sure, you know. Um, so they've been working on that for a while. They actually approached the property owner across the street or the rather property owner across the street to the north has been interested in rezoning for a long time, hasn't, hasn't pursued that yet. Um, but the folks on this team worked all the way down to the river, kind of with the hopes maybe of getting one consistent development that all went all the way to Shelby Park. Obviously that didn't work out, uh, at least with one parcel remaining as of yet. But again, you know, on and on, we're having more and more of these requests to rezone from industrial to mixed use. We had one just up the street at the corner of Fifth and Crutcher Street. Very similar in that case, we worked with staff and did an SP uh, for that one. Um, to uh, basically it was MEGA, but we limited the height to six and we made sure that since we have a lot of stuff going on with the East Bank that we required that they work with NDOT to do right, right away dedications, which I think makes sense, but basically it was MEGA. But these things keep coming along and keep coming along. And so I uh, went to the Shelby Hills Neighborhood Association in January and I said, you know, I think uh, we, we, we're probably not gonna have time to do a UDO but I think that it makes sense for myself or candidates running for District 6 and whoever's successful, as well as for the development community, I think it makes sense to have a series of community meetings just to say like, what do you want there, right? So that that way we're not having a separate conversation with every single rezone. And so I did have that series uh, and I've got a PowerPoint. Um, so uh, one of the things I did with my charrette series is I took kind of specific images, sometimes I did a series of them say like, hey, like what, what, what belongs in this side or what are your thoughts about that? Um, we had lots of great participation uh, from the community. One of the things I really like is, you know, uh, I allowed people to whiteboard things. So if they had things in different categories, like throw your ideas up there, we'll let neighbors upload it with dots and things like that, which is maybe not scientific, but it's a pretty good uh, grassroots way of getting, figuring out which ideas rise to the top. But lots of folks came out to the meetings uh, that were very well attended, had really great discussions. Folks brought their children. So this is one of the comment cards that I got as a young person said, I really wanna see trees here. Um, one of my other favorite uh, comments from one of my youngest constituents was that the constituent uh, drew and said, I wanna have buildings with a landing, uh, a rooftop landing deck for Santa. Um, but so we had folks of all ages, but uh, great participation throughout the community. But even the young people, I think, the, young, the very youngest people were like, we really want to see trees here. We really want to see green space and things like that. That was a very consistent theme. So again, uh, at my community meeting, uh, starting in January, I handed out maps that talked about the policy. So these are kind of the, the slides that I showed. 
Um, one just shows the policy map. The second one shows like you can see all these rezonings coming down South Fifth Street toward this area, kind of highlighting that. Again, these are some of the images that I included in some of my slideshows to entice people to come talk about it. One of the, one of one of these images is looking down that hill from 12th Street. I know one of the neighbors spoke about that. This is what they actually see. Technically, you can see the river with barges on it, and you can see lots of power lines and utility lines and industrial sites that go all the way up to Levin and Road on the other side. That is actually what the view is of if you look, live there. There are semi-abandoned railroad tracks along the way. Uh, at the base uh, of this site, actually, when you get to the bottom of 12th Street, one of the neighbors talked about that. You have TVA transmission uh, poles, uh, towers that are there, but you can kind of see like looking up that hill. So that was one of our images to say like, what should be at the bottom of that hill? Um, this uh, other image shows, this is what the riverbank looks like today. Um, I was actually a little bit afraid for my life going back up in there to take that picture, but um, thankfully the owners did not uh, sue me for trespassing to get that picture, but I think it really, uh, that picture tells more than a, a thousand words. Uh, that's what the conditions look like today. So, um, again, I addressed at the, in, at the conclusion of that series, uh, at the end of March, I provided an overview, talked about the legislative timeline. Of course, at that time, we didn't know what the state was going to do, but nonetheless, folks wanted to file something to have it done this term. I got a summary of the community meetings that I had starting January 23rd, February 11th at the Shelby Bottoms Nature Center, February 16th at the East Library, February 20th at Boomba's. That one was co-sponsored by Walk Bike Nashville. Appreciate their help in advertising that. February 27th, we had a, an ideas open house at Make Nashville Makerspace, which is on Davidson Street. I think one thing that's really important to note is that the design team actually did a 3D model of the neighborhood, and we introduced that at the Make Nashville Makerspace, and we included kind of styrofoam versions of buildings that where people could place those on that, and we could begin to get discussion about what those heights were like. So that was part of that community conversation all the way back in February. Um, then we had, um, like I said, uh, an update meeting. Um, again, going back to of all the ideas that we had, um, uh, put them in a spreadsheet with how many upvotes they got from community members, desired uses, highest support river walk with public access and dining options, mixed income housing, grocery or market, exercise health and recreation facilities and amenities. Um, concerns, uh, transportainment or noise, short term rentals and chain businesses, which I know my, I like to joke that in East Nashville, we don't like chain, chain businesses unless they are called uh, Publix, but um, nonetheless, um, we love our small businesses. Um, for building design, most frequently cited, the things that people wanted were step backs and spacing between buildings, which is highly featured in this plan. Designed to support future transit opportunities, we know that we won't get a transit line right here. But MDHA, as well as Martha O'Brien Center, have been, and myself, have been really advocating to WeGo for many, many years now to try to bring additional bus service further into the neighborhood. And I strongly believe that adding a lot of residential here, we may not get a bus line on Davidson Street, but it will help to, to justify MDHA bringing a route that comes south, south of Shelby and into the neighborhood again. Uh, folks are interested in creative architecture and quality materials or not a box, um, which is what you would get under the existing base zoning on 1160, uh, or excuse me, 690 and 1106. Folks were interested in green roofs and environmentally sensitive building practices, and again, trees, native plantings, and greenery. For river access, the most frequently cited were a desire for a continuous uh, river walk or greenway, which you cannot get in the base zoning today. Public access to restrooms and drinking fountains, which is really important, especially like even in Shelby Park, families go there and there aren't always a lot of restrooms available, even like a restaurant or something that they could use, and so that really limits the amount of time that they can spend. So having businesses that do have uh, those facilities would really be helpful to uh, increasing people's ability to spend more time on the river. Um, uh, real desire to complement or coordinate with recreational river uses. We don't really know exactly what that is yet, but we did hear from uh, River Queen Voyages today. We do have a lot of recreational users in Shelby Park and in this area of it, and it'd be great if we could find ways to connect that. Uh, we can't maybe design that today, but really providing for that opportunity is important. Uh, and this leaves that uh, op opportunity open. And with the regulatory SP, we would have to come back for a final SP so that can still be worked out. Um, and again, park, uh, park benches and picnic areas. Um, 
for circulation, enhance the bike lanes for increased safety and visibility, which this will do, design for future bus transit opportunities, which I've discussed, reduce vehicular conflicts with bikes and pedestrians, obviously during a major construction project that's difficult, but, but this will be better for pedestrians and bikes who uh, right now do have a lot of conflicts getting uh, across each other. Um, pedestrian scale lighting was important to a lot of folks. Um, it's very, very dark in this area. And so, you know, a lot of the street lighting that we tend to have in Nashville is way, way, way out very high. If you were walking or biking on the bikeways today, um, uh, after dark, it's, it's, it's not inviting. So that would be a great thing to have. And again, traffic calming, real interest in traffic circles or roundabouts. The traffic study shows that um, this project itself, even with this level of density, may not support that directly, but that they will continue to work with NDOT to achieve those goals. So again, I go, I go back to, uh, I'd also like to say shadow studies. Shadow studies were presented at multiple community meetings. We've actually been playing around with the height of these buildings a bit to get more feedback on it. For uh, the park, for instance, the park closest to the park, uh, originally what it was going to be 12 and eight. Uh, we've reduced that all the way down to seven, um, which does, squeeze your uh, open space ability, but we have reduced that all the way down to seven for zone B. Um, we, we did hear folks, the original plan was gonna be like 2019, 18, that was gonna really taper down all the way down. So for zone B, which is that central part today, we have lowered it down at least to 15. But again, there is that realization that once you lower height, the buildings get wider and the less overall river view everyone has, frankly, um, as well as open space. So uh, with this one, there is an updated uh, shadow study. Um, we have heard from some folks today. I would like to point out that not a single person who lives in the vicinity who spoke today will be affected by shadows. It's what this shadow study shows. So most folks live up on Ozark and Glenview. They are outside of the shadow that, that these buildings would cast. Same for the folks that live further up the hill on 12. So we do have some shadows along Davidson Street. I've actually heard lots of support from homeowners on Davidson Street because they look out at an industrial wasteland today that is quickly deteriorating. They are very excited to have improvements to the Greenway. They're really looking forward to have ground level businesses that they can support. Um, and so there are a couple times a year when they might have some shadows. But what I've heard from people who live on at the lowest levels of Davidson is that they're very excited about this project. So um, again, I, I, I believe that the, the applicant team has worked very, very closely with myself, with the Shelby Hills Neighborhood Association board, with the community at large. They've been very open. Um, we, we have limited uh, STRs entirely, which is kind of a big ask when you go from, you have a building that was purchased two years ago that could be a seven story box of STRs. And obviously that's very lucrative. And you take that, you, that very lucrative use off the table. That's a big ask. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that they worked with us on that. We are leaving open an ability to have some, like a boutique hotel use, which I've discussed with the community. Um, if you do want to have a lot of uh, restaurant and, and retail in particular, you do need lots of foot traffic to make that viable. And so I do think having some sort of a lodging component will help to provide uh, some additional foot traffic. We've heard from other businesses owners, owners on the street who are also supportive of adding some sort of a hospitality use. But I think the, the neighborhood board was more comfortable with a boutique hotel use, which tends to have one owner or management company rather than having a bunch of condos that could each have their own separate one. So I, I believe that this uh, really responds very well to so much of the community feedback that I've had overall. One thing that I do hope for this as well or my successor, whomever that may be, but I really hope this sets a, at least a little bit of a good ground level template for the development of the rest of the street. Um, I think having the greenway requirement on either side, for instance, of the 1200 parcel, which is not included, I think that helps to set a rational basis for planning to say, if you ever come back to rezone that parcel, you're gonna, you're gonna continue that connection, which we don't have in, in base zoning today, for instance. So I think that's really good um, and also, it um, aligns with overall goals of the Parks Department and even the East Bank um, Vision Plan to really have um, a lot of a little bit more of a natural. Um, one of the biggest things we heard in the East Bank uh, feedback was that people really wanted nature trails, and this actually provides something that's much closer to a nature trail environment for the Greenway um, than 
a lot of what a lot of other river walks are like a paved street but this actually has much more natural features a lot more greenery and, and trees and things like that that really uh, i felt uh, and still feel um, responds very well to the feedback that we received from the east bank vision plan about people wanting a more natural experience to access the river so for a lot of those reasons i would encourage your uh, support but look forward to the discussion that we'll have from other members Thank you, Councilman. Uh, one thing that I do want to note and remind the commissioners of is there was a lot of comments on affordable housing, which this commission has always been extremely supportive of affordable housing, but we walk a very fine line with the law. It is, it is against state law for us to mandate any type of affordable housing, and you cannot base your vote on any decision on affordable housing. So I want to hand it over to our counselor to remind us that while we all want more affordable housing, it is a violation of state law for us to make it a mandate. And I want to be crystal clear that that is not, we can't do anything here. So, Counselor, any other comments on the state law? I will just reiterate and support what you just said. State law does prohibit local governments from conditioning, zoning, land use, similar kinds of decisions on the providing of affordable housing. And so I just caution the commissioners to keep your comments within the law. Yes, Commissioner Clifton. I remember that um, overreach by the state, uh, as well as more recent ones. But um, it doesn't mean we have to rezone something at all. I mean, that's we can choose to think that, well, let's maybe we'll get a better proposal that incorporates things. We're not mandating anything, no specific uh, percentage or anything like that, but it's a concern. Um, anyway, the rest will be discussion. I just wanted to, am I right about that though? We, we're we not violating a state law if we don't vote for this, with, for this change. I mean, it doesn't go to that level, I don't think. You can't condition or require the provision of affordable housing. So your decision can't rest upon that in terms of the approval. So commissioner, you can't vote no just because of affordable, that they don't provide affordable housing. Now you can vote against it for any other reason, but it can't be based on affordable housing, your vote. So can, can you uh, clarify it then as far as your discussion with the developer. I mean, is that part of the, yeah. was that part of your conversation, uh, affordability uh, issue? Then also, you know, what I just heard from the oppositions, there maybe are some questions so, that just Commissioner, answer. I get really nervous when the commission starts to talk about affordable housing okay. because the councilman can't make it, oh, I'll support the project if you have affordable housing. That cannot happen. Okay. And so I just really caution. Well, wait a minute. Are we cautioning the proponents of this who brought it up? No. In general terms. They can bring it up. That this would deal with affordable housing? So I think that we just cannot base our decision on affordable housing, Commissioner. That's it. The what ifs, I think you, we just have to be careful. I'm, I'm saying I just want the commissioners to be careful. I don't want to violate state law is sure. all I'm saying. I'm not talking about anybody speaking. They can speak about affordable housing all day long, but we can't base our decision. Okay, we're clear. Pretty clear. All right, Commissioner. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other discussion? Project, yeah, we're on project. Who else? Uh, any other discussion? All right, Commissioner Johnson, here we go. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think uh, this is a regulatory SP, and as far as it has great imagination, I think the multimodal with, I really appreciate separation of the building because it is respectable for the river view. And it will give a future residents and future 
a person and existing people who will be utilizing this street to really appreciate and revitalize, you know, uh, the river, which is uh, currently really underutilized and valued. So with that imagination, I think uh, this regulatory SP, SP has great idea, and it literally meets uh, T4 uh, MU policy. And I understand some people are hesitant of the height but because of the topography, uh, height can be overcome. And I do appreciate the uh, you know, shadow study. And yes, probably uh, some portion of the uh, housing, existing housing may be shuttered in the winter uh, sun. Uh, but uh, for the most part, it uh, seems like air and sun is very uh, you know, uh, sensitive uh, to the uh, existing environment. And I think one thing we can uh, add if uh, fellow commissioners are, uh, you know, interested, we can ask applicant to bring a final a plan uh, to the at least community, because I think in this regulatory SP, if we were to approve uh, the final plan comes to uh, planning department, but more than likely, a commissioner will not have opportunity to uh, see what kind of building design, height, setback, material, and so forth. But, you know, if uh, some of the commissioners are concerned, we can add as a condition. Uh, but I think I would like to encourage uh, a developer to continue when, you know, comes the final design. So to have community meeting to encourage uh, this will be coming to your neighborhood. And so hopefully that time community can embrace a great design. And it seems like it's zoned. So I don't think maybe one developer will come in and you know uh, develop every single zone. So it can be hot spots and a different design and different material. But I think it might be more suitable because we are uniquely East Nashville. So for that, uh, I I think it's a great uh, you know a regulatory SP. One thing I have not seen is in here I'm missing landing for the Santa. Uh, that's all I'm missing. <laughs> Any other discussion? Just Mr. Uh, Tibbs. Um, comment, not a condition at all, but maybe the designer can also look at um, uh, their diagram on 90, which has the view sheds, and maybe the buildings could actually uh, reflect these view sheds more about their shape, and, and that way you could respond to the community, but also still, um, you know, um, work with the heights as well but uh the diagram on 90 i think kind of starts that but this is just a comment but then you know as an encouragement as you continue to develop this thank you i am in support thank you commissioner any other discussion commissioner Hanley. i'll, I'll be brief i think i think it, and i understand the the community coming because of the, the magnitude of the project i think something that really stuck out to me is you know we do have a lot of development that's happening along our river banks and i think uh, taking the opportunity for the development to really address some of the flood and stormwater impacts that we're seeing. I mean, again, our, our, our river system is a collective system. And so the more we can have developments take these initiatives, um, I think the better it is for our, for our city as a whole. Um, I, I love the passion and the opportunities to discuss housing and the needs for housing um, with certain words maybe omitted. But I do think um, creating housing near a park network, um, you know, I think the new position that I have on the parks board um, is one that I'm, I'm going to enjoy specifically because of the connectivity, um, the need for greater access, both with housing being placed near parks, but also along routes and access points that get you to parks. I think this project does highlight that very well. Um, I know there isn't necessarily a level of, of um, bus service that I think would be suitable for this level of development yet, but I think that's what encourages our bus network to grow. And so as we think about our transit issues, uh, you know, I'm encouraged by that. Um, I saw that one of the conditions or one of the notes from um, the Department of Transportation is the connections to Davidson Street. I think that is something that needs to be addressed. So I made that note, but then I, I saw that it was part of the presentation as well. Um, 
but just greater connectivity of the greenways. Again, this the parks representation, but the connectivity to the greenways is great. I saw a lot of conditions there, and, and I'm glad the staff has worked to navigate through that because I know those are something that are coming quite frequently now, but I think um, this project is one as, as, as good as any other to have that level of conditions on it, especially with this connectivity to the to the park system. And I know a lot of times with, with projects of this size, we, we anticipate um, the impacts on traffic. I think, you know, with the corridor itself being one that's underutilized right now, but I did already mention the, the connection to Davidson Street, but I also saw the notes um, about mandating the loading times to off hours, which is something that I know a lot of times we don't discuss here, but I do think, again, it's the consideration of this area as a neighborhood first um, and understand that the operations of the entire development um, are going to place the neighborhood um, first as it, as it grows. So, uh, with that, I'm, I'm inclined to support uh, staff's recommendation, but I just wanted to hit those highlights. Thank you, Commissioner. And I, I do want to point out, I do appreciate Commissioner Marshall and Commissioner Clifton's passion for affordable housing. And so I just, I do want to note that. So I might have jumped out a little hard there. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> just trying to protect our commissioners is all I, I do. So any, any, any other discussion? I do have a couple of things. Absolutely, um, Commissioner. I do very well remember the the, the state decision um, uh, about mandating quotas and things like that of affordable housing. I was, I'm not going to be prepared to vote for this today, however, without more of an explanation of the affordable housing, which I think was brought up by both sides. And, and I just haven't, I just, can you, maybe that, maybe I don't have to, so you can, you can just tell me. So yeah. the, com forgive me, okay, so I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, you, I mean, that's so what the, I wanted somebody to. So um, we at the commission um, review zoning proposals against the land use policy. And in this case, uh, the land use policy is T5, um, T5 mixed use center, T5 MU. And one of the things that staff values and the commission values about T5 center mixed use neighborhood is that it provides a diversity of housing. We're not addressing affordable housing specifically, which the state has weighed in on, but to say that housing and neighborhood development in our city is, is really valuable. And we wanna deliver housing on major corridors. We wanna deliver housing that's adjacent to major centers such as downtown, and this is close to downtown. And so what I, was, what I would suggest humbly as a commission is that, that, you, that you evaluate this on whether or not it is delivering housing near major streets, near major employment centers and the like, and the staff have found that it is. And so when we talk about housing delivery, I'm, we're thinking of it as a much broader framework and aspiration and actually a goal that we have in this city that we have to meet. And so we would say that when you're delivering housing, especially in addition to constraining or limiting, prohibiting short-term rentals, then you are delivering housing for residents. And so that's, I think, when you heard the applicant and the staff direct talking about housing, that's what we're talking about, is really the supply. So while we didn't require benchmarks for affordable housing, that would be prohibited by the state, we can absolutely advocate for projects that deliver housing to scale. And I guess, clearly, the short-term rental explanation is related to 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 the affordable to what I'm concerned about. I believe that short term and, and I think you're right about that. Yeah. that that's that 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 inclusion is yeah. is helpful as part of the analysis. But, and I also wanted to say, well, I've got the mic. That the councilman has done an amazing job, as always, of being on top of what's going on. And and the, the detail that you you have presented to us is is really remarkable. And um, I know I know how much <coughs> effort that takes. So I did want to say that. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? Councilman. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, um, I, I do want to respond to Commissioner Marshall, um, uh, and it is on the topic of affordable housing, but I, I will try to navigate that as best as I can. So um, our East Nashville community is a, a big proponent of affordable housing, at, at, as am I. Obviously, just up the uh, two blocks up the street, 
We've got the uh, KC Place within DHA where we're doing the Envision KC Master Plan implementation. That uh, Envision KC Master Plan is doing a one-for-one -one replacement of affordable housing. We're also mixing in market. We're adding workforce. And even to date, um, working with MDHA, we have been able to add, it doesn't sound like a huge number, but we have been able to add so far about 100 net new affordable units at MDHA. And we're really just kind of getting started with MDHA. We're not even 30% uh, of the way done yet. So we, with working with MDHA just up the street, we may be able to add a couple of other hundred additional net affordable units on top of that one for one replacement. In addition to that, at the corner of 5th and Shelby, I did work with we can't always condition things on uh, uh, affordable housing, but I did work with, there's a, a nonprofit organization called Samaritan Recovery Community that's owned some land for a long time. They had come to me uh, and uh, with a, a private development partner that specializes in affordable housing. And so for that rezoning, I did work with them to rezone it to MUGA with an understanding and with a knowledge that they were working on applications for THD housing and uh, applied for Barnes funding for them and and, and, and things like that. So, so I, that's adding, I think, about 400 additional affordable housing units up there at 5th and Shelby just around the corner. One of the things I'm most excited about about that particular project, working with that partner, is that we're doubling bed space for Samaritan Recovery for the recovery services. But in that case, the um, because there is that partnership, folks who are graduating from that recovery program get first dibs on the affordable housing so that they can continue to receive services nearby. So that's something that I try to work on when I can. And kind of what I've, we, this topic did come up during community meetings. And, and what, I, what I told the community is that affordable, uh, like largely the biggest thing we can do for affordability is supply, I mean largely. But number two, that most folks that do affordable housing, it's a very specialized um, housing financing stack that you have to go through. And so sometimes what we've seen, there's another major project in um, uh, District 5 where I think what they what they did there is that that applicant got their zone in the hot months, parceled a, a portion of that out, and that parcel portion of that, they are working with an affordable housing builder to build that, for instance. There's another one in District uh, uh, that one, that project, by the way, would be at least as large as this. I would disagree with the analysis that this is the largest project in East Nashville that that will happen. I would disagree with that because certainly that one along the Dickerson Quarter is seeing lots and lots and lots of growth. Um, there's another one at Porter and Cahal where it's a little bit more of a land swap that was able to be arranged uh, that that provided for um, folks to move to new housing if they chose to maintain very similar rents. So a lot of our East Nashville Council members are trying to be as creative as we can, uh, working kind of around some of the restrictions that we have, but we're all very passionate about adding affordable housing. And when you look at uh, the number of projects that are larger projects that do include significant affordable housing components, it's actually really high. I mean, so I would, I would say that, like, um, if we could get all 35 council districts uh, to add Three to four hundred affordable housing units each term, like we would very we would very rapidly solve our affordable housing project. But East Nashville, we are doing a lot in districts five, six, seven, and eight. Also three, like all up and down that court of Councilmember Tombs has worked on that. So we're all working together as much as we can on affordable housing for this particular project. Again, because that's such a unique financing stack, it's not to say that they couldn't parcel it out in the future, but it, it'd be difficult to condition it on today. So maybe as they continue working with subsequent um, with subsequent uh, reviews with staff, that might be a possibility in the future. We haven't foreclosed on that, but it's just difficult to condition it uh, today, particularly with um, some of the other really significant infrastructure constraints that, that make building on this site very expensive. But I, wanted, I appreciate that question, Commissioner, and uh, wanted to respond to you on that. Thank you, Councilman, and appreciate you answering Commissioner Marshall's question. All right, any other discussion? We'll need a motion. Anybody want to make a motion? Commissioner Hanley. So I make a motion to approve staff uh, recommendation to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? second. There's a second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Ayes have it. 7-0. All right. So we've been here about three hours, commissioners, and we probably need to take a restroom break.
And unfortunately, we've only finished two cases, but we'll be back in about 10 to 15 minutes. So we're going to, without objection, we'll take a 10, 15 minute break. We're going to get back started again, and, and we just want to say thank you for uh, letting us take a quick break. And we're back. So we have, we're on item number 23. We have one, two, seven items left, but this one was previously on the consent agenda. And so the ones that are on, were previously on the consent agenda, as we get later into the night, sometimes these things get resolved. And we just want to see, is anyone here um, in opposition to item number 23? Okay, perfect. So we'll hear the presentation on item number 23, and Donald is going to take us through that. Donald. All right. Thank you. Um, this is Night Drive and Ewing Drive SP, item number 23. The request is to rezone to SP to permit 50 multifamily residential units on 2.54 acres located at the southeast corner of Night Drive and Ewing Drive. Staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Property is currently zoned RS 7.5. All adjacent properties are also zoned RS 7.5 with the exception of the property to the northwest, which is zoned AR2A. Adjacent land uses are single family residential on all sides, except for a rock quarry, which is um, over to the west. Policy is T3 Suburban Neighborhood Evolving or T3NE. The T3NE policy is intended to create and enhance suburban residential neighborhoods with housing choices, improved connectivity, and moderate density setbacks and spacing between buildings. The Planning Commission previously considered an application to rezone this property to RM20A and held a public hearing on that request back in April of this year. Several issues were raised during the public hearing and the subsequent discussion. Those included the existing cemetery and other burial sites on the property, the traffic in the area, and um, the proposed density at the time. The Planning Commission ultimately determined that a regulatory SP would be a more appropriate application than RM20A. Uh, so this request has now been converted to a regulatory SP. Um, it would permit 50, up to 50 multifamily residential units. It would require preservation of the cemetery on the site um, and allow for public access to the cemetery. Uh, to that end, historical commission reviewers have provided several specific recommendations, which can be found um, in the staff report. The SP would also require that 20% of the site be designated as open space and that existing trees be preserved. Uh, building, height, building height would be limited to three stories in 35 feet. Uh, the proposed density, connectivity, and lot coverage align with the T3NE policy. The proposed de development would provide an appropriate transition between the mostly single family residential neighborhood on the east and the higher impact district industrial policy area on the west. Uh, because the proposed SP is consistent with um, the policy, staff recommends approval with conditions and disapproval without all conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Don. And we will open this item for public hearing. Is the applicant here? And I believe that, come on up, Mr. Davis, welcome. And you have 10 minutes and you can reserve two of the 10 minutes for rebuttal if you don't use them. Good, turn the mic on, there we go. All right, you're ready. Good afternoon, commissioners. Thank you for volunteering your time. Our third time in front of you. Um, we've complied with the requirements of the state. We've actually gone beyond the call of duty. We have the area uh, reserved on our site plan, which we submitted to the planning staff. And we went to the community for a second time and we're willing to go back again for more community meetings. There's something that we need to address here. The traffic is going to be a concern. It's not going to be a concern because of our development. There's already concerns, but we want to work with the community to address those. And this is what we're asking. At the last community meeting, one of the folks here today asked if we can cut back the tree line to create more visibility. 
on that street. We're going to preserve the trees, but we want permission to cut back the tree lines on the corner to make it safer. If we can do that, you know, we don't want to uproot the trees, but we want to be able to cut back the branches. If we can get that permission, that will help a couple neighbors be happy and that will create better visibility. Also, this development is going to require sidewalks, which is going to make it easier for folks to walk down that area and to get to that bus stop there and which the developer is willing to do. Also, another thing, developer is local. The Kesey family has lived in Enchantment Hills and in Bordeaux and in District 1 and 2 for years. The developer and the owner is Tom Kesey. And once again, the developer bought the property before he got all these entitlements because of his family's history in the area and also doing right by the descendants of Colonel Hewing, which are black and white. I'm sorry, uh, I'm not sick. I have been out of battle laryngitis, so excuse my, my losing my voice. Um, and also, with Council Lady Toombs and the community's permission to even go further to addressing the traffic concerns. Once again, planning did not require it. We did one anyway that said there were no traffic recommendations. We're asking an engineer, a traffic engineer, which Mr. Kesey is willing to pay to help implement with the neighbors some traffic calming that we can do safely. But the problem is, if we do a traffic light, it may create more congestion. And he's willing to come to the community meeting and explain why. But we can also address some other concern about the traffic there by making, by where our buildings are placed, they're not butting up against causing more confusion. And we address the height limitations with the SP. So we've gone beyond the call of duty here and we're willing to go even further with the community to address, you know, the potential traffic issue. Even though all the studies are saying it's not going to impact it, but we love our neighbors. So we want to do more so we can please cut back the tree line. And, and I want to reserve two minutes. So, but I still want to implement, I talk about we, my cut, you want to hear about this quarry. We don't own the quarry. The quarry has been a problem over there for years. And we acknowledge that, but whatever we can do to help mitigate that, but we are all very smart people here. And a lot of you are all professionals. And the quarry, I, we cannot address that. And I'm sorry. But once again, we're complying with the state. You have the letter from the architects. We have a reserved area where everybody's going to be buried properly. We're going to put back the historic markers, which the previous owner destroyed. And the state is going to prosecute them for what they've done to the burial site. So we're fixing that. We're working with our national historian, David Ewing, which is also a descendant of the Ewing family there, and also with other descendants of the Ewing family to make sure that site is preserved. Also, if you remember a previous public hearing where two young people that live in the neighborhood came up with the issue of affordable housing. We've added smaller flats in which we have been working, you know, to provide that affordability that they wanted. And I want to reach out to those young folks again to make sure that they are working with a good mortgage lender so they, they can move in there. And that's a commitment that we're willing to have. I know we can't do anything legislative-wise because we've tried in council several times, but we're not going to piss off the state. Excuse my French. But we're going to, do, we're going to address that issue uh, with the smaller units for them to buy because we're trying to address even though some people may not agree with this, every time someone comes up in opposition, we go full-fledged and address the issue. And we'll continue to do that and continue coming to the community meetings. And I just want your support. I reserve my two minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. We'll reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak in support? Come on up. All right. Saying none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up.
And welcome and come on up and just uh, two minutes and then just state your name and address for the record and we appreciate you coming. Hello, uh, my name is Teresa House. Ma'am, hold on one second. Just grab the mic and kind of lower it. There we go and scoot closer to it. Yep, perfect. There you go. Go ahead. Hello, my name is Teresa House. I live at 541 Mill Station Drive. That's in Clay Mill Station uh, right off of Ewing lane or drive, whichever one you want to call it. I've lived there for 30 years. I purchased a home there, and prior to that, I was raised out there from 64, so I've been out there about 45 years. So I'm very familiar with that location. That is going to be a traffic hazard. We've already had several fatalities to happen on Knight Road and Ewing Lane, where there's not enough traffic and people have pulled out. And we've had, I know, at least two people who have pulled out onto Night Road from Ewing Lane, and they have lost their life. So to put 50 units on that corner without adjusting the traffic, without addressing the, um, the lanes, without some type of increased um, traffic problems there, we're asking for danger. There's a creek that sits right to the left side, the right side, that fills up, and many times you can't cross that bridge, so you're going to have to turn left off Ewing Lane onto Night Road, and that is a hazard. If you've got 50 units sitting there and all these people are trying to come out because they got to go to work. So you're talking about an extra 150 cars coming out of Clay Mill. Now it takes me 15 minutes to exit onto Ewing Lane and another 10 minutes to exit onto Night Road. If you put those units there, it's going to be a traffic problem. The query is less than 500 feet from there. I don't know any mortgage lenders that are going to loan you money and your house is sitting less than 500 feet from a rock query. My house is already damaged and I'm not that close. We complain about it all the time. So I don't know how they're going to sit there and a lender comes out and going to loan you money to buy a house that's sitting less than 500 feet from a rock query. I am saying no to this proposal. Time's up. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. to raise it up some. <laughs> Hello, my name is Marilyn Brennan. I'm at 2944 Clay Mill Boulevard in Clay Mill Station. Um, one of my main concerns with this is, even though he says that they don't own the rock quarry, we know that, but location, location. And you have to deal with the land and what's around the land and that is the rock quarry. Now, it was my understanding back in, I think, 2015, that the state put a buffer, uh, amended a buffer around rock quarries in this state, which is, I think, 500 feet. And it's not from the active part of the rock quarry, it's from the property line. That was my understanding. So that's a two-lane street. That rock quarry is right there at their side of the property. The, on the other side, on the north side of Ewing Lane, there is the creek right there. At my property, which is in Clay Mill Station on the main street, our rumbling is so strong till it knocks things off walls. If you're talking about building three-story units on the corner within 100 feet of an active rock quarry, what is that going to do to the people that live there? The dust. And I'm not just concerned about my property. I'm t concerned about the people that are going to possibly be occupying those units. They're going to be disastrous. Nobody that has COPD, nobody that has asthma, nobody that has um, military problems are going to be able to stay there. It's going to be a disaster. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Claudia Wright. I reside at 532 Mill Station Drive. Uh, in the Clay Mill Station subdivision. I'd like to say hello to Mr. Denny Marshall, 
Uh, so good to see you. He helped me uh, buy my very first home, 1993, and you'll be glad to know I still have it. <laughs> Thank you. But however, as I said, I reside at 532 Mill Station Drive in the Clay Mill Station subdivision with my husband. And the rock quarry that is there, when I first got over there, it, it shook so bad, I thought we were having an earthquake. I, it, it's hard to get accustomed to the, the violence of this rock quarry. In fact, the home that I live in is a single family home on one level, but the rock quarry has blasted so much that one of our rooms sunk and we had to pay $27,000 to have that corrected. So when we think about someone is planning to build three stories much closer to the rock quarry than we are, it doesn't make any sense. One of the problems we have in our community is one, our policy is wrong. Nobody in our community that I have found said we wanted to be suburban neighborhood evolving, particularly because of that rock query. It doesn't make sense. So we've asked our council ladies, several of us, to change our policy from this evolving to maintenance. We also find it difficult to believe that we have so many people who come into our community, they know we are a single family home community, yet they come in with the deliberate intention of mass density and, and overrunning all of our concerns and objectives. It's not right. And we turn to you guys and the Metro Council to help us to support us, the single family homeowners, Thank the you. ones who the budget was balanced on our backs. We need your help now. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. And good evening. My name is Rhonda Moore and my husband and I have resided at 660 Ewing Drive for the past 42 and a half years. I am po opposed to the development of 50 multifamily homes that will be located three houses from my home. I'm opposed due to the issue of the grave sites, infrastructure, and safety. At the meeting on April 27th, Mr. Davis mentioned that close to an acre would be set aside to be used for the memorial for those interred at this site. However, at the community meeting in May, a new rendering was seen and it showed the 16 graves located between two buildings. I feel this is inappropriate. Mr. Davis also mentioned at that meeting that a traffic study was not required. I'm not sure of this process, but they clearly are not aware of trying to turn left on night road around nine o'clock when the caravan of delivery trucks from FedEx and UPS leave for the day. Since there is only a stop sign on Ewing, there is a lot of backup, which will increase with additional traffic. This area currently has several new developments in progress now. They include the 600 block of Ewing Drive, approved for 46 residential lots, Green Lane, approved for 72 lots. This is in addition to the existing subdivisions of Clay Mill, Brookview, Golden Valley, and two habitat communities. A much larger develop is on the development is on the other side of Ewing Pass Brick Church Pike. The infrastructure is simply not present to support the increased traffic. This area does not have sidewalks. Some of Knight Road has no lighting. There's also a blind curve. 18 wheelers from FedEx and UPS use Knight Road daily. How would these new residents get in and out of the area safely as it is becoming more difficult for current residents, particularly at peak times? My husband and I are retired, and we hope to enjoy our retirement in a peaceful environment. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. And welcome, sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Jermaine Betts, and I live next door to Mrs. Moore at 654 Ewing. Uh, I think everything has pretty much been said, you know, as far as the, the traffic, not even really going to deal with the rock quarry uh, situation. But uh, just to be clear, I am pro-development, not that much development on that corner in particular. That is a very compact site 
for that many units. And I don't see any feasible way to be able to allow traffic to come in and out. I don't care if it's from Ewing or from Knight Road safely, not with the trucks going back and forth in the manner in which they do from UPS and from FedEx, uh, in addition to the, the regular residential traffic that's there. Myself and Mrs. Moore, we can sit in our front yard and look at that traffic backing up in front of our house, which is, uh, I'd say, 100, maybe 100 yards or so from that stop sign. So if the traffic is already backing up at this, you know, at that type of a rate, what is it going to do now with 50 plus un or 50 units right there on that corner? There's no way that the traffic will not be impacted by this development. Again, I'm not against development. I'm just against that many units. And I think that needs to be taken into account. And as she pointed out, Ms. Moore pointed out, there are other developments that are already, you know, been green lighted and underway. So that's just more that is coming in there. Again, have no problem with development. It just needs to be done in a more, I guess, sensible way so that the people that are there are not impacted as negatively. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, two minute rebuttal, Mr. Davis. I want to thank the neighbors for coming out and expressing their concerns. <clears throat> As we can see, the grave site has not changed. And you see the buildings are not on that corner where the cons major traffic concerns are. We're preserving the grave site like we said we're going to do. We have the state out there almost every day with us. And once again, We've done everything and we're continuing to do everything to make sure the graves are preserved. And there is going to be a memorial with historic, with the historic markers. And, and it's, going to, it's going to be a heck of a lot better than what it is now. Also, if we can get permission to cut back, not cut, take out the trees, but cut back to help with visibility, that will also help with less accidents as one of the, the nice neighbors has said to if we are, if we're allowed to cut back some of that those limbs so that people can see also we're more than willing to also address other traffic concerns and once again we're within policy we followed directions and even before it was the sp um it was approved by staff it's approved by staff again we're within the policy so we're trying to do whatever we can to do what's right. And more importantly, you know, we've, we're going beyond and above the call of duty to make sure, you know, the, both the European and the African-American ancestors are treated justly when they have not been treated justly before. So thank you for your time. And once again, we're within policy. We're addressing the traffic concerns. We're willing to come back for another community meeting and also we address the affordability concerns. And if we could please cut back the trees for better visibility, it may also help with truck traffic too, because now the trucks can be able to see. Thank you for your time, commissioners. Thank you, sir. Council lady. Tims, you recognized. Thank you, um, Chair. I, I don't have much um, to add. Um, Ewing Drive is is a as a whole is a historic part of of the district, um, and I've done as much as I can as a council person to to preserve the character of that area. Um, this particular parcel does butt up to an industrial area. Um, that's why the the land use policy of uh, T3 neighborhood evolving hasn't, I haven't really looked at changing that because of where this parcel is, is located. I have changed the land use policy on other parts of UN Drive. Uh, so other than this small section, UN Drive is, is neighborhood maintenance uh, throughout. Um, I'm not convinced that 50 units is appropriate uh, for this corner. Uh, I know there are some neighbors who would like to see nothing go on this corner. 
that's not appropriate either because the property owner does have certain uh, rights uh, under the current zoning. Uh, so something at some point will go on this property. Uh, what I tell constituents is that when there are concerns about traffic and, and visibility, when you have a, a development that comes up, that's an opportunity to work with that developer to address some of those community concerns. Whereas when someone builds by right, you have no say. They just get to do whatever the current zoning is. Um, so I would like to see some further discussions with the property owner in the community to see if those traffic concerns can be uh, addressed. I'd like to see, I don't know if NDOT has looked at this, but I would like you know someone from NDOT to look at it to see what would be the best way to address those traffic concerns. Um, if the commission feels like it fits the land use policy, I'm fine with that. Once it comes over to council, I do plan to have further uh, community meetings. So it's not an automatic, it's gonna go through uh, the process with my, with my approval. Uh, Cause I do think there needs to be some further discussion. That's it. Thank you, council. I appreciate it. Seeing no one else switching to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. I think we hadn't started with um, Commissioner Henley yet. So, Commissioner Henley, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. So, this one's this one's interesting. I I, I heard all the community members highlighting uh, their current experiences and concerns. I think there's several comments that we have in the staff um, in the staff report that speak to comments from from NDOT as well as just some other traffic concerns. And, and I'm very familiar with the intersection. I, I know exactly what they mean. Um, I, I think we're, I mean, we're at a point because this is, even though we do have and have been presented a site plan, that it's a regulatory SP. And so some of those, some of those outlaid um, potential improvements um, to the to the public realm, they're not defined yet, and I think that may give a little bit more comfort if those were there um, for the community. But again, those are requirements. I mean, that would that would be part of this progressing forward. As far as the appropriateness of the density, I think it's it's significant compared to what you see around the community. But on that corridor, I mean, I think again, figuring out how to enter and exit the property is more the concern versus the density. I'm pro density. I think this is an area that gives me pause, even with that, just knowing the area and knowing that that condition at that intersection. And the last thing I'll say, you know, I saw one of the notes and maybe this is a clarification that staff can can give me, but <clears throat> specifically now the trees along the Western property line um, shall be preserved except for removal when necessary due to stormwater management. Um, and ingress and egress is, I mean, is there a significance that was brought to that tree line? Cause I, I mean, I, I, I know the intersection. It is a, it is an impairment to, to that view. Is there some type of significance that was presented with that? So I, that was, <clears throat> that was to some extent a recognition of staff that you do have a pretty abrupt um, policy seam there between a really industrial use and a more residential use. And so trying to, where possible, preserve trees um, to provide for landscaping and buffering from the more industrial uses on the um, opposite side of Night Drive. Although if there was um, a desire to uh, clarify that condition to allow for um, trimming for increased sight lines, that that's certainly something you can consider. Depending on where we go with this, I mean, that's something that I would advocate heavily for. I mean, I understand policy, but I, we've been a body, I've been on the body for about two years. Safety usually seems to come first. Um, and just having, again, been familiar with that, I think that's a modification that makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I'd like to hear from other commissioners based on what they feel about the density. I'm still wrapping my brain around the orientation of the site plan. I think that was, that was helpful to see it. Um, but those are my initial comments. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other? Commissioner Tibbs? Yes. Yeah, I think density is the only thing because I think uh, the applicant has worked hard to try to get as many things as he's uh, accomplished on. Uh, but um, 
even the um, council person was a little concerned about the number, and, and uh, maybe there is some some leeway to deal with that later as well once it gets to you. But but staff, what is the range as far as like in this to stay with policy? Like I, I know is is it fifty in the middle or is fifty at the top end? Is there you know just uh, do we have any? Leverage there as far as that. So in that policy area, the RM 20 a so the 20 units per acre is the top on the recommended range. And so that's what for this property at two and a half acres, that's where the 50 units comes from. So that that is at the very top end of the of the range in that policy area. Yeah, I think that would be the only, you know, I think that would uh, probably be the kind of I'll use the word compromise, but more just a, a little bit more le leverage there to lower that number. Uh, and, and I don't know what that number is, but, you know, somewhere that still, do you have the, the low end number or just the high end number? Um, so the T3 neighborhood evolving would include some R, some RS. When looking at multifamily, it's likely um, RM9, 15, 20 is, is, is for the multifamily. And RM9 at nine units per acre is somewhat the equivalent of some of the higher density single family. It just allows for a different form than a single family would permit because you've got minimum lot sizes, if that makes sense. Just to clarify, do you know roughly what that unit count, I know you don't like to do math on the spot, <laughs> we, but we are we do that. just, it might be, because I think what you're, what you're hearing is what's the range, and sure. so since this is presented as a number, it might be helpful for the commission to know, moderate. If you want to. So uh, RM9 would be 23 um, units, RM15 would be 38. So 23, 38, 50. Okay, so range between 23 and 50 there. Yes, okay. 23, 38, 50. Thank you. Councilman. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate this coming back as a regulatory SP. I, I think the last time we had a discussion, it was between, is I think the original request is the RM20. We had a discussion about RM15 has, I mean, obviously it's a fewer number of units, but also has some different height limitations than the RM20. Um, and obviously this is an SP, but it, it appears that, if not mistaken, that the request for the SP is, does allow three stories, but in 35 feet is what's submitted in this. And so how does that compare to the RM15 or whatever those requirements might be? That's number one. And my other question, um, is uh, one of the things I've commented on previously is that um, there is a, a pretty surprising amount of pedestrian activity along Ewing in particular. There is a bus stop. It's across the street. I've, if I'm not mistaken, I think that bus is a loop. So there isn't a bus stop on both sides, but there is on the north side. It's across the street from this, but there is a bus stop there. I do think that um, because we can still sometimes require a sidewalk in SPs, that that, that is a real advantage to doing the SP, but a technical question about that, I guess, is if, if we're, we, we often have this very difficult choice, but uh, if the sidewalks were to be constructed, how would that impact the, the tree buffer that we're also discussing? So you'll notice a condition that staff crafted that indicated to provide sidewalks, um, indicated that um, an alternative design may be appropriate to work with NDOT um, and planning on that, um, which is not unusual that sometimes you would pull a sidewalk further off of the road if there's something that you're trying to preserve. Mm -hmm. And then we actually even provided the opportunity to do a payment in lieu as opposed to building if there were conflicts. And so we tried to leave some opportunity with the final site plan just to look at, at what it might look like. Um, the height question that you asked, um, so the height for RM15A, is it A? Yes. Okay, sorry. RM15A height is um, 20, 20 feet at the... Um, at the bill too? At the setback. Oh, okay, yeah. And then 
I'm sorry, the way the table is configured, it's, and then uh, it's a two to one height control plane. Hold on, wait, that doesn't, let me look. That doesn't feel right. Hold on, just give me a moment. Okay. Y'all can continue and I'll. Um, but I guess I, th that's really helpful about the sidewalk. I mean, I, it, like I say, with the amount of pedestrian activity there and there is a bus stop nearby, that's a, that's a really nice thing to have. So I, I think um, sometimes if, if you're introducing density to an area that where it's presently vacant, there's a lot of traffic, the, the actual effect of having this many units versus this many units, like the, the traffic difference is actually pretty small. And so, I, I mean, I think that sometimes getting the trade off of having the sidewalk is actually a huge improvement for the community relative to, to whatever that difference in the number of cars is. If, if they're going to, if you're going to be introducing new um, access points anyway, that, that aren't there today. Um, so I, I do appreciate bringing this back as an SP. Um, I do appreciate as well the requirements uh, about uh, preservation of the cemetery, which is, uh, I'm a cemetery nut, so those, that's really important to me, um, uh, which we, we get through an SB that you wouldn't get at least in the same capacity with, with straight zoning. So I'm generally supportive of this. I know that we're, we're kind of uncomfortable with the number, but, but I also feel as though potentially that is something that Council Member Toombs could continue to talk about the number. I don't think that we would get to a point that it would be a disapproved bill if that number were reduced. But I'm much more comfortable with the SP plan as presented generally. I think it still leaves room to work and Council Member Toombs can haggle uh, with uh, the, the applicant and her constituents about that number and or even just decide whether or not to move forward at all. I mean, I, I think that that is still there and there wouldn't be harm to that. But I, I do think that the SP as presented allows some things that are, are definite improvements to the community and some things that can still be ironed out. So I'm generally supportive of the, the plan this time. Do, Lisa, what's the I do have the height. height. Yeah. Yes. So I was not on the table that had the heights for the alternative districts, which made which was causing me confusion. So RM fifteen A has a height maximum height of thirty feet at the build two line, and then after a fifteen foot step back, you can go up to thirty five feet. RM twenty A has a maximum height of thirty feet at the step at the set at the build two line, and then after a fifteen foot step back, you can go up to forty five feet. And so, um, in crafting the regulations, they were limited to um, three stories in thirty five, which is less height than what's permitted by RM twenty, and less height actually than what's permitted by the base zoning now, which would just be three stories without a foot cap. Is there a tool we need to give to the council person to be able to negotiate that that number? Or is it just she has the ability to work with that? Because I, I don't really want to say, you know, 46 units or 31 or whatever and let, give her the ability to work with it. If you're asking if we want to offer guidance about what fits in the policy, you can definitely do that. That's the role of the commission. If the question is um, what happens if the councilwoman chooses to further limit the number of units from what we approve, that is absolutely her discretion and it would not require re-referral or anything to the commission. Generally, the rule is if a council member wants to entertain more than what we've proposed, then that can result in a re-referral. So she would have that, that discretion. Any other? Yes, Commissioner. Yes, Chair, thank you. Um, this is a tough one. Um, I know the area very well and know the, how the community would feel about putting a development there of 50 units. The traffic is a concern. I mean, without a doubt, it is a concern. It is a concern also with the rock quarry being there as they stated. You know, I think that there needs to be some more discussion, you know, between the council lady and uh, the developer, the builder. Um, they need to listen to the community. And, and looking at it from as one of the um, people said, from a lending community, we would have a problem with it uh, being that close to a rock quarry, 
would it pass certain tests and things of that nature? And so I'm struggling with it because I also know on the other side of that is, as the council lady said, the owner has rights, you know, to, to build and develop and all of that. But they also need to do it in a way that is fitting into the community and it meets the community needs and it, and it doesn't po pose even more of a traffic hazard than is already there. So I personally would like to see more than what I see here, you know, tonight before we would pass it. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Clifton. It's been a very puzzling case and we've, we've heard it before and uh, everyone's worked on it some more and I appreciate that. Uh, I think the answer is from a planning standpoint, the staff is right um, and can be justified from a planning standpoint. And I believe that the, <clears throat> where the where the specifics come in is going to be at the council level. Um, and um, in most cases, and especially this one, I think I, I would trust the council on this to come up with something that's the best for the area and within that as long as it didn't go beyond what we had allowed. So I'll be prepared at the right time to, to move that we adopt staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Any, any other discussion? A lot of good discussion going on. Any, Commissioner Johnson? Thank you. Uh, I do appreciate uh, added condition, especially at the last meeting, uh, we are concerned about uh, preservation and protection of historical cemetery. And I think a historic I did really good condition, although it is not incorporated in actual SP language, but I am assuming everything historical recommended is part of the condition. So with that, I feel much comfort because uh, the applicant will still have to continue archaeology study. And if by any chance uh, some architect or remaining was uh, discovered outside of the uh, identified cemetery. They still have to follow state regulation and uh, they may not be able to build uh, where the additional discovery was found. So with that uh, sense, I think uh, applicant asked everything that we uh, required applicant to do. And uh, also the concern is uh, the multifamily housing will be appropriate in this location. But I think because of the existing quarry and uh, industrial use across the street, so it will be appropriate as a transition. So uh, the actual height, yes, indeed, uh, it's the highest end of the unit count. But as far as it does meet the policy, I think it meets the policy. So for that, uh, I think uh, once we move to the council level and continue community meeting and continue engagement with the historic zoning commission, uh, historic uh, commission and state agency, uh, there might be further reduction of the unit. So I am comfortable uh, supporting uh, with this a request at this point. Thank you, Commissioner. And, and the one thing from our discussion today, and I asked the director, is that it, whatever, whoever makes a motion and if it passes, we need to make sure we add that one of the conditions be the trimming of the trees for site lines in, in the motion. Just whoever wants to do it. So any more discussion? Any more discussion? Hey, we need a motion. Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Johnson makes better motions than I do. All right, Commissioner Johnson. So I make motion to approve uh, item 23 uh, with a condition, a disapprove uh, with that condition, with added condition of uh, allow applicant to uh, trim uh, the trees in the right of way. For sight line, right? For the, yes. That's proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? One no, six ayes, one no. And it passes with the condition. All right, so we are on to item 35. The 
hold on a second. Hold on one second, commissioners. So this particular item was on the consent agenda and as we do every night um, when we go along, is there anyone in the room that opposes item 35? Right, we wanna make sure here. Anyone in opposition? Lisa, can you read it out sure. for us so we know what, make sure. Sure, item number 35 is 2023 COD 0040001. It's a contextual overlay for properties located north of Rich Acres Drive and east of Creekwood Drive. So is there anyone in opposition to item 35? All right, seeing none, commissioners, uh, we can, if, if the commission wants to, we can place this back. Is there a motion to place it back on the consent agenda? There's a motion and a second. Any other discussion? <laughs> seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed no, ayes have it, and item 35 has been adopted and placed back on the consent agenda. All right, so that leads us to item 36 which this particular item was also on the consent agenda. So Lisa, if you could read item, which item this is. Item 36 is 2023 COD 005001. It's a contextual overlay for properties located south of Ewing Drive and west of Dickerson Pike. Thank you. Is there anyone in the room in opposition to item 36? Okay, thank you. Donald, you're busy tonight. The presentation. Thanks, Donald. Start of the show. Uh, this is item 36 on your agenda, contextual overlay district. Um, the request is to establish a contextual overlay district for 163 parcels on 119.3 acres east of Dickerson Pike, south of Ewing Drive, north of Pine Ridge Drive. Uh, this request was made by Council Member Toombs. Staff recommends approval of this request. Uh, the current zoning for all of the affected properties is RS10. And again, what's being requested is the contextual overlay. Uh, the purpose of the contextual overlay is to provide appropriate design standards in a residential area in order to maintain and protect existing neighborhood form and character. The subject property has a predominant development pattern of single story residences with a consistent bulk and massing throughout the neighborhood. Uh, to maintain and support this pattern, the contextual overlay would regulate certain development aspects, including setbacks, building height, lot coverage, and access garages and parking. Uh, a contextual overlay is appropriate in a neighborhood maintenance policy area, which is um, what this area is, T3NM. Uh, uh, there is also some conservation uh, in the area as well. So because this proposed overlay is consistent with the T3NM policy, uh, staff recommends approval. Thank you. Thank you, and we'll open this item for public hearing. And Council Lady Toombs is the applicant. And so, Council Lady, appreciate you staying late with us. Yeah, what a joy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the Hillhurst subdivision, and, and Hillhurst is one of the oldest African-American, uh, predominantly African-American neighborhoods uh, in the district. Um, one of the first areas where African-Americans could own homes. It actually qualifies for neighborhood conservation overlay. It's just ran out of time this term to, to get that done. And so uh, decided on a contextual overlay to essentially protect the character of the neighborhood. There's a lot of development in my district uh, one of the key uh, goals uh, that I ran on and that I've tried to implement over the past four years is concentrating development along our major corridors and protecting historic and established neighborhoods. And Hillhurst subdivision is one of those. Uh, when I first got into office, I met with neighbors. The Neighborhood Association was really active pre-COVID um, and, and they had an interest in protecting uh, the character of the neighborhood. There was a house that had been built in the neighborhood and I got many calls as to how that could be possibly be built in the neighborhood. Most folks did not like it. Uh, and so this is an attempt to get ahead of development, you know, as 
there's a lot of seniors in that area as people move on, transition to other places. Uh, you know, folks buy homes, they want to tear down some of these older homes and, and build new homes. And so this is an, a, a chance to really put some protections in place to keep the character of the neighborhood that's been there for so long. That's it. Thank you, Council Lady. Anyone wishing to speak in support of the bill? No. Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up and state your name and address. Appreciate you coming. Good evening. Um, my name is Brian Falk. I live at 3000 Rich Acres, um, Nashville. So in this neighborhood, um, the reason I'm, so I didn't know what the contextual overlay really was. So that's kind of the reason I'm here. Um, but understanding what it does, I, you know, I agree with some, some of the contextual overlay aspects, but I'm also don't want to restrict what the neighborhood can do based on the original designs of older homes. Um, these homes are narrow with very low roof pitches. Um, so to be able to build a new single family home, single level uh, with wider, you, you still need higher roof pitches. So that could be a, a concern there. Um, and the other thing is, I think the contextual overlay also limits the square footage of a house based on your neighbors as well. Um, this is one of the few areas in East Nashville where you can actually have land that's over half an acre. I've lived in East Nashville for 10 years and the reason we moved in this neighborhood is so our kids can grow up with land and play outside. So, um, you know, as our family grows, we need more space. And so that's kind of what we're looking to do is add space to our existing home in this neighborhood. So um, I don't want to be restricted by the houses next to me or what I can do to my house. And that's it. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, my name is Travis Larkin. I live at 2922 Stanwick Drive. I've been there 25 years, and I'm against it because diversity. Everybody should have a chance to do what they want to do with their property. They build a big home over there, three stories. Everybody else is one story. That's fine with me. I get to drive by and tell my daughter, one day you can have that. These are starter homes. Why we got to leave them to where they are today. Let's grow with this. Let's just, you know, let's, I understand there are certain rules that need to be made. There are uh, uh, offsets to the square footage and everything like that. You know, you have your setbacks. They're already in place. But if someone wants to build something bigger than what's in the neighborhood, that's fine with me. I've been there 25 years. It's nice to see something different and new. Refreshing. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, rebuttal, Council Lady. So I've done several of these in my district already. And as I always say, I'm happy to speak with individual property owners once it gets back. Excuse me, once the bill comes to council, happy to meet with individual property owners and see if their concerns can be addressed, as I've done with other uh, contextual overlays that I've done. Also, have a community meeting scheduled on Tuesday of next week, and the contextual overlay for both Hillhurst and Oak Park are on the agenda to address any additional concerns from constituents. And as I've said before, the vast majority of folks in these established and historic neighborhoods want to see their neighborhoods preserved, and that's what I'm trying to do with this. Thank you, Council Lady. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Marshall, you have not gone first tonight yet. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, so got to turn the mic on. There we go. Yep, there we go. Don't know if it's a whole lot of um, questions I have about it. I think that um, what the staff has laid out here is pretty straightforward, and they've approved it, and I don't see anything that would keep me from moving forward on it. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? That I, I do agree with the council person. I think that it is 
there's not a lot of places in Nashville that were able to, uh, you know, keep the community character. And this is, and there's still some leeway for, um, you know, to um, get larger still. So there's that's still part of it. it. Doesn't have to be exact same, but it, but it helps keep that character. So uh, I'm in support of uh, this. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Henley, you have. Yeah, just one question I have for staff, and I again I agree. I think the, the overlay is appropriate for this area. When you have an area that has significant diversity in lot sizes, um, I'm just curious as how some of the some of the conditions work together, right? Because you know, so if somebody does have you know neighbors that abut them, they have a very small lot on one side or two sides. So their their home may be bigger, but then their lot area is larger. Is there any, just help me understand it. Is it everything works in conjunction or are there kind of certain things that Trump or kind of tiering? Um, so the contextual overlay is going to have standard and it's gonna have standards related to primarily um, building height, um, uh, building square footage coverage of square foot or I'm sorry coverage of the building not lot coverage but the actual square footage of the footprint of the building and then access garages and parking Donald has helpfully pulled it up for me um, each lot or each um, calculation would be individual to that lot so for instance um, if wherever a house is located you would look at the two developed lots on either side um, and so it's not the lot size, but it's actual the, the, the coverage of the buildings. So um, the height would be um, no, no greater than 35 feet or 125% of whatever the height is on the structures, the four closest, so the two on either side. Um, it does have some language in there that if 125 feet if 125% of the average is less than 27, you can go up to 100, or you can go up to one point one and a half stories and 27 feet. So it does have sort of a catch-all to recognize if everything's one story and you're getting averages of less than, you can still go up to at least 27 feet. So it's trying to get some some um, some gap in there. Um, detached garages and accessory buildings um, are included in uh coverage so if you have a home and you're adding a detached garage that's not going to count against you um, in the square footage so in other words if you're already sort of at the the maximum and you want to add an accessory building it wouldn't um, you could still do that it doesn't count towards that coverage um, there is also always the option that if you're bu bumping up against any of those standards that you can go to the bza and so typically if if you're going to the BZA to asking for some relief from one of these standards and you've got support of neighbors, then the BZA uh, definitely takes that into consideration. So that is also an option. Thank you. Satisfied? And just for the record, the BZA is the Board of Zoning Appeals. All right. Thank Any you. other questions? Yes. Any other discussion? Commissioner Tibbs. No, I'd, oh. I'd say I make a motion to approve. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. second? Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. It's adopted. So now we are on to item number 37. And so this particular item was also on the consent agenda. And so let's see before uh, we just let's see if there's anyone in the room that's in opposition. Is there folks in opposition on item 37? Okay. All right. We're on item 37. Laszlo is going to bring us to the presentation. This one's going to be pretty similar. Um, but yep, I'm Laszlo Martone presenting item 37. The request is to uh, establish a contextual overlay district uh, to various properties located north of Ashland City Highway and east of Fairview Drive. Staff's recommendation is to approve. Um, 
The area included in the proposed overlay includes various properties located within the Enchanted Hills and Royal Crest subdivisions. The area is bounded by Ashland City Highway, Drake's Branch Road, Kings Lane, and White's Creek. There's a predominant uh, development pattern in the neighborhood consisting of single story and split level residences with consistent setbacks, bulk and massing um, that are present throughout the proposed overlay boundary. All the properties are currently zoned RS-15 and the primary use of the area is single family residential. So the contextual overlay is a zoning tool that provides design standards for residential areas to maintain and protect form and character. Within the overlay, development standards for new construction are tied to adjacent lots. And um, however, the contextual overlays do not affect the base zoning of a property. The properties are primarily located within the T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance uh, policy area and include some areas of conservation policy. There is one vacant um, property within the proposed boundary that is within the civic policy. And um, as um, stated before, T3 suburban neighborhood maintenance is intended to maintain the general character of developed suburban residential neighborhoods. And the application of this overlay district would help to preserve the existing character with specific development standards for bulk massing, access, garages, and parking. Um, as proposed, the overlay is consistent with a T3NM policy and the standards required will help maintain and protect neighborhood form and character. Because the proposed contextual overlay district is consistent with the policy, staff recommends approval. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. We'll open the public hearing and I believe that Councilmember Hall is the app. There he is. Come on up, Councilmember. Welcome. Good to see you again. There we go. Well, good evening once again, a little bit later. Um, I'll be as quick as possible and save a few minutes for a rebuttal. Um, you guys have seen every rezone for this district for the last decade has been pretty much this conversation surrounding them has been identical. Um, this is, I could have just replayed word for word what Councilmember Toon said because she's actually got one that bumps up against this. And it was, this was done in succession with that. Um, Median age, 61, average lot size, acre, acre and a half, over 2,000 square feet, almost three per home. They absolutely are dead set against density being anywhere near them, except on the corridors. Um, we've had this conversation at nauseum through dozens of meetings um, over the years. Even recently, um, we had some rezones, and you'll see on number 38, it's also an overlay for a adjacent community. Um, the same thing applies in both of these, and so it'll be really um, just a repeat. Two-story, all brick, large lot sizes, that's all this community's ever been. That's all it ever wants to be. This does not stem growth or the uh, development this does not prevent density in any way if it's along those corridors but these are my entire lifetime i've lived in this neighborhood in this community and it has never been anything other than this conversation these boomers and then my generation that's moved back to that community or stayed in that community don't want to see zero lot lines don't want to see townhomes don't want to see duplexes don't want to see the tall and skinnies. And so this is something that they've constantly demanded or clamored for. And it's just taken a while for us to get to that point. And now we're starting to get that density on those corridors. We just don't want it bleeding over into the existing residential neighborhoods. This is part of the Gold Coast, that historic black portion of that community of Bordeaux that already has one at the other end of Ashton City Highway. And this is just closing that loop um, and connecting over those two neighborhoods. Because we've got rehabs and new construction, single family homes that are more than double the average home value that are already there, people are very happy with keeping it exactly the way it is and not wanting something different to come in there. And so, like I said, I, I should have just count, copied and pasted Council Member Toon's remarks because it, it's identical for both 37 and 38. 
Thank you, Councilman, and we'll save time for rebuttal. All right. Anyone wishing to speak in support? In support? This is for it. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, the speaker's back there, broken, I bet. Oh, hold on a second. We'll turn the microphone off. There you go. Go ahead, sir. My name is William McDaniel, and I said 4223 Drake Seal Drive. That area of town has been there for a long time. My house, <clears throat> I bought it 12 years ago. And the only thing that I want to say about changing that neighborhood, <clears throat> next door to me, a young couple just bought a new house. The doctor to live next door for me died. And this young couple bought, and I'm helping them today, remodel that house across the street from me. <clears throat> my wife's friend died. Her son moved back to that house from New Jersey. I'm not speaking as a investor. I'm not speaking as a developer. I'm speaking as a homeowner, somebody who lives in this neighborhood, who loves the neighborhood, and don't want to see these young people paying six, seven hundred thousand dollars for a house, and two weeks later, you come up with a skyscraper next door. And I know that I've listened to the arguments back and forth, <clears throat> do a lot of remodeling myself. But I ask you, as you consider this, consider those folks that built those houses 25, 30, 40 years ago, and now that children is moving back. And in that neighborhood, I've seen two or three brand new houses, and the folks took that neighborhood under consideration and built 40,000 square feet houses. So I'm, I'm not getting into a debate on Nashville, but I am getting a debate on <clears throat> that section that I live in. And I hope that you, as you consider this, don't consider it for me. <clears throat> Consider it for those families that built those houses years ago and are now passing them down to their children. And they don't want to see a skyscraper next door. And in all honesty, we got enough skyscrapers going up all over Nashville right now to everybody ought to have them one Thank if you, they sir. want one. <laughs> Thank you. But in that neighborhood, <clears throat> like a Brentwood neighborhood, like a other neighborhoods who people have pride in their houses, we got pride in our houses and they, in that neighborhood, and we really don't want to see it torn apart. And, and, Thank you, sir. That's what I'm saying. As a personal, my, and I miss my time. Thank you. <laughs> anyone else wishing to speak in support? Saying none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. State your name and address for the record in two minutes, and the timer's right there. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Joy Kimbrough, and I reside at 3901 Drake's Branch Road. I also own 3903 Drake's Branch Road. My uh, child and grandchild live down the street on Drake's Branch Road. So I am coming to you today, and I'm going to speak for 37 and 38, just because it's all the same. The main reason I came and sat here this long is because this contextual overlay, which ultimately may be a good thing, we don't know, because we have not had one meeting. We have not had one meeting. We've been robbed the common courtesy um, of a community meeting to ask questions, to find out more, and to be able to come in here and intelligently express ourselves whether we are for or against. All we are asking for is time. We're in between um, council persons. Soon we'll have a new council person. And we're just asking that you defer. That's all. It may be good. It may not be good. But you, we just want community meetings so that we can discuss it, so that we can ask questions. Um, I own a multifamily unit. You know, I may personally not want it. But the council person, I'm sure, is going to do whatever the community wants. But right now, we don't know because we have not had a meeting. 
And so we're just asking you to allow us that simple courtesy of having a community meeting. And I don't think we've had one maybe in over a year, but we just want a community meeting so we can talk about it. And I told other people who had to leave that I would let you know, let you know that that's all we want is a community meeting. I see my time is up. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Good evening. My name is David Waters. Uh, I reside at 4340 Shady Dell Road and Commissioner Marshall also helped me find financing for my dream home. And it's uh, truly a dream home for a man of my generation and all that so, came with it. So you have to, to be able to come to address the chair. To be able to uh, realize owning a home in the in Channing Hill community was a dream come true for me. Uh, throughout the night, it's been a common theme of the words dilapidated and the words character. Dilapidation is far from uh, any description of the community that I live in and was able, it was blessed to, uh, to own. But the word character is, it describes it to a T. Uh, we live in a community that's well, well maintained homes, well manicured lawns, quiet streets, uh, it's full of retired professionals and there's a low crime rate. Too often we go through the city and we can see that these single family homes are being uh, raised and com re uh, replaced with the talls and skinnies. That would be a, a crime for that to happen in a community like ours. Uh, it sort of seems that I'm in support of the contextual overlay in which I am, but I agree with the council person that we do need more time because as it's laid and drawn now, it only includes part of the Enchanted Hill community. Uh, our neighborhood was uh, omitted for some reason or another. So uh, I'm asking for more time that uh, we can plan and look and understand the consequences of an overlay to where we can continue to build generational wealth for our children. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Hello. That's my husband of 40 years. I'm Lavanya Waters. I live at 4340 Shady Dale Road. Mr. Marshall did the loan on our home that we built 23 years ago when that was just fields over there. It bumps up into Enchanted Hills. We raised our two children there. I'm a registered nurse. Our daughter's a registered nurse. Our son is a businessman here in Nashville. We have three generations. We have five grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. All of them, we've had all of them in the Enchanted Hills there. We've built churches there. Miss Ruby is a member of one of our churches that was built there. Uh, we're just single family people, nurses, professional people, just teachers, janitors. We love each other. We're neighbors. We don't want our community to be destroyed. We agree with Jonathan, whose father is our age. I'm 65. My husband's 68. We knew Bill Hall. Our son played with Jonathan when he was young. And we, we love everybody in our community. We love Nashville. We don't mind it growing. My 90 year old mother still lives in East Nashville in the home where I grew up and graduated from East High School. So I'm asking you, Jonathan, we're not against you. Ma'am, you just have to address the chair. I'm sorry okay. to interrupt. We're not against anybody. We just want to be, have everybody in Enchanted Hills included. Our home is 3,500 square feet. And my time is up. But we just want to be included in the overlay. We Thank agree you. with the overlay. We want the overlay. Thank but, you, ma'am. But we want to be included. Welcome. Hello. 
This is, uh, my name is Ruby Baker, and I live at 3222 Leewood Drive, which is in District 1. I am here tonight because I've gotten several phone calls from my family and friends and neighbors that live in Enchanted Hills, Royal Crest. Actually, these two overlays actually comes up against four neighborhoods. But the boundaries look like it only picked maybe one street in a whole neighborhood. My neighbors that are here tonight did not know they were not in the boundaries for this contextual overlay in Enchanted Hills until I, until I talked to them tonight. They were here to speak in support of it but did not know that they were not in the boundaries. So we are asking for a deferral. It's a really strange time because we are in the middle of a council race. This is not a political ask. This is because we are concerned about our neighborhood. We have had, I don't even see a number because we've not had community meetings in over a year and a half. The task is very daunting for us to try to stay ahead of any legislation, even though this is a good one, half the people knew nothing about it. So I'm not pointing at anyone or any reason why. We can talk all day long about why, but we are tired of trying to chase and get ahead of a uh, legislation that's going to impact our homes and our neighborhoods. So we are asking for a deferral so we can come together and talk about this with our neighbors. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Bond. I live at 4268 Kings Lane in Nashville. I'm here tonight on behalf of myself, my wife. Hope she's not looking. This is ice cream, man. Uh, anyway, most of you all uh, probably don't know. Uh, I have a son that was uh, mental mental illness. Killed my brother. Came home to kill me and my wife. Okay. Now, uh, my councilman. And I'm not here to bash. This is not a meeting. When I come in the building, this is not a meeting. We haven't had a meeting in years. You all remember me from years back. I guess this was probably going on about four, five, five years by now. With the year and a half, I think Councilman Hall had. We have not had now one anything. So on behalf of my family, and my neighbors who prayed for me. I'm here today because my neighbors praying for me. I mean, my son, we fought, we scored, we fought. I got 18 stab wounds in my body, all over my body right now because my neighbors prayed for me. I'm here for my neighbors. And I ask that you all would put this on the furrow. Put it on the furrow. We're going to, look, we, I had one of my sons locked up because crying. He come home on the great hell. Send him downtown where he can be safe. Out here in King's Lane, where we live, this is our, this is our bare mean. We could have went anywhere in Nashville to build a home. Bardo Hills, uh, King's Lane, Bardo. This is our bare mean, folks. Give us a little more time to elect someone in this uh, new election coming up that will work with us. This is not a, a carbon copy of what turned to... Uh, uh, Ms. Toon, this is not a carbon copy. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. Welcome. Welcome. How you doing? My name is Dwayne Bell. I live at 4500 Queens Lane in the Enchanted Hills area. Um, I look at this contextual overlay, and um, I'm not opposed of it. I'm not, I'm not uh, in favor of it either. I can say that this is not a one-fit-all thing for a community. I look at this overlay, and if you read it, about the setbacks, the heights, the coverage, uh, excess, you're talking about uh, illimited people that have 
that uh, now I'm a realtor. I'm a builder too as well. But also I live in the community and I love the community where I live and I love the neighbors. Uh, this contextual overlay, I think, uh, limit people from having that opportunity to do what they want, what they want to do with their properties. Uh, you got in here, the contextual overlay says that I uh, can't be taller than one point five stories. Uh, I mean, there's so many houses in the community that's, that's over one point five stories. There's uh, houses in the community over three thousand square feet. So how can you put this contextual overlay to say that it's there? I, I mean, inform me about that. I, I need to know. How did this can fit the neighborhood that we're talking about? Uh, I think that that need to be some things done. Yes, I'm not opposed of that, but I think it needs to be tweaked some. It need to be talked about. We haven't had a meeting to talk about it. So when you put something in place for the community, for the people, a lot of people here couldn't stay because it took so long tonight. This is not time to talk about it. This is not time to debate it. But you need to give us time that we can meet with our person and talk, a council person, and talk about it. I, I feel that this needs to be deferred and looked at uh, at some later date because this has affected. This would affect over 400 different households in our community, and that's a lot. I don't know if you guys consider it or not, but it's a lot. Thank you for your time. I know my time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Saying none. Councilman rebuttal. Thank you. Um, so there's no opposition. It's a conversation about confusion, about not being notified for a meeting. There have been two specifically for this, one as recent as last night. There are two scheduled for next week before a public hearing. Some people may not have gotten notified, but the two that we had were well attended. Not one person is in opposition to the actual overlay. It's literally, we want more of us included in it. I didn't create the map. Planning staff provided that to us when we had the conversations about it. So between now and July 6, when this goes before council for a public hearing, there's more than enough time. We've already scheduled for some folks who want to see if they could be cut out of the overlay. But two candidates for council and three developers oppose. No one else does. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And I think Commissioner Johnson, you haven't gone first. Yet, starting us off. Okay, Commissioner. Sure. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I appreciate uh, everybody uh, staying late and speak, and it's always nice to hear from the community. Uh, so I, I want to ask uh, Lisa some question. So seems like, you know, this uh, lots of neighbor uh, came to, uh, you know, uh, spoke tonight is north of Kings Lane. So if those neighbor in the later date want to have a conversation of their own cons conservation overlay uh, at you know, one point, would they be able to uh, create those uh, conservation overlay? Con contextual? Uh, contextual, yes. Yes, yes of, co yes, of course. Um, At this point, properties can't be added to this application, but um, there's nothing that would stop a new application. Um, typically, what we would look for um, in areas where we would support one is uh, generally that it's a neighborhood maintenance policy, um, that there is a consistent lot pattern, that there is a consistent building type, consistent setbacks. So we want an area where you where you sort of drive through and, and there's a lot of consistency. Um, and so, but yes, of course, there could be an application to apply it in a different area. That's great. And so this one is, uh, when will it be scheduled for the council public hearing? Sure. So with um, council member initiated rezonings, um, typically what we do and what the zoning code actually tells us to do is that we need to try to, um, uh, coordinate the planning commission meeting and the council public hearing so that we can utilize one set of notices and one set of signs for both of those meetings. And so um, whenever we get an application um, for, because um, Metro is responsible for those signs and notices on those applications. And so when we get an application, we look at it and um, organize 
the hearings so that they're close together so that the notice can be done for the same um, or the notice can be done for both at the same time. Um, so this item has had a bill introduced already. And so the council public hearing is scheduled for um, July 6th, um, which is a Thursday, which is an unusual day for council, but there's a conflict with the July 4th meeting. So it would be on July 6th. Thank you. So between now and July 6th, uh, council member will have a uh, plenty of time to conduct uh, another community meeting and as well as uh, some people uh, will have opportunity to come to council and express uh, their opinion as well. That's great to know. So I think hearing from the public, uh, you know, we as a Nashville Next, we have a policy of growth and preservation. So I am uh, worried if we uh, delay uh, the wonderful contextual overlay proposal, which neighbors are so proud to keep their history and neighborhood character and you know preserve existing neighborhood. So I am in support of moving forward of this portion of the contextual overlay and then encourage a council member about coming to uh, you know next term to continue conversation with neighborhood and expand where opportunity is. So for that reason, uh, I am uh, in favor of uh, supporting staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? Oh, Councilman, and then we'll get to uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, this, this might be a technical question, perhaps uh, for staff or for legal counsel. How does uh, pending legislation doctrine work uh, relative to this particular public hearing? In other words, does the decision at this hearing mean that it's become pending legislation? I think Lisa can answer that question. There, there actually was recent state legislation which um, rejects the pending legislation doctrine. And so um, we are no longer applying um, and for those that don't know what the pending legislation doctrine yeah. is, it's that um, it essentially says that when you are moving through a rezoning, um, at certain points, typically after it's been introduced and after the planning commission has made a recommendation, you then would not want any permits to be issued that are repugnant to that legislation or those standards. However, the state passed a law that basically said that they reject the notion of pending legislation. And so it's no longer something that is applicable. So it would not apply in this case. Um, so if anyone applied for a permit from now until if it passes at third reading and becomes effective, they would be under the current standards of the code. The contextual overlay would not apply. And to further uh, on that, so uh, I know sometimes it can take a while to obtain a building permit. So is that that they would file a building permit or would they have to have obtained the building permit uh, prior to passage on third reading? I believe that the state law says that property owners are held to the standards that are in place at the time that they apply for a building permit. And and our legal counsel might correct me on that if I'm wrong, but I believe that that's what the new state law indicated. I believe that's correct until the new, in this instance, like contextual overlay was actually became law, the prior standards would be applicable. I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull up the exact, um, the, the statute, but I, I don't have it quite yet, but yeah. yes, but I- Well, well thank you for that, that yeah. that's helpful. I mean, m most things we have heard from communities is that they generally support it. Um, obviously at the council level, it's possible to, um, one of the quirks of contextual overlay is that you can't just remove a parcel, you have to remove an entire block face. Uh, and sometimes that's been done. Um, so those con conversations could continue, but it does meet, policy, which is, as Com Commissioner Johnston stated, is primarily our preview. It does meet policy. It does seem to match overall community goals. And so I, I think it would be good to have uh, a recommendation from this body about it, whether or not the bill passes this term. Um, if another council member came in, at least it would save that step from having to start completely over, um, at least for the for these boundaries. So anything else from council? I just wanted to say I just I found the uh, legislation and uh, it reads that a property owner should expect that the merits of a permit application will be judged in the law in effect at the time of application. Of application. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That, that's very helpful. 
Thank you, Councilman. And then first we had Commissioner Marshall, and then we'll get yeah, to Chair. <clears throat> so I'm going to look for some direction from the Commission. I think I'm hearing two separate things, and I am very aware of the two separate things um, from a fiduciary standpoint and from uh, the recommendation, you know, from the staff, you know, we would approve it. But I think what the community is saying is that the steps to get us to this point hadn't happened, you know. And so I don't know if that's our position that we can decide to defer it at this particular point to give that process time to happen because it is the reality, you know, to that community. It hadn't happened. And so I need direction on it because if I was going by my own feelings about it, I would be deferring it for further, you know, information. Thank you, Commissioner. That's a good question. So the question I think related to that is, um, and we can ask Lisa, if, if we did defer it one meeting or two meetings, could the current council pass something or is it too late at this point? If you could give us a timeline. Be good. Sure. So there are um, a couple of things, and I'm just um, thinking through the council rules. So um, the legislation for this was filed at the first meeting in June, um, which was June 6th. Um, what the council rules say is that any time that legislation is filed, it is then referred to the Planning Commission for the Planning Commission to make a recommendation. The um, council rules then say that um, an item cannot have a public hearing until it has a recommendation from the Planning Commission or 30 days have passed since which time it's been referred to us. Um, because of the holiday, the public hearing for the council actually is 30 days after it's been referred. And so if you all choose not to act now, there is the possibility that this item could go through public hearing and third reading before you have another meeting. And so um, you would need to, um, if you want to make a recommendation um, and have it considered by council, you would need to do so tonight. Thank you. And commissioner, as commissioners, we take all of the facts and then you vote your conscience. Okay. All right. Commissioner. Henley. One of the things that I think is going into my consideration um, is there is that you know currently there is an ample amount of, um, of of properties that are included in this. Is there a minimum threshold before you can do an overlay? And the reason I ask is because it seems like those that we heard come in opposition were saying, "Hey, we're not included here." So is there a potential that they may risk an opportunity if there's not a quote unquote critical mass reached again? So there are some overlays. The Dadu overlay has a minimum number of lots that have to be included, which I think is 30. Um, but for the contextual overlay, there is not a number of lots, but it is a geographic um, consideration in that you have to include all of the residentially zoned properties on a complete block face. Um, but there is not a actual number. You'll actually see a contextual overlay, I think, on the next agenda that is like one block. Um, so you, it, it, there is not a minimum. All right, Commissioner Clifton. I don't have a comment about the, the merits of this. Uh, I could see both arguments. Um, but just as a matter of full disclosure to, for what the process is, uh, and not taking sides, but my friend and former chair of this commission, Jim Lawson, reminded me at an early meeting uh, when I came back on a few months ago that there is for at least general rezonings, there, there is not an actual requirement for there to be a community meeting in the community. That may or may not be a pro, the, the best way to do it, but um, it's not a legal requirement. So I just thought of, as a matter of people's knowing that, it might be worth knowing that. that. That's all I wanted to say. I'm still thinking about the merits of this whole thing. Um, clearly, it's, it's unusual. People do seem to like the idea of it. They just want to have a full community meeting in their community. I, I see that too. But um, I'm just still thinking about this one. It's very puzzling. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other discussion? Commissioner I Tibbs. I only, only want to be repetitive just because of the concern. It's, I kind of uh, echo Commissioner Marshall. 
Um, okay, yeah, Commissioner Marshall. <laughs> um, I do agree with it. I think I think the uh, uh, community generally agrees with it, but it is a big swath of people not to have an opportunity to kind of hear everything about it and to know the the parameters of it and how it affects them, even though it seems like generally speaking. So I, I you know, like my fellow commissioners, I, it, it seems like it's the right thing to do and moving it forward. But, um, you know, like you said, we, they don't necessarily have to have one, but it, it seems like it would have helped, but it probably a little bit easier for everybody to understand if it would have gone through there. But I just wanted to make that comment because I, for this many people to be affected, it seems like a community meeting would have been worthwhile for it. So, commissioners, just to be clear, if we defer, then we will go past 30 days and we will not. We, it won't have a positive or negative recommendation is what Lisa is telling us. And I just want to be crystal clear that if we defer it, then we're now. So just whoever makes a motion, just note that we will not either recommend it positively or negatively. So if we defer it, right, Lisa? That, that's correct. Um, the you only have one meeting in July and that meeting is not until July 27th. Uh, if the public hearing is held on the 6th, then third reading of the bill could be in advance of you of your next meeting. Um, and if you have not made a recommendation, then it would be treated for a vote vote count perspective as an approval. And Commissioner, it's just a reminder, uh, Commissioner Marshall, we and then I'll, I'll call on you. Um, we we do one meeting uh, in July because we because of all the vacation during most folks are with family or and so we have a really hard time making <laughs> quorum uh, around the July fourth, early July. Uh, so Commissioner Marshall, well, I just want to make sure I'm clear. So if we deferred, it goes to the council. The council could also disapprove it correct yes you all make a recommendation so you are a recommending body to the council and so you all make a recommendation um, the charter language essentially says that um, if there if you all rec make a recommendation of disapproval it changes the vote threshold to overcome um, your recommendation at the council so in other words typically a zoning bill um, would require 21 votes of the council. Um, if you all recommend disapproval, then it requires a vote threshold of 27. Um, but regardless of whether you all approve or disapprove, the council makes the final determination on all zoning matters because it is a legislative action. So you're a recommending body to them. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Lisa. So hearing from the public because uh, council member hall said no one's opposing this contextual overlay rather wanted to be included because uh, the people community all right, all right. <laughs> Hold on. now there are some that oppose it we get we get that commissioner johnson just okay note taken so pro probably some um, familiarity because they wanted to learn more what the contextual overlay is about I think what I'm hearing as a sentiment is uh, people likes the community uh, they don't want a tall and skinny coming to next to uh, their uh, community but if we are not moving or recommending uh, anybody can come and tear down and then uh, build twice, you know, bigger house or twice higher house. But with this contextual overlay, uh, anybody, if it passes, uh, it will be appropriate for that community. It will be bigger, they can still enlarge it, they can still go taller, but not a tower two, three times higher than existing housing. So for that protecting neighborhood character and neighborhood history, I think uh, right policy recommendation will be to recommend contextual overlay. And if it will go to council, and uh, it will have community to uh, express 
if community reject, no, that's not what we want. We want uh, our freedom, our change, however we feel want to change it. Uh, they may express that. And then council decide, no, this is not an area uh, we as a council body uh, don't agree with uh, preserving. Then council may vote down. So I think as a policy point, I uh, urge our commissioner to recommend because as I said, again, you know, preservation and growth is our bodies, you know, our purview. So I think, you know, we do have lots of uh, uh, development and, you know, idea. I think it's right to have, you know, uh, development where appropriate corridor. But I think it's right for us to intentionally preserve existing character. So for that reason, I would like to recommend uh, approval. If anybody else uh, have no commission, uh, additional comment, I would like to give it a try to uh, make a motion to approve uh, item 37 uh, as staff recommended. That's proper motion. Motion to approve any, is there a second? Second, any other discussion? I'd Saying, like to make oh, one more comment about it uh, before we vote. Yeah, um, you can, we're still in discussion, Commissioner Marshall. I would prefer the commission take the position to reject it and let the council have the responsibility of meeting that higher threshold. I would rather see the re recommendation come from here because the reality is that there are other things going on about this decision. It's not just this proposal. And so I think we should listen to the community. I think we should in certain, in certain circumstances. Now, again, I'm new and I may be wrong, but I'm here to give you my opinion. And my opinion is that we should respect the fact that there is a reality going on in District 1 and the people you just heard it from. And so I would make a motion, you know, to... Commissioner, well, hold on. So procedurally, there's yeah. been a motion made and a second. Right. And so um, another motion is probably not appropriate. Now, there are some motions that would take precedence, like a adjournment motion, but it's, we still have more business. I got you. No, 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 pro <laughs> so no problem. I'm just saying there are some other motions. I understand. But the proper thing would be to vote no on, on for the motion to approve. If we... If as a body we don't get enough affirmative votes, then somebody else will have to make a motion to disapprove, and you can do that after we see what the vote is. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, so procedurally, there's been a motion made by Commissioner Johnson. We had a second by Commissioner Henley. We are still in discussion. Any other discussion? Seeing no other discussion, all in favor say aye. Let's raise our hands just in case. Raise your hands. All those in favor, raise your hand. Three, all opposed, no. Four no's. Um, it's so, wait, wait, wait. It, now, now remember, we had this discussion. We don't clap. We don't, we're still deliberating. And so the motion fails. We are still on this particular item because we have to have a motion to either approve or disapprove. So, Commissioner. It's your turn to make a motion to disapprove. But turn the microphone on. Yep. You're and used to that. Yes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I would like to make a motion that we disapprove this particular um, bill at this point. And that's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Second. Any discussion? Commissioner Tibbs. Well, only I... Uh, well, okay, that's fine. I was thinking about more the deferral, but um, that's... That's, the, I know that's what the commission, they talk about, but okay, no, no issue there. Thank you. Any other discussion? Is there a second? Second by Commissioner Tibbs. So any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval, say aye. I will raise our hands. Four, all opposed? Three. So a motion is disapproved. All right, so we are now on to... Four to three. And so now we are on to 38. Is there a second?
I'm, I'm presenting this one on behalf of Oscar Orozco from our office who couldn't be here. Um, this Thank evening. you, Donald. Uh, Donald's busy. <laughs> so this is, again, a request to um, apply a contextual overlay district south of Kings Lane, west of Meadow Road. Um, these properties are currently zoned RS-15, and this is just under 100 acres. I'm going to spare you the rest of the presentation because you've heard the same thing three times in a row. Uh, staff recommends approval. Thank you, and so we'll open this item for public hearing, and Councilman Hall, you recognize. So we don't do redundancy. Um, like I said, this is exactly as the previous. Um, the one caveat with this one is a little different because there were multiple attempts to do rezones within this area, and because neighborhood maintenance and involving bumped up against each other, we learned from Planning Commission that you could not do certain things in that circumstance. And so the properties that backed up to the corridor were able to do some things that the properties on the opposite side of the road and further in, in the same subdivision, weren't able to be done. Um, in turn, this came about, or the conversation around this came out of that. Um, the conversation started and a recommendation, recommendation was made that we take a look at doing these. And so almost again, identical to the previous, um, with the caveat of neighborhood maintenance, just like the other, you don't want to do multifamily. You don't want tall and skinnies. We don't want those same things further in. We're leaving those things to the corridor. And so this is identical to the previous in that one way. Um, and those two, 37, 30, actually are joining or bumped up neighborhoods near each other. So thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Appreciate it. Anyone wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. But hold on, sir. Let's get your, hold on. Um, we'll get you. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of buttons on there. We apologize. There we go. All right, go ahead. Yeah, state your name and address again. I'm Dwayne Bell, living 4500 Queens Lane. Um, been there over 40 years. Um, this is the same as the one before, as Councilman Hall said before, pretty close 37, 38 running together. Uh, one thing about it is that this contextual overlay for, that, for this particular area still don't apply because um, I, I need somebody to ask, to, 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 to ask me a question about the contextual overlay. Uh, one and a half stories, a lot of houses are more than one and a half stories, they two story homes. Some are more square footage. Uh, the contextual overlay, particular, I heard the lady, the uh, commission mentioned about the tall and skinny. Yeah, tall and skinny probably won't be in our neighborhood just because of the neighborhood, neighborhood that it is. But also, we don't need some, um, we want to control in what people are going to do in the neighborhood. Uh, because the houses are there are twice the square footage on this contextual overlay. It's a nice neighborhood. It will always be a nice neighborhood because the neighbors will band together to make sure it's going to be okay. And and with all zoning in that neighborhood is RS zoning, RS 15 or RS, you know, larger than what is residential single family. So it will be a single family neighborhood. But I think that there would be, uh, there's a lot of things going on in District 1 in our area. Um, and, and and it's a beautiful area. So I think that sometime, sometime more oversight it's bad for the area that that, that um, don't give us the opportunity to grow. We want to grow in a way that would be conducive, but also keep our values up. This contextual overlay will hurt the value, stifle the value of the neighborhood by all means. So that's all I got to say about that. Thank you. Joy Kimbrough, 3901 Drake's Branch Road. Uh, again, and I want to make it clear, I'm not saying I'm, I'm opposed because I want it to be more inclusive. I'm saying I'm opposed because we as a community are ignorant to so many things. And I don't mean ignorant, ignorant. I mean, we don't have the knowledge because we haven't had the meetings, so we can't discuss this intelligently. I love this area. I was born in this area. My parents passed away in this area, each in the house. So, I mean, this community means so much to me. and. Uh, I do want to do what's in the best interest of the community, but at this time, I believe what's best interest in the best interest of the community is 
a meeting. Uh, as a community, Bordeaux has been shortchanged so much. And we're not asking for the world here. We're just asking for the basics like, may we have a meeting? May we have a meeting? May we discuss it? Can we ask questions? So we may be able to come in here and say, this is why this does not work. Our meeting shouldn't be here in front of you all and one-sided. We should be able to really discuss this as a community. And so for the same reasons, I'm also asking again that you defer uh, approving uh, number 38. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Chris Schode. I live at 1824 Tammany Drive. And the property of interest here is zero Cedar Circle. Like we're all saying, there's been no community meeting. We should all be coming up with a compromise. People should not be lining up like this. And a lot of people have already left because people have to get their children to bed. This is not fair. We should have a community meeting. Number two, our property is 3.9 acres, okay? We got quarter acres and third of acres through here. We're looking at 3.9 acres here and the property across the streets, they're not included. And additionally, we have a 56 foot drop across our property. So when we're sitting here going, we can only go this high and we're already dealing with a 56 foot drop of elevation, this, ele this overlay really hurts us. The planning departments, we have letters from the planning department that said they would support density if we would go with the corridor of Kings Lane and especially Clarksville Highway. We've been in conversations to add this to other parcels to give some density to Clarksville Highway because it's a brand new five lane going down through there. And then lastly, and I would encourage y'all tomorrow morning to get up in Google, okay? Or look at the planning website and see how hard it is to find the terms of this overlay. You can't find it, okay? You pull up the application, the term should be behind the application. We can't find it. There is nothing that says this will be the terms of this overlay. It's not out there. I cannot find it. Now I've searched for like two hours. So please turn this down today. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Deborah Edwards. I'm a licensed real estate agent for 37 years in, this, in Nashville. And I own property, have property um, zero uh, Cedar Circle as well. And my opposition to this, I oppose it because as I try to put more people into homes, the opportunity for home development is very limited in that area. My son uh, lives on Clarksville Highway, which he bought that property last year. And my other son lives near TSU. So I'm real big at home ownership, especially for the younger generation. It's, it's, this is a whole different situation than it was 25 and 30 years ago. And so now to find affordable homes, you can't have an acre lot. You have an acre lot that's going to be a million dollar home. And, and no one, no teacher, no fireman, no post office worker can afford that. So density is needed in order to provide home ownership in Nashville that is somewhat affordable. And the only way we can do it, and that was the reason why this, pro this property was purchased, to create that opportunity. So I oppose it because it limits that opportunity of home ownership for our teachers, for the working force. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Again, my name is Ruby Baker. I do live at 3222 Leewood Drive in Nashville, Tennessee in Bordeaux Hills. And yes, I've been the president of my neighborhood association for more than 15 years. So I'm used to trying to listen to the community and voice their concerns. There are several neighbors that I have that live in the Royal Crest neighborhood and those that live right off of the other side of Drake's Branch Road. Some of them were not included because they didn't get notification or whatever the reason was. So if we're trying to protect a neighborhood, let's protect the whole neighborhood, not pick and choose where our friends live and pick that street. So that's a concern that we have. So we're not accusing anyone, but it looks like some of the borders were picked from where you live, 
but not the, the houses next door. So all of this is messed up. This is embarrassing for us to have to stand here and talk about our dirty laundry. We should have community meetings, and this has nothing to do with a political speech. It has everything to do with what we as homeowners have a right to vet. No, there's no requirement, and since since people were made aware that they're not required to have a meeting, it's been a year and a half since they were notified that you're not required. So it's all a matter of courtesy and giving us an opportunity to vet. I spent numerous hours on the phone explaining contextual overlay is a form of protection that we want and that we need but give them an opportunity to vet it. They just very well may overall support it, but when you deprive them of the opportunity to vet it, you're wrong. Thank you. Thank you. Take my head off this time. Once again, thank you all for your tireless work that you do here uh, for uh, Nashville as a whole without uh, acting for a dime. My name is Joseph Bond. I live at 4268 Kingsland. And um, we have a beautiful home there. It's like maybe 7,000 square feet. Our neighborhood is growing. We have white folk walking the neighborhood now, walking through the neighborhood, Chinese, uh, Hispanics. Our neighborhood is growing. Give us an opportunity to help us with our neighbors to keep continue to grow. Overlay simply is like this right here. You go down Woodmont Boulevard, you tear down a bare meat house right there, you put four on the lot. Now, I mean, that's, that's overlay. So give us time to get another person in office, and we're taking, uh, we're not going to take a more time. Call me if you need a fish fry. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Well. Good afternoon, council members. Good, good, good evening. It's nighttime. Um, item 37 on tonight's agenda, and item 38, a mirror images of each other just across Kings Lane and back into the neighborhood. Uh, people have already, you've already made a decision based on the need for a community meeting on 37. We ask, I ask that you simply do the same thing for 38. Council person uh, has indicated to me that he will definitely uh, have a meeting going forward. So if you would do us the courtesy of just uh, doing the administrative uh, stamps that you should do, we would thank you. Thank you, sir. And will you state your name and address for the record? I'm sorry. Uh, we need Willie to Myers, uh, 3906 Brush Hill Road. And the property of interest for me is, is uh, 4106 Clarksville Highway. 4160 Clarksville Highway. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, rebuttal, Councilman. Well, I'll be quick. I know you guys, again, three in a row, and they're all almost identical. Um, meets policy, meets national next, meets community character manual. Two meetings specifically, one very well attended last night, one scheduled for next week before a public hearing. There are a lot of folks that weren't notified or didn't get the notice because they're outside of, well outside of that purview or out of those areas. Again, this is another one where people want it. They've been asking for it for years. The opposition is in the name of density, where the majority, anyone that's been a part of this commission or council knows, is a no-no word in that community, in District 1, overwhelmingly, right? We have density going in, though. There are 1,200 new units, apartments, going in on that new five-lane corridor over the next 18 months. Just approved another 400 to go in on Clarksville Highway. There are three residential developments of 88 units, 74 units, and 120 units all currently under construction. We're good with density. There, there's stuff for young folks and cottages and townhomes coming in along another major corridor on National City Highway. There are residential homes coming in adjacent to each of these contextual overlays. This is something that has been demanded extensively throughout my lifetime in that community. And planning chooses the boundaries. 
We say this is the area. Planning staff looked at it. Planning staff recommended who would be or would not be included in that and then presented it. Between now and public hearing, several in opposition have already asked to have meetings with planning, not just another community meeting because they want it to be cut out of the overlays. But those are properties that are in maintenance. Those are properties that back up to not the corridor, but neighborhood maintenance not evolving. Those are properties that you can't do multifamily or get any density on anyway. One of the properties that is in question also is part of the King's Lane component that's on the previous contextual overlay, where it and another one had already been denied by the public to do the projects that they're wanting cut out or to be part of, not be part of this overlay. So they've already been told no on the developments that they want to do because they don't meet character manual, they don't meet policy because they are further in and because they are in neighborhood maintenance or on two lane roads with all single family homes and no ingress or egress. There is another project who was supposed to coordinate with some of these others to have the density conversation, but it was rejected by the community and one of the churches in the community didn't want to participate in it because a developer was trying to put 178 units on nine acres on a two lane road. Everyone supports this. The conversation about a meeting, that's an easy fix because somebody's always not getting notified about the meeting. Again, two already specifically on 37 and 38, well attended, another one scheduled for next week before public hearing, and several have already requested meetings with planning staff to see if they could be added, cut out, or what the next one would look like that would or would not include them. So, thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. And Commissioner Tibbs, you want to start us off? Um, it's, I, I guess there was a meeting this time, but uh, I guess I just kind of still feel a little bit the same way. Definitely feel like it's something that's worthwhile. It's probably, uh, but uh, I guess I'm just not sure about the level of um, uh, interaction for something like this large for with the community being involved. But, uh, you know, I don't have an opposition to it, but it's just, a, like I said, this is, you know, for this large and for this effect, so many um, families uh, would feel a little bit more of a, I'd feel a little bit more of a comfort level knowing that they were, you know, definitely meetings that would definitely uh, understand what it is. Because once you understand it, I think it would be a lot easier for more community um, involvement, ownership, and not think that this was just something that was just passed on to them. So, I mean, I'd, I'd be okay with the deferral or or not, but that's, that's still how I feel. All right, any other discussion? I think we discussed the same issues last time. So we need a motion maybe from... Yeah. Oh, oh wait a second, we get, get Councilman? Uh, thank no, you. Come I, back to you. I Commissioner. wanted to make one point um, of information and then also have a question. So uh, and a statement was made that folks cannot find the um, requirements of the contextual overlay. And I know not everyone has internet access, so I'm going to recognize that. Um, I will respectfully point out that my friend, Mr. Schott, who's been a friend of mine for years, lives in the East Nashville community. Um, we've got numerous contextual overlays in the neighborhood in which he lives. So I think Mr. Schott is personally familiar with what the requirements are. In terms of the statement that if you go online and you can't find it, there used to be a route that I used to have memorized to find things on our Metro website, which was shortened all of that. But literally you Google Nashville contextual overlay, brings you to Nashville.gov contextual overlays. There are the design standards. So it is available online. And I, I do totally understand that not everyone has internet access, but we also do postcard notice mailings and the postcard notice mailings will get you to an email or a phone number of a staff member who can certainly look at that generally and get that information to you. And some of our staff members will even assist you in looking at that for your specific house. 
So information is available. I, I really want to say that's not a defense necessarily. I don't want to get into the weeds of the public meeting process, but I really want to be speaking in defense of our planning department staff in particular and of the information that we provide online. It is available. So I Thank want, you. wanted to make that statement. Uh, that's A, but B, uh, at least for the last uh, case that we heard, one of the things that maybe, I mean, I think that most of us on the commission feel like this does meet policy. And so in having a disapproval, at least of the previous one, um, I guess a question for staff is, let's say that this is revived. Let's say that there is another council member, the council member, next council member wants to come back and say, um, I have talked to these neighbors more and, and they do want it, then we're going to have a record that's pulled up and it's going to say it was disapproved. And so I, I'm wanting maybe in that case, especially before we cast a vote on this one, to say, what is the public record going to show as the reason it was disapproved? Is it going to, would it include notes? That, would it just say that the commission felt it didn't meet policy? Or would it be that the commission felt that something else was part of the discussion that led to it being disapproved rather than deferred? I'm happy to take this one. Um, the staff do pay close attention to what the commission recommends and does not recommend. And in some instances where we've gotten strong guidance from the commission, there was a case in Midtown recently where you had previously disapproved it and therefore we recommended disapproval when it came back up several meetings ago. But Lisa and her team, as do I, look really carefully at the public record as well as your comments. I think in this case, I can comfortably say if it comes back to the commission in the next term, we would likely continue to recommend approval because the folks who have voted against this case have not said that it's because of policy. They've, I think I've heard just to summarize, process concerns, concerns about educating the community and the commission does has exercised some discretion in that in that space periodically when there is a sense that folks aren't clear enough about what's before them. And we're just at the end of the term. Mm -hmm. So deferral is not as available to us as it would be a month ago. So I'm happy to put on the record here that my interpretation of this discussion is that this commission generally very strongly favors um, overlays so long as we have policy in place that's maintenance. And we would look at that very carefully to reassure you we wouldn't take this as precedent. Lisa, great, thanks. And Councilman, it's a, it just goes as a disapproval. I mean, the council can still pass it. If we were the final judge on it, I, I would say we needed to take a second look. But your your comments are taken. Yeah, and, and I think one final on this one, I do, I, I am sympathetic to this case that there is one particular parcel at the end that is quite a bit different than the rest of the block phase pattern. I know that the, the enabling ordinance that we passed in 2014 stated that entire block phases must be included. There is a provision in the ordinance that someone can go to the Board of Zoning Appeals if you have a, a lot hardship, which it sounds like that lot does, um, at least in terms of topography. I guess I'm wondering for, for that particular parcel that was discussed that's at the end, um, whatever decision is made tonight, but uh, for future discussion, I, I would hate to remove, let's say, the entirety of the rest of that street because of one parcel being so different. Are there some potential remedies that could be offered for that one lot, perhaps to the Board of Zoning Appeals or something else, just given how different that lot appears to be from the rest of the lots on the block face? We would have to look at it, but um, that was something that we actually did look at when the application came in. Um, if if there was a decision that that parcel should not be included, it would have to remove that entire side of the street mm -hmm. because the ordinance is written in such a way that um, it tells us how it can be applied um, and it has to include um, an entire block face. Okay, thank you. You're not next yet, Commissioner Johnson, but after Commissioner Marshall, Commissioner Johnson after that. Commissioner Marshall. Yes. <clears throat> Just for clarification, uh, Commissioner Tibbs, um, the reason I said not deferring because of what she explained to me that, you know, it was not going to be time. So therefore, I wanted to establish the higher criteria that the council has to meet, you know, because they can overrule us anyway. But... You know, I just, again, feel like that with us 
especially me, knowing the situation with District 1, it's just a fair thing to do. And I'm sorry that it's tying up another piece of property, but I just think this is the fair thing to do. It's the right thing to do. And I would, again, lean toward us not approving this particular bill uh, as we did the previous one. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I am a big proponent of community meeting. I, my previous life, I had a community meeting. I never brought any bill, at least the community understand and uh, agree upon it. And even move forward, I put a break on it to move forward until entire neighborhood is supportive of it and develop uh, agree upon uh, condition uh, brought up uh, with community with a certain degree. So I am in a big proponent of the community uh, meeting. And at the same time, I am big proponent of adhering uh, the duty and of the uh, our body. I think our body is recommending and based on the policy. So for that reason, I don't think a uh, staff recommendation is uh, in the wrong side. So it will be very hard for me to disapprove it. However, I do have uh, a concern on of the like a northern part of the block face on the Cedar Lane because of the different uh, character of the uh, lot size as well as uh, adjacent to, uh, immediately adjacent to T3 neighborhood evolving policy. So if entire block face was, uh, have to be removed, I am comfortable removing it uh, instead of uh, supporting it. I just wanna uh, make comment. Thank you. Any other discussion? We need a motion from someone. Commissioner Marshall, do you wanna make a motion? Yes, I would like to make a motion that we disapprove this particular bill. That's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. All in, any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of disapproval, raise your hand. Four, all opposed. Four, three, it's disapproved. We are on. Item 39, which let's, uh, as the others, this was tentatively on the consent. Is there anyone in the room opposed to item number 39? Okay. Item 39 will be heard. Amelia. Hi, everyone. Donald decided to stop hogging the mic. My name is Amelia Lewis, and I will be presenting item number 39 tonight, which is a request for a neighborhood landmark overlay. The request is to apply a neighborhood landmark overlay district. Staff recommendation is to approve with conditions and disapprove without all conditions. Um, the site is located along 44th Avenue North. Um, it's kind of tiny, so I put a circle around it. Um, it's not a circular shaped parcel. Um, south of Park Avenue, um, Alley 1198 abuts the northern property line of the parcel. And the site consists of one parcel, approximately 1,700 square feet in size um, with an existing single story structure located on the site. The property is also located within the Park Elkins Neighborhood Conservation Overlay District and currently zoned RS 7.5. Um, the overlay of course would not change the base zoning on the property, but rather uh, sit um, as a supplement to the zoning. Um, so what is a neighborhood landmark district? Um, the purpose and intent of a neighborhood landmark district is to preserve and protect features um, that are important to maintain and enhance neighborhood character by allowing for adaptive reuse of the feature. Uh, the role of the Planning Commission in a neighborhood landmark um, is to make a recommendation to the Metro Council. 
Um, so here is the uh, site and the existing structure on the site. Um, it does take up a majority um, of the parcel itself. Um, according to Metro Historic, uh, the structure was constructed in 1931 for the John E. Lawrence and Sons Grocery and operated um, as a grocery store until at least 1950. Uh, the proposal includes an interior renovation of the existing 1,400 square foot structure on the property. Uh, the uses proposed on the development plan include our include uses of the base zoning RS 7.5 in addition to restaurant and takeout restaurant. Um, so above you and probably easier to see in the staff report are the provisions of the overlay. Um, essentially what it is permitting is the uh, rehabilitation of the existing structure and conversion of that into a restaurant. Um, no exterior changes or additions are proposed um, with the project. Um, staff finds that the proposed development plan meets um, all the above criteria um, for a neighborhood landmark. Um, the proposal does not include any exterior changes to the structure, um, no expansion of the footprint footprint. Um, the proposed uses are contained to the existing structure and limited um, in uh, just a restaurant, takeout restaurant, and the uses of the base zoning. Um, Metro Historic submitted a letter indicating that the structure contributes to the overhaul, overall neighborhood and staff finds that the existing structure is a critical component of the neighborhood context. The retention of the features necessary to preserve the neighborhood character and the proposed reuse of the building will facilitate its preservation. Without the neighborhood landmark designation, the opportunity to preserve and enhance the existing structure is extremely limited. The proposed use is sensitive to the surrounding properties considering the use will occupy an existing commercial structure and not expand beyond those limitations. The neighborhood landmark um, tool is intended to be applied in unique circumstances and not intended to serve as an impetus for more commercial development in the area. Staff finds that the proposed development plan meets all of the above criteria. Um, staff recommends approval of the overlay and the proposed development plan. Thank you. We'll Thank open you. this item for public hearing. Is the applicant in the room? Come on up. You've got 10 minutes and can save two of the 10 for rebuttal. Good evening, Erica Garrison with Bradley, 712 Bowling Avenue. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for your time. I know it's late, so I'll try to be brief. Um, I want to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. We accept staff's conditions and thank them for their support. And we thank the council member for working with us up, up to this point to get us here today. This application is one I'm really proud to work on because if it's passed today, we will be able to take one step further to hopefully preserving the structure and allowing it to be reused. In its current format, it is zoned for residential. This is a 1,440 square foot structure that was always intended to be commercial. It is not designed for residential and can't really be well retrofitted into residential. Therefore, we have worked very closely with the planning staff and the historic staff to think about what could we do to preserve this building that hasn't been really used in the last six years. We came up with the landmark overlay. I think it's a great fit at this point in time to allow us to preserve the structure as is, but to simply change the use to allow a restaurant use and to also be allowed to add a sign on the front of it. Um, we think that this is consistent with the policy and we would ask for your support. Following me is going to be the owner who's going to talk about the outreach efforts thus far. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Darden Copeland. I am the applicant. I'm usually in the back of the room uh, representing clients, but this is one that uh, I've really felt passionate about. I've been in Nashville for 15 years, my wife and I, um, and I've fallen in love with historic properties. My downtown office is on the National Registry of Historic Places. 
I was fortunate enough to be able to buy the natural sporting goods building across the street. And I really look forward to repurposing them into something that sort of saves the soul of, of those particular buildings. And I think Nashville is paving over a little bit too much. And so it's really become a personal hobby and a, frankly, an expensive hobby um, to get into saving historic properties. Uh, my wife and I, uh, when we bought our place in, on Cambridge Avenue in Cherokee Park, we used to drive by, ride our bikes by, walk by this building all the time. It's been vacant uh, since 2017 um, with various stop work orders and, and just different uh, folks in there. And it really became something that I felt passionate about. I was fortunate enough to be able to talk with the owner and, and worked with them over a number of years, just sort of back and forth before they finally agreed to sell this to me uh, very late last year, uh, December of last year. Um, I thought about, you know, what could go here? And, and I thought about a coffee shop. I thought about restaurant. Uh, and thinking about a coffee shop, it's a very intensive use to have coffee uh, and, and folks, you know, zipping in, zipping out to, to buy their pastries, their breakfast, et cetera. Uh, I thought that was really intensive in, in terms of what that would do to the surrounding neighborhood. Um, so as I went door to door in this community, and I'll, I'll lay out the, the doors and the area and the radius that we covered, in speaking with neighbors there, uh, they really liked the idea of, A, just sort of repurposing this and, and getting it activated to, to sort of clean up this, this particular building and, and the surrounding parking lots. But they really liked the idea of sort of an evening restaurant, something similar to uh, a folk or Lachlan table, city house answer. Um, and that's sort of where this, this idea came from. I'm not going to run the restaurant. I've talked with various chefs and restaurateurs in town. Uh, if we get through this process, I'll have more in-depth conversations with them. But the idea here is sit-down restaurant, uh, evenings only. Uh, there is a church uh, uh, a block away, and they control the parking lots all around me. Uh, I don't think we're going to be open on Sundays. It, they, they're a very busy church, and they, they use those parking lots very well on Sundays. Um, we did, knowing that it's so close to the neighbors, uh, I, I wanted to be sensitive about parking. Um, and so we hired KCI and, and Megan Ziegler is here um, to, to answer any questions should you have them. But we wanted to commission a parking study. Where will people park? And so we looked at it and we said, let's assume that we get zero parking on the church lot. And we've had conversations with the pastor there and, and their real estate agent. Parking doesn't seem like it's going to be an option for us. So we looked at the street parking available to us. A, a copy of that was included in the, the application. I think you should have that in front of you. And we found that there's sufficient parking on the streets to serve the restaurant use. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that we could do it without parking on the church parking lots, but also to make sure that we weren't parking in front of residential homes in this area. And if, if you were to pan out on that, I know you can, maybe can't do that, but if you pan out and the traffic study does a good job of this, it shows the amount of parking that's, that's more than sufficient for uh, our use. I think we would have uh, Pfeffer to Road, local architecture firm, Matt Sutton's here. He drew up sort of what the interior of 1,400 square feet could look like once you get ADA bathrooms and everything else in there, full commercial kitchen and the like. We get right around 40 seats. Uh, Answer, which is a restaurant nearby, they have seating for 120. So we're much smaller than some of the neighboring uh, restaurants and we think we have sufficient parking. Also, this is in the overlay, and, and Metro Council uh, recently took away the parking requirement for this. So our parking requirement by code is zero. But I went ahead and we, we engaged KCI to do the parking study. We wanted to be the good neighbor. We've had two meetings. Uh, we've had um, one community meeting, um, and then we had, I've been able to speak with the Neighborhood Association on two occasions. Uh, I've also canvassed the neighborhood. Um, and Samantha, I might ask you to pass these out. Uh, I was able to canvas the neighborhood in kind of two blocks in every direction here, and I wanted to include a map, and my colleague Samantha is going to pass those out. And I knocked on every single door in the two-block radius, Park, Elkins, 46, 45, 44, 43, and 44th, and I found overwhelming support. I found a lot of folks that were just simply not home or didn't answer, but we are passing out a, a copy of the map and sort of where folks were that were supportive of it. Um, so I, I really took it seriously in terms of the community outreach and, and being a good neighbor. Uh, and I think the immediate neighbors, for the most part, were very supportive. They liked the idea of safety, the aesthetics of it, uh, frankly, you know, being a new use, sidewalk improvements, and, of course, saving the building. Um, you know, I know that you'll, you'll probably hear some, from some folks tonight, and um, I, I know that I still have to earn their trust. I have to earn the trust of the neighborhood. Uh, I know I'm asking for something here, and that is the additional use on this. But I think in exchange, uh, I think it's a net positive for the community. And uh, I hope that you all will send this through to, to the Metro Council. We'll have three readings there and, uh, and more public hearings. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for what you do. And uh, I'll leave the rest of the time for our speakers. Thank you.
All right, we'll reserve, thank you, sir. We'll reserve two minutes uh, for rebuttal. Uh, anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up, welcome. And just state your name and address for the record. Timer's right here, two minutes each. My name is Rob Strebler. I live at 4308 Nevada Avenue, about uh, a block and a half away from the property. Um, my wife and I are both quite supportive. The uh, building, as has already been noted, has been completely unproductive for um, six-ish years now. Um, it's honestly one of the biggest eyesores in the neighborhood. And we think that it's restoration to something like its historic appearance and some, you know, use as a restaurant is a, a plus for this part of the neighborhood. And we hope you support this proposal. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, Philip Sutherland, 4405 Elkins Avenue. So look right out <clears throat> my front door at this one. Um, kind of some of the same things for the years I've been there. It's been kind of an abandoned building. I guess it was stained glass shop before. Um, but <clears throat> looking forward to uh, the potential for something to be in this building. Um, I saw, you know, people have been camped out in it. There's been all kinds of different things going on. So I look forward to activating this property. Thank you. Welcome. My name's David Teague, and I live at 4406 Elkins Avenue. And uh, like my back porch, I walk out and can stare right at that building. And often, for far too many times, I've seen things that I very uncomfortable my five-year-old twins seeing, and I've had just very legitimate concerns around safety. Uh, one of my neighbors that lives on the corner, he and I have texted back and forth on multiple occasions and called the police and reported things just because, you know, I mean, you know, anything is better than an abandoned. I mean, we've been there five years. It's been abandoned the entire time we've lived there. Uh, so I am very supportive of this and uh, uh, excited about something that would preserve a, what, you know, a very, very cool looking, unique building. And I know I think about a lot of the concerns around development and I go, this building is just really, really kind of odd. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about having something, something to be uh, better than an abandoned building. So thanks. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Dennis Daniels. Uh, I'm at 4807 Nevada Avenue a couple of further blocks away from these guys. Um, I'm an architect and historic preservationist at heart. Uh, ended up meeting uh, Darden yesterday. I was riding my bike with my kids, as he mentioned. Uh, and this is a building that I fell in love with many, many years ago and excited to see the new use for it. It's unfortunate that the streetscape is also not there to, to encourage this type of development. I can see everyone in the neighborhood walking to it. So the zero parking count is not being applicable here. Um, there are things, there's some concerns about where trash is going, how those is being picked up, uh, where grease traps might go. But I think those are all things that are solvable uh, with the help of the city. And hopefully we can incentivize maybe some street trees, additional sidewalks on that side of the street as well. Um, so if there's anything that we can do to help that out, that'd be great. So I'm all, all in support. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Uh, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Good evening. My name is Pat Williams. I live at 4301 Elkins Avenue. I see this property out my front door. My house was built in 1897, so I don't have a garage or a driveway. I park on the street, as do many of my neighbors. To think that a 40 seat restaurant in this small property, which literally has no parking spaces of its own, would not cause parking problems for my neighborhood is absurd. Of course it would. And by the way, I speak for a bunch of my neighborhood association people who could not be here tonight. We worked really hard to get our park at Elkins historic conservation overlay through, and this is right in the middle of it. I think this would set a horrible precedent if this zoning is goes through. 
I realize that this is not a change to quote unquote commercial zoning, but it allows for it. So what's the difference? If, this, if the church should decide in the future to sell some of its property, some of the parking area, people that, could, that are buy, buying parcels on it could say, well, they got a, a zoning change, why can't I? So we could have all kinds of commercial things on this er in this area. A ch another church in the neighborhood just a few blocks away, just in the last few years, sold off a bunch of its parking area. And they put houses on all of it. And they didn't even, ha even have a, a conservation overlay. So I realized that they did a parking study. And there is, there is ample street parking. However, a huge part of the parking that's closest to this facility is in front of residences. And the, are they going to have somebody out front saying, don't park here, go up the street and park? I don't think so. Thank you, ma'am. So I beg you, please do not approve this zoning appeal. I think it would set a horrible precedent. Thank you. Thank you for listening and for all you do. Welcome. Hi. Well, thank you. Good evening. My name is Nick Allen. <clears throat> I serve as the campus pastor for Rolling Hills Community Church in Nashville, specifically located at 4300 Park Avenue. Uh, it was formerly Park Avenue Baptist Church. Our first and oldest building on property was constructed in 1909. We've enjoyed more than 100 years as a church in Sylvan Park. It extends on the maps that you saw earlier uh, from Charlotte Avenue all the way to Elkins. It includes 13 specific plots on that parcel, um, including the Finston Playground green space surrounding uh, 320 44th Avenue, the property in question, um, which does from the church have no designated parking space to include. Uh, we currently share uh, a portion of the property with Emanuel Nashville, um, a missions organization, Justice and Mercy International, um, and allow ministry use for Preston Taylor Ministries. For more than 12 years, um, school-age kids in Metro Nashville have been able to use the property for after-school tutoring, um, after-school care, and local services. So our concern is that a restaurant on site, as well as dumpster access, recycling access, and additional traffic... Um, would limit the ability to use that for children and weekend programs. Um, outside of just Sunday morning, the church uses the entire property uh, considerably throughout the week. Um, and so without the ability to limit the amount of access to the parking and restrict it to the streets, we just have concern that any kind of adjacent um, parking request would have to come through the church where we haven't had a chance to um, figure out whether or not that would be something that we can accommodate at this time. So we'd have to recommend that we can't. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing that we'll have the rebuttal and then the council ladies still here. Yep. Council ladies still here. All right. Perfect. I just want to make sure. All right. Rebuttal, two minutes. Sure, I can be quick. Um, I, I think we've heard concerns from the neighborhood. We're happy to continue to work with the neighbors, with the council uh, member helping facilitate that. I think all of those issues are solvable. I think what can't be passed up, what can't be overlooked, is that we have a building that's been unoccupied for six years. It cannot be used as a residential structure. The only way to save it and preserve it. And it was, it was vandalized probably several months ago, it will continue to be vandalized. It will continue to be in disrepair. It will not be a benefit to the neighborhood until it is retrofitted. And we think that this is an appropriate retrofit. We consulted with historic. We consulted with planning. We have the support of h and I Inc. We have the support of Preservation Nashville. We think this is a good thing. It's a good precedent for the community. We think it can actually be a benefit to the community where they can walk to it, where it can work in harmony with this neighborhood and actually complement it. This is what makes Sylvan Park great, having these combined uses in the neighborhood that you can walk to. It will be a benefit. We'll transform it from being an eyesore and being a safety risk to a benefit for the community. And we ask that you approve it. Thank you, Council Lady. Thank you. 
I just thought at the end of the term, I'd stay here super late with y'all because um, I know most of you miss me being on the commission. Um, so this is the property that has come before you before, and I spoke against the neighborhood landmark at that time. Um, at that time, it was uh, it was with the previous owner. He didn't show up to the planning commission, uh, and they had paraded a variety of uses before the neighborhood association. Um, and it was just really um, a situation that didn't feel like there were commitments and efforts to meet the neighborhood needs and um, and what the neighborhood would like to see at this location. So in the past, I did not support that zone change should be a, a pizza place, um, a takeout pizza place that would have had more uh, a more intense use, similar to, to the coffee shop that would be mentioned. The, the constant um, parking coming and going for those uses are, is just a little too intense for this area. Um, the commercial, the traditional commercial node in Sylvan Park, as many of y'all know, is further down at 46 in Murphy, where the new roundabout project, well, I say new, it was, it was about eight years old now. Um, time flies, right? <laughs> um, so so the, the traditional commercial node is further down in Sylvan Park, but this is a property, and there were other properties like this, as most of you also know um, from serving on the Historic Commission, that there were neighborhood groceries and little shops like this throughout Sylvan Park. I don't know enough of the history to say why when Sylvan Park was down zoned to single family um, RS 7.5, which pretty much all of Sylvan Park is why this was left out because it's clearly a commercial building and was a commercial building but had lost its its non-conforming use rights um vegan v is a is a former uh bakery that is literally i guess maybe a block block and a half down from this on 46 that retained its commercial zoning at the time um this one didn't further down on 46 closer to uh, murphy road and the roundabout is where answer restaurant and scouts barbershop currently is and um i think some of y'all were on the commission when that came through um in the prior term to to my first term and that was a commercial use as well but it did flip to being two commercial uses and three homes on that property so seeing a rezone like this is not unusual um, for Sylvan Park. And quite frankly, if you think about our restaurants and businesses that we have in the Sylvan Park roundabout, they are roughly um, this size or maybe double. Think about um, uh, where Neighbors is, where Park Cafe is. Those are residential size buildings that are being used for commercial uses. This is a residential size building, but not a residential building. And so I think that if we, the Metro government, deny allowing um, a use such as a limited commercial restricted use like what the applicant is requesting, then we really are not allowing them a use at all because they would have to go before the Board of Zoning Appeals to be a residence and Again, it's it's so. I mean, the plot, the the property line is so tight to this building that it's just not really feasible as a residence. Um, and then also with the the conservation overlay over it, it's not like this building could be torn down um, because it's. I mean, it's a sturdy building, um, and it needs to it needs to remain in the area. So while I oppose the the re, of the previous request because it wasn't the right request at the right time, I believe that this is um, the applicant has shown a commitment to the neighborhood in terms of parking, in terms of thinking through strategy, and in terms of the application. Um, let me address parking a little bit more. Um, I have offered to the residents and the neighbors when we had the community meeting, we can restrict parking on their streets by doing permit parking or one or two hour parking. That's something that can go through the traffic commission. Um, I think probably at this time, I mean, we could do that before I leave office or start that process, or it can be something that the next council member takes up. Um, on the previous application too, something that I had an issue with is that the church, um, as you'll probably know as well, you know, churches that have residentially zoned uh, parking lots can not rent those parking lots out for for like the restaurant to, to park there, right? So the church can't rent that out. But previously in the previous application, and it, this was documented in this in the in the staff report, and I had it taken out, was that the pizza shop was going to pay the pay in pizza to rent the parking spots. 
pizza is a currency in this situation, right? So that was another issue with that previous application. And, and that's why I appreciate that there was a traffic study done here to show that there are existing spaces in the right of way. And the church is welcome to, you know, restrict the parking on their lots to, to the restaurant or to the neighborhood people. This, of course, will have to go before the, the council for the, the typical public hearing. But if they go for a beer permit, I believe that it will be going, um, they'll have another hearing for that as well, because this is so close to um, other residences and parks and things like that. So at this time, um, because the, the, the majority of the neighbors that are closest to this have not expressed concern, and I really feel like this application is so much better prepared than anything that has come on this property before, I'm supportive at this time and, and have said that, you know, we can, we can continue to talk and put restrictions on it as necessary. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Council Lady. Seeing no one else wishing to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Commissioner Hanley, we're back to you. Thank you start us off. Happy to do so. Um, for one, I definitely commend the efforts. I, I'm a fan of preservation and also boutique projects as I would categorize this one. I'm, I'm curious, and I'm looking at staff because I'm looking through the, um, the staff report, and in there, there's only a note in there from NDOT that just kind of says road conditions, but being understanding that the uses would now be limited to residents and now restaurant uh, type, I'm, I'm curious, and, and maybe this is just me not being aware of kind of how things fall after the split between Public Works and NDOT, but um, some of the services that are required from a restaurant, like how are, how are those addressed within a site that really kind of the footprints consumed by the by that structure sure so under the traffic and parking recommendation where you see comply with NDOT roads conditions mm -hmm. NDOT roads condition is referring to the conditions that are above it that oh, are so listed probably. as Nashville DOT recommendation they those used to be listed in our staff reports as roads and traffic and parking but once they became the Department of Transportation, mm -hmm. it's, but they still internally use that to talk about sort of their other section, if you will. Um, and so the recommendation um, would be referring back to the indication about if there's a shared parking agreement, um, that we would be, that, that there would be need to be an easement. Um, but as was mentioned, um, because this is in the UZO, um, there is not a parking requirement. Um, and so they're just basically saying if you do do some sort of shared parking, um, any sort of reviews related to building permit for waste management, um, grease traps, and all of that would be reviewed at the building permit phase. Okay. okay. And then I'm, I'm hearing, I think, from the presentation that there is on-street parking here. How does that work, especially when you have such a small parcel like is there is the, the entire road is designated for on street parking or is it so in nashville if a road is not marked as parking not permitted then parking is permitted um this is an area where there actually are quite a few right-of-ways that are a bit wider and street pavement sections that are wider than other areas so on street parking um, it would be permitted um, the the to the north is an alley so that actually wouldn't permit on street parking but otherwise on street parking unless signed as not being permitted would be and you can actually see sort of on the image there to the south on Elkins you can see some some cars parked on the street and so on street parking Parking, um, is permitted. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I, and I did. I saw the note about a parking agreement. It just sounds like that's not necessarily something that's in that's in place or can be presented to us at this time. Outside of that, I mean, I was looking at the at some of the other descriptive language about this. Or with it being in the UZ, I think this came up to us once before, where there is not a parking requirement, but there is still a requirement for um, like um, ADA accessible, handicap, like are, are those things that are still going to be absorbed with it being a national landmark designation or are those circumvented? So uh, ADA parking requirements, I believe, because it's historic, they likely would not have to provide um, ADA parking um, 
when you're when you're dealing with those sorts of standards, there are exemptions based on if a um, property is designated as historic. Um, and then also the size may not actually trigger it anyway because it's relatively it's so small. small. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, those are those are the. I mean, again, just trying to the configuration of being located where it is and kind of the surrounding properties and not clearly being able to. Um, identify if there was on street parking there, but it seems like it is. It, it's, it was one of those things that jumped out at me when I thought about it as a, as a restaurant. I think there's some, like any historic building, there's some unique challenges that come to providing any service there. But I, I, I like the concept of the, the project. Do we, with this, it's not, a, it's not an SP. Um, and so with that, are, are there any things that we've placed here that are atypical? For landmark, or is what what's here? Uh, the use, I'm assuming, is something that's negotiated based on what the base zoning was, and then what the intended use is. So, a neighborhood landmark is is sort of a unique overlay um, mm -hmm. in that the entire purpose of it is to take a building that is zoned residentially and permit it to be used as something mm -hmm. else, um, and so. The uses are only those that are outlined in the plan and that are approved by council. And so in this case, they are proposing to add restaurant as a use. Um, and so if at some point they came back and somebody wanted to add a different use, it would have to go back through this process again. Um, and so it's a really limited application of um, uh, permitting a different use so that a building that is important to the community and unique can be utilized um, and adaptive re adaptively reused as a way of preserving it. And so this is actually a really good example of where a neighborhood landmark might be appropriate. Um, it's not a commercial rezoning. It's not, um, it's just allowing for additional uses in a building that was built to be commercial where they're not permitted today. And maybe my last question or comment the chair started with me, so we'll, we'll blame him here. The programmatic uses, so we heard kind of the intent of, you know, time, likelihood of when operation is. That language not, at least I didn't see it, it's not in here. And I know, again, it's not an SP, so an SP sometimes has some of that language in terms of how you use the space when you can load in and load out. Um, but we didn't have that here, so I don't know if that's a potential discussion about a condition or not, but just understanding what happens with our recommendation if we agree with the staff recommendation and go forward. Does any of that carry through with any merit or restrictions or is that to the discretion of the applicant or eventual owner who may have a different concept? So there have been examples of neighborhood landmarks in the past that have included operational standards such as um, closing times or um, and sometimes that's even happened in the SP answer I think is a good example of where that's happened in the SP and so I think that if you all had suggestions um, or indications that you may want to make sure that there are hour limitations in regards to how late it can stay open then I think that the council member could certainly add those at the council level and that would not change the recommendation here because it would be um, more restrictive than whatever you may be considering now. Thank you for that. I have a much better understanding. I'll listen to the other commissioner. Thank you. Any other discussion? Commissioner Tibbs. Just have to speak in um, a lot of support of this because this is, uh, it's exciting that this building, which is a 1930s building, and, you know, I'm very much into adaptive reuse and our historic properties, uh, you know, is being so endangered in this city. Uh, and so this is one little area that can be protected and there's a use for it and there's a, uh, an owner that's motivated to, you know, to do this. Uh, and it's, it's so, uh, I, I, you know, I commend them and I, you know, I commend just the creativity to think through it and a, and a way to do it. So very, very much support of this. Any other discussion? Commissioner Clifton. I realize um, some of the speakers against it are, are, are like I am, quite in, interested in preserving neighborhoods and residential parts of neighborhoods. I live uh, four houses from Freedman's. Um, it wouldn't be the same neighborhood without Freedman's, but that, that's another story. But I realize that there's some sincere fear that this would maybe lead to something else. But the more I've listened to exactly what it is, what it does, um, 
uh, the the scope the scale of it uh, I, I I agree with with Brian this is the kind of thing that doesn't come along very often uh, it's a tool we have in our arsenal to protect um, older buildings that still can have a use uh, I like that it's so small scale it wouldn't work if it was much larger for that area but I'm all in favor of this Thank you, Commissioner. Is there a motion? Maybe, maybe we're ready for motion, Commissioner. Will we approve staff recommendation. Will we approve staff recommendation. Proper motion. Second. Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Ayes have it. Unanimous. Thank you. We are now on to forty-nine, and so forty-nine, and so this is kind of a. An interesting case, and I, I know you will get the presentation. So, no, this one's a yeah, this one's. We don't see these types of cases often, but we'll. Well, Lisa's, presenting it. Lisa's presenting it. Oh my gosh, it's very special. Okay, go ahead, Lisa. Here Hi, we go. everyone. Welcome to the last case on the agenda. Um, this is an application to um, rename Forest Avenue 2Rs to Forest Avenue 1R. Um, the, this is a map showing the extent, extents of the road um, starting at Gallatin Avenue and moving east. Um, <laughs> so, uh, just to talk a little bit about the street renaming process, this is um, as outlined um, in the uh, in the uh, Metro code. Um, this is the, uh, any time of any type of application to rename a street is referred to the planning commission through what is called a mandatory referral. Um, it also goes to the ECD board, a, a emergency communications board, and as well as the historic commission makes a recommendation directly to council. Council makes the final decision. Um, the process is that a notice is sent out to um, uh, addresses on the street where who would have their address changed should the should the street be renamed um, they are instructed to uh, reach out to the planning and provide comments um, if they are in support or in opposition if we receive any notes in opposition then a public hearing is required and it is held at the planning commission you are all make a recommendation to council. Ultimately, council makes the final decision. Um, we did compile all of the comments that were received and put them onto uh, the SharePoint file. Um, and we received approximately uh, 20 notes um, in opposition, including phone calls where we had some people that called and we made note of those. Um, and then around 75 or so in support of the change. Um, this was filed by Councilmember Withers at the request of some of the residents along the street. The Historical Commission has provided us with some preliminary research. Typically, they report directly out to the council, but they did provide us some, some um, research, which is helpful when we're looking at street renamings like this. Um, a lot of the times the renamings that we see are ones where it's been requested by um, E911 to provide for clarity or where there's an honorary street renaming um, of a street to a person such as with Representative John Lewis Way, which was um, reviewed and approved by this commission in 2020. Um, this is a situation where you have one spelling of a street and the request is to change it to a different spelling. Um, the Historical Commission research has indicated that there's no evidence that the street is named after a person. Um, it was likely part of a trees theme of streets at that time, which included all of the different trees that I have listed out here. Um, the common spelling of the word forest, if not named after a person, which there's no records that this is, is with one R. Given that and that the historical records have indicated both spellings, but that this seems to be have been part of a trees theme of streets, uh, staff recommendations to approve. Thank you. We'll open this item for public hearing. And Councilman, you're the applicant, so lead us off. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. Th this uh, has been a recurring conversation in East Nashville for uh, certainly through my term, but through several of my predecessors. And it's just kind of the conversation that will not uh, 
go away. And so I'm hoping that we will uh, finally make a decision so that my successors never have to have this conversation again. Um, during my own term, uh, I will say, obviously, I really have had a lot of uh, neighbors who live on the street who, who have requested this um, in the past. The first time that I held a community meeting about it was with the Lachlan Springs Neighborhood Association in 2017. At that time, certainly lots of neighbors uh, were in favor, some were opposed. There wasn't really, uh, at that time at least, an interest in sort of canvassing the neighborhood at that time. Um, and so I kind of put it aside. Um, with lots of the things that happened in 2020, there was quite a bit of revived interest uh, in this topic. Um, emotions were very high. We were going through tornado recovery as well as we were in the pandemic. And so I had said to neighbors at that time, like, I, don't, I just don't think that this uh, is the appropriate time to be going door to door to talk to your neighbors about uh, this change, uh, given the pandemic, frankly. Um, uh, and so, but it, it is an item, like I said, I have had neighbors who have requested it for a long time. I've had neighbors who've been in opposition to it the whole time. I think they, they both have their points. Uh, I don't think it's uh, at this stage is something that is going to be resolved any way other than the council looking at what does the majority want and what the majority wants is for this to be changed to forest with one R. Um, as Ms. Milligan has indicated, there's not uh, evidence this, that this was named after a person. One of the ironies is that actually gives us some freedom. State law kind of limits our ability to rename things that are named after people sometimes. There's not a record of it. That actually gives us the ability to make this what I will classify as a correction of a typo. Um, this area was outside of the city limits in the 1880s when Lachlan Springs started to be platted. Uh, the very first version of uh, reference to this name was with one R. Uh, the historical record shows that it has gone back and forth, but even sometimes after it was later versions would have it with one R and then like with a pencil mark with another R, uh, it's just gone back and forth several times. Um, the very, very end of the street was not even uh, part of that the first portion of the street was between 14th and 16th. I uh, did not connect to Gallatin, but that first portion was originally called Forest with one R. Then the street was expanded over to what is today 17th. The numerical system in Nashville didn't have until the early 20th century, but so they had different names. Uh, then uh, the portion that goes to the end of the lot, uh, and then uh, actually one of the later pieces was the part that extended out to Gallatin. Um, but again, the very first version of it was with Forest with one R. Um, we've had uh, some back and forth over periods of time. Uh, I have heard from neighbors who are concerned about uh, mail delivery or things like that. So the way that that works is that um, NDOT uh, works with the post office and you will continue to get your uh, mail delivered either way uh, for a full year um, with no action actually required on your part. Um, that is the way that that, that works. Um, these days, a lot of uh, bills and things like that, again, not for everyone, but a lot of those are done um, electronically. So usually most people who are getting bills done today, it is uh, e-billing that is done based on an account number, not on an actual street address. Um, one other thing that I'll say is that we've, a lot, many, many of these streets have been renamed multiple things over time anyway. So like this is not the first and it will not be the last street renaming. Um, in recent decades, I think a lot of times we have had streets that have been renamed after people, Representative John Lewis Way in District 17, Kearney Street was renamed to Bianca Page Way. Um, so sometimes that is a little bit more specific to a person. In uh, the Madison area, Councilmember Van Rees has done a lot of work on street renamings up there. There were a, multi a multitude of different due west avenues uh, to an extent that was actually confusing to emergency communications. And so one of those due west avenues, she changed to Skyline Ridge Drive as part of a, a placemaking uh, scenario. Another street by Nosy College of Art, uh, they renamed to Creative Way or, or things like that. So Councilmember Van Rees has done lots of that. Um, uh, sort of thing, um, uh, usually not after a person, but a, a little bit more of uh, placemaking. Uh, I, I think that um, in Lachlan Springs, we, we have lots of placemaking already, so that's not necessarily needed here. Um, but with Forest Avenue, again, uh, as Ms. Milligan indicated, originally a lot of these streets had a, a tree kind of a theme. Another famous example, not so close to here, but Tulip Street Methodist Church was at 6th and uh, Russell. That was originally Tulip Street. That's what it was originally called, and it still retains that name. Um, 
So here, you know, with Forest Avenue, originally had one R. Um, one of the nice things about it is that this goes all the way to the the terminus of the street is at an actual forest, and we are uh, very lucky that uh, that property owner is working with us to uh, working with Metro to um, sell at a discount, but to sell uh, most of that last parcel on the street to the city to expand the park to preserve a, an actual forest that is there. I think that's a really neat thing. Um, in terms of inconvenience, uh, again, I mean, uh, for most residents, they will never see a difference. Um, if you have mail that is coming to you, or if you have a contractor or something like that is coming to you, and you put that your address is, let's say, uh, 1700 Forest Avenue, Nashville, Tennessee, 37206, I had one person that wrote that, like, well, they might go to another city. And I'm like, well, if you put the city and zip code in your address, they're going to find you. Um, um, probably. So I, that one, I, I'm not convinced of that particular uh, comment. But I will uh, say that for businesses, sometimes because businesses, they might have billboard signs that they put up, they might have print materials out, they might have other printed materials where it, it, there would be a cost uh, associated with um, with uh, renaming a street, even, even in such a minor way. One of the things that I've really been delighted to see is that quite a few of the business owners who are on the street, who do have businesses on the street, have written in support. And I think that's that's a great thing to see. Roseman Beauty Queen has done that. Um, a hip Zipper Five Spot is enthusiastically um, uh, in favor of renaming the street to Forest with one R. So those, those folks that are kind of most affected by it are the businesses. And what I've heard from the business owners is that they've written letters in support. Their employees have written letters of support. Um, so I think there's a lot of enthusiasm for folks to get this done. I do understand that some neighbors don't. But at this point, I'm really kind of looking at what does the majority want. And it's very clear to me that the majority does want the change. Thank you, Councilman. We're in the public hearing portion, and so now we're ready. Is anyone wishing to speak in support? Come on up if you'll line up. And everyone has two minutes. The timer is here. Please state your name and address. And uh, my name is uh, Nell. Actually, my legal name is Bernella Levin. I live at 1611 Forest with two R's, EST Avenue, where I have lived with my husband, Michael since 1996 and we support this i'm tired of living on a street that is named after the nathan bedford forest who was a member of the ku klux klan and i was one of the activists that was down there that we finally got the statue of nathan bedford forest removed from our state legislature um it's now in the state museum which is a good place for it and we we, we finally got it out of there. So I support this change. Michael, Thank you. you want to say? Right. Yeah. I'm Michael August. I am, a, as you said, her husband. And I live at 1611 Forest Avenue with two R's. I'll get to that. Uh, two points. Uh, one, one, the symbolic, the, uh, the naming of the street, as we are assuming, is after Nathan Bedford Forrest, one of the early leaders of the Ku Klux Klan, um, that's, that's offensive and perhaps even insulting for, to some people. It's uncomfortable for us. Um, I, 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 if, the street was, if I thought the street was named for Forrest Gump, I probably wouldn't have a problem. But here we are. Um, and the second thing is I get, I, I get tired of giving people my address. Oh, I live at 1611 Forrest. Oh, that's two R's. And I have to say two R's every, you know, very often when I give when I give out my address. So that's that's my thing. Thanks for letting me share. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, um, my name is Erin Kais. I live uh, with my family at eighteen hundred Forest Avenue. Can you move up a little bit closer to the mic. <laughs> and pull it down a little bit so for short people. Um. Uh, I've, I've lived on forest since 2006 with my family and in speaking with neighbors over the past several years, I've found them to be overwhelmingly in support of returning the spelling of the street name to the original spelling for several reasons. First, the change is simply restoring the original name of the street and providing greater historic accuracy. 
After 2020 tornado, when my husband and I were researching our home in order to restore the original 1905 exterior, we were surprised to find that multiple historic maps showed the spelling with one R. On the original 1895 plat map of the area, I think that was 1897 actually, uh, when it was first incorporated, the street was named along with similar tree themes as uh, Councilman Withers um, explained, including Woodland, Grove, Holly, and others. It continued to be spelled that way for decades until eventually the spelling with two R's began to be used off and on. We were unable to find information indicating why or when the name was changed to a spelling with two R's. We asked Councilman Withers to help us research this information and he enlisted Metro Historic and Metro Archives who were also unable to find information that the street was ever officially renamed at all. Second, it can't be left unsaid that the current spelling with two R's does lend itself to the appearance that we intend to honor Nathan Bedford Forrest when that was never the case and never the intention. My 11 year old son um, wrote a letter to the commission in support of this change because he was concerned that the street he lives on appears to be named after someone who fought to preserve slavery. Um, and finally, um, it's a wonderful tribute to um, the forest we're working to restore at the end of our street. Um, thank you, ma'am. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Hello, I'm Sean Kais at 1800 Forest Avenue. I would like to thank my council member for bringing this forward. And I feel that all the reasons that he has presented today uh, make this uh, bring a, a very good argument for why it should be passed. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. Uh, my name is Carrie Adams. My husband, Matthew Stitzline, and our three children, we live at 1716 Forest Avenue. I am here to support the renaming of Forest. I've personally spoken with 40 or more of my fellow forest neighbors who are in favor of this change, gathering signatures and letters for today's hearing. This is something, as Councilman Withers said, that we have long agitated for. We worked hard to gather all the letters and signature on hearing that we had 75 on a relatively short street is hopefully impressive to you all. It certainly felt like we worked hard to make sure that all of our, um, all the supporters' voices were heard. Um, not only does restoring the name return our street to the neighborhood's founding naming convention, but it ensures that the commonly held association of the current name with the Confederate founder of the KKK is soundly repudiated. Um, this is a relatively minor administrative change that will easily be managed by NDOT and the USPS, but is incredibly meaningful to my family. Uh, my daughters wrote a letter. If you look at the drive, you can read um, how strongly they feel about living on a street that, that they believe was named after Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, and the majority of our neighbors, it is incredibly meaningful to us that you support this change and that we go back to the original spelling of Forest Avenue. We thank Councilman Withers for filing this request and hope that we have the support of all of you. Uh, my family and I, again, are in support of renaming it and we look forward to your approval. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Jude Mason. I live with my husband and my children at 1516 Forest Avenue. Um, we have long talked with Councilman Withers about, yeah, I'm not from here, but I am a citizen. Um, we've long talked with Councilman Withers about returning the name to Forest with one R. Um, we really just want to get what we have come to say is get rid of the extra R for racist. Um, while people will always say that there is no proof that it is named to honor the founder of the KKK, um, there's of course a saying that possession is nine tenths of the law and I think with this it's perception is nine tenths in that everything else in the south, everything else in Nashville that is spelt forest with two R's is to do with honoring somebody who is highly problematic. Um, when we heard there had been some opposition, I personally went door to door um, from the 1400 to the 1700 block and spoke to almost every neighbor um, 
that was there, uh, which was around 35 people, not one of them was against this. Um, I also spoke to the, because I was worried, I went, I was, I went and spoke to the um, businesses at the front and they were all, I was very pleased when they said how they were um, in support as well. Um, yeah, so thank you again to Councilman Withers. Thanks to my wonderful neighbours. This is something that we've wanted for ages and we'd really appreciate it if we could go back to just one hour. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Hello. My name is Sarah Baer and I live with my son Oliver at 1411 Forest Avenue. I've lived in this neighborhood since 2008 and I know this is not the first time that this topic has come up. Um, I have been one of the many who've tried to organize this over the years in speaking with our council member and I appreciate your giving this time and space to have this conversation again. The issues that you hear on this council they affect lives and safety of, and, the, and the safety of those who live in many ways. Changing the spelling of Forest Avenue in East Nashville from having two R's to having one does not affect my child's safety. I know that, but it does teach him that we have the ability to make the change when change is needed. We have an opportunity here. It's really a gift. We can show our community that change is possible when you stand up to do the right thing. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a lot of things to a lot of people. His history and contributions to our state and our country have been debated for years. I'm not gonna do that. What I will, when I explained to my child that our street was named, it was spelled with two R's because it was named after the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, he simply said, Mom, we have to change that. He's 10. We've seen the maps. It's been changed once before, if not multiple times, and it can be changed again. Cities like Memphis have been successful in changing the spelling of their Forest Avenue, and we will see more cities doing the same. Let's not be the city that resists something so simple. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Welcome. Good evening, y'all. Uh, my name's Jeremy Lindsay. I'm at 1513 Forest with my wife, Allison, and my daughter, Ida. Uh, it's really my wife, Allison, and our next door neighbor, Monique Ross at 1511 Forest, who cannot be here tonight, that I'm speaking for tonight. My wife is African American. Monique is African American. We moved to the neighborhood two years ago and have been struck by how welcoming and loving it is. And um, to me, this is not a politicized action. It's simply one of harm reduction. I think the people that are opposed to this, if they knew Allison and they knew Monique, and they knew they could make them feel a little more comfortable, it'd be a pretty pretty easy call. So uh, anyway, it's one R, feels like a pretty easy ask, and uh, it'd make people feel a lot less welcome. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak in support? Seeing none, anyone wishing to speak in opposition? Come on up. Welcome. I first have a procedural question that sure. I would like to ask, not on my time, hopefully. Yeah, we'll hold the time. We'll, what's your procedural question? Okay, uh, it regards the mailing of the notices. The notices for May 17th and May 24th were mailed out and asked us to respond either verbally or in writing back to the commission or the planning agent. Uh, at that time, the zip code on the letterhead was 37219. I proceeded to take my letter to the post office to have certified mail. They could not find an address with your name and address on it for the zip code 37219. He proceeded to continue to work probably for about seven minutes trying to find, he asked me what it was about. I told him it was Metro government, proceeded on and on and on. He said, you've got the wrong zip code. That is not your zip code. Your zip code is 37210 and proceeded to change it on the notices. I said, well, what will happen if other people send in a letter with the old the zip code 19 on it? He said it will not be delivered. Thank you, we'll take that under consideration. Well, I think that you don't have everybody's information. 
the staff keep a record of the post office notice information? So we'll look into it. But okay, I but suggest you go ahead and get I started. think the procedural process is void, is wrong then, and it should be repeated again. This hearing should be canceled and the process should start again because of the fact that not everybody, I think, had an opportunity to provide notice. Okay, hold on, let me, we're gonna to talk to our counselor, okay? Okay. Hold on one second. Sure. So what I was just saying is we keep a record of the of the notices. And mm -hmm. so my recommendation to the commission is to go ahead and complete the public hearing. You have several folks here speaking in opposition. Once we pull up the record, then the commission can make a determination. But we received, Lisa, how many comments about this case? 70? Or how many total? Close to a close to a hundred, including okay. a lot of phone calls. So somehow the notice went out. So we will. But my advice is to go ahead and hold, finish the public hearing while Lisa does a check on the um, postal information, and then we can advise you. Our counselor and our director is advising us of that. Okay. I All just right. wanted to make you aware. And this no, is the thank you. So we're going to start your time, okay? Well, let me just say this is another example of expense on your part for your letterhead because that should have been thrown away when the zip code changed. That shouldn't be on that time. All right, Lisa, start her time over again. Thank you. Okay. I'm Cecilia Arbuckle. I live at 1307 Forest Avenue. I've lived there for 75 years. My father and mother lived there and my grandparents lived there. So we're talking about approximately 100 years of living at the same address. The artifacts from my house show through the Bible and through other correspondence that there was a double spelling of forest, the R's in forest throughout those 100 years. In 1888, there's a Nashville City Directory that has the double R. In 1908, there's an atlas that has the double R. And in 1914, there is another map that has the double R. I agree that there has been an interchange between one R and two R's, primarily the one R at the earliest part of the development of the neighborhood. But for the last 100 years, the spelling has been two R's. The problem, I thought that the problem for 911 was the mapping and looking at the map and what was wrong with the map that they couldn't get the information correct. But the mapping for 911, if that is true, comes through Google or those maps that are up to date. Those maps have the current spelling that we have now for them. If we were to change the name back to the original name, the original name on Forest Avenue was Marlowe, not Forest. Um, the cost is primarily the need that I see as part of the problem because there is a cost involved in it. And Mr. Wills, you stated or you wrote two years ago or more than two years ago that if one person objected that you would not present this and it would not be heard. And I do object to this. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anyone else? Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Good evening. I sure didn't expect to be here five and a half hours after I arrived at four o'clock, but I know no one else did here either. Uh, my name is David Smith. And I live at 1204 Forest Avenue uh, in a home that my grandfather purchased in 1929. It's passed down through four generations. And um, I 
first heard about this in 2017, I believe, when it was brought before the Lockton Springs Neighborhood Association, which I proudly served on back in the 80s um, and moved away to Goodlettsville, moved back. It's passed down, like I said, three or four generations since. But um, this was uh, 2017, I think this was brought about, and it was brought up because of the name of Nathan Bedford Forrest in 2020, Councilman Withers, announced on social media that the um, findings from the Metro Historic Commission proved that there was never any findings that uh, the name had any relation with Nathan Bedford Forrest. So I thought it's time that the whole situation had gone away and that was the only reason people were seeking the change. Um, since that time, um, I know that it came about that the original name was Forrest with one R. Um, I, as Ms. Arbuckle just spoke, also found on social media where uh, the Metro Archives showed that a streetcar name, streetcar street was named Forest Avenue, F-O-R-R-E-S-T in 1888. And the only thing that I've seen to contradict that was in 1908, a map that has one R. That was the first time I'd ever seen anything about an R and I just learned tonight from Councilman Withers that he said the original name was F-O-R-E-S-T. I don't, I don't know where that came from. Uh, so I have to stand before you just to ask you to vote no. I know the council is going to make the final decision in this matter, but I had to come before you just because um, I, I don't know any other reason why uh, the street would be named anything but F-O-R-E-S-T, saying that it's not having anything to do with Nathan Bedford Forrest. If it did, I wouldn't be sitting here arguing with it tonight. Thank you all for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming down. Anybody else wishing to speak in opposition? Seeing none, Councilman, rebuttal. Uh, oh, and, but first, before the rebuttal, we had a question on procedural issues. So, Director. So, we have a post office box address and we have a physical address and the planning department uses both. And so, if you look at our website, you see both addresses. And if you are a constituent, you can mail to both addresses. So, um, what we don't know is what information was on the return uh, post or the return um, address or envelope um, that was sent out to constituents. It may have been correct. It may be that there was an issue. We just don't have the record on the um, the the in our our web uh, our web face basically and so i would just say the reason there's 37219 is because that's our po box and we also use that so that that's a that's fine and so we we get correspondence there i think just in c consulting with our council mm -hmm. what i believe we would recommend is to go ahead and proceed with your vote at this time if we determine tomorrow when we can go back and access the envelopes that there was any type of noticing issue then we can reach out to the council office and notify them of that you are in a advisory role to council and so we can't determine at this point if there was an issue. Lisa, did I, is there anything else you would add to that? Okay. There were no envelopes mailed to us. Ma'am, I'm we're sorry. Gonna work, we're gonna, I've said on the record, we're gonna work on it, but we have to have information tomorrow from the mail notice. If there is a legal issue, our, our legal counsel is aware of this, we will consult with Metro Council Office. But at this point, the body has a decision before it and um, you've had a public hearing, and so my recommendation is just to is to give your advice to council. If there's an issue, we'll document it, and you, Metro Director. Council can make a determination about how to proceed. Councilor, anything else? No, I concur. And this is before you at this time. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Um, and you can go ahead with the vote, and we can look into cure issues later. Thank you, and Councilman. I think we should close the public hearing, and then we'll I'll call on you first. Seeing no one else wishes to speak, I declare the public hearing closed. Councilman. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, again, uh, I'll go back to this street name has changed a bunch of times, including it's been extended. Lots of other streets had different names at different times. And so um, the first version uh, of any of this that was anything like Forest was with one R. Um, and that is uh, provided by uh, Metro Archives. Uh, it, 
very shortly after that, the other version appeared. There were versions that appeared with one R, as I mentioned, with a pencil mark, with a second R. So it's going back and forth. But uh, what, what I would really humbly suggest to everyone here is that um, notice mailings did go out. Um, lots of responses were received. Um, I went through this morning um, and based on my count, like I've gone through to make sure because we've had petitions, we've had people send emails directly. Sometimes you have more than one person at an address. I've got close to 60 ad street addresses where one or more people, persons in the household have written in favor of it. So I think public participation has been robust. We have received phone calls. Um, so I think public notice happened uh, and uh, public notice responses were received. Um, and to the, re to the reference of would I bring something forward to the council, what I had stated in the past was that if one person objects, it has to have a public hearing, which is what we have seen today. Um, and that my recommendation at that time in 2017 was that uh, if neighbors were really interested in moving forward, that, that they kind of do a little bit more homework. Um, uh, Obviously in 2020, um, getting folks to knock on doors was not uh, the wisest idea given the, um, given the pandemic, although I understand that emotions are very high at that time. Uh, for this one in particular, uh, it's something that has been on my list for a little while um, with lots of things going on in our General Assembly uh, and speaking with Metro, with the mayor's office and with those who interact with the General Assembly, they. Uh, recommended waiting uh, until the conclusion of the, until the General Assembly adjourned just to see if just if anything else passed that we would uh, potentially be conflicting with. And so when that did not occur, uh, then there was a uh, reason to move forward with, with the question. So um, I, uh, above all, I mean, uh, I think what one of the neighbors uh, stated uh, is profound to me, which is, well, there are two, two that are profound. One is that Perception is a great part of reality. And for many neighbors, this is a conversation that they keep having to have over and 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 over again. And we can finally have a light at the end of the tunnel where that that question can be settled. That's number one. Another thing that I think that I heard a neighbor say to that that I also think was very profound is like, if you could make one minor tiny change and it would make your neighbors feel, it'd be a couple of minutes of inconvenience, but it would really make your neighbors feel a whole lot better and more welcome in your community, would you do that? And I believe that for most neighbors and probably even for those neighbors, they would. And for that, I rest my case and request the uh, support of the commission and a recommendation to council. Thank you, Councilman. Any other discussion? One native. Commissioner Johnson. Just wondering, I think this is the first case for us. And, uh, you know, one thing I feel comfortable with uh, this interesting street name change is pronouns same. So, because if a street name is different, sometimes we worry if the emergency vehicle will be going to the right direction, because sometimes street uh, is separated and, you know, depending on the house number, you have to take a long way or, you know, different story, but avenue and uh, street and then go to different street. But this case, since it's pronounced both forest, so I think we don't have to worry about that. So with that, uh, do we have any specific procedure or policy we have to follow to recommend? Or can we decide because of uh, overwhelming support? So therefore, you know, we are support opposed. Or would that be sufficient? Street renamings are a little unusual in terms of the commission's role. I believe we are assigned to this because we often quarterback involvement with other departments like police and fire to make sure that there's no conflict. Um, but there aren't just clear guidelines for what the commission should consider. And so that's why in our recommendation, we said absent other information and indicators such as from, from historic, the, the correct spelling is what we went with, which seems rather soft. Um, 
but I would just say use your best discretion and your conscience and you've heard from the public. And so in my mind, that is a valid way of proceeding. So I will uh, support staff recommendation for two reasons. One, uh, preliminary uh, research shows a street name is rather uh, related to tree. So forest with one R seems uh, suitable for that street. And also same pronunciation, as I said, so I don't have any uh, health uh, concern sending the emergency vehicle to the wrong street and overwhelming uh, community support. Uh, therefore, I am comfortable uh, recommending staff recommendation. Thank you. Any other discussion? No, that was, she did not make a motion, but she, uh, is there a mo <laughs> Mr. Tibbs? Commissioner Tibbs? Well, it wasn't a motion. She needs to say a motion. So uh, make a motion to approve. All right, it's a proper motion. Is there a second? Second. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. I have it. All right. Now. Well, it's 15 to 11, and we have finally finished our public hearing portion of the meeting, which is great. So now we are on to other business. So historic. Yes, uh, very quickly, uh, we met yesterday and we discussed uh, Second Avenue design guideline update. Uh, that is currently Second Avenue uh, buildings allow one addition on rooftop if that is meet certain setback and visibility and so forth. And update is uh, we are considering if we should allow additional uh, story or a partial story and uh, but maximum of three that will be rooftop addition but it has to meet uh, the test certain setback and visibility and so forth so uh, at the Yesterday's uh, meeting, uh, we discussed but deferred a final decision. So if any public is interested, give us input. Uh, we are open to public input on that. Thank you. Parks, Commissioner Henley, our new Parks member. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, just briefly, I just wanted to inform the commission that there is um, conversation happening within the Parks Department about how to formalize the communications with parks um, and greenways with the planning department as well as other departments. So just looking forward to working there collaboratively as that, as that becomes more formalized. Thank you. We don't, executive committee, we don't have anything to report. Well, we only have one meeting. So remember, we only have one meeting in July. And then director, director's report. I just hope you'll join me in acknowledging the land development staff who, um, this is the last meeting that would give recommendations to this council session. They have put an enormous amount of work in over particularly the last three to four months. They always are busy, but this has been a huge lift. So. Bravo. And it's just the three of them. Just kidding. But anyway, thank you to the team and thank you all for your public service. Thank you, Commissioner, for joining us on a big meeting. I <laughs> welcome your your participation as well. And I wish you a, a happy uh, Fourth of July uh, and look forward to seeing all of you at the second meeting in July. Councilman, your last legislative report. Well, no one's more thrilled to see this uh, week ending than Council Members because, well, we passed a budget on Tuesday and uh, our meeting got out before 1 a.m., which, like, everyone lost their their pool on, it was like, is it going to be 1.15 or 3.30? So everyone lost, but we were glad to be home. But we passed a budget that does include a 6% COLA from Metro government employees. Um, uh, we also were able to fund some other initiatives using uh, fund balance surpluses. So we were able to pay for some things cash uh, rather than issue bonds, which is good. Um, there's a lot of discussion. There was a lot of discussion about the historic Morris building, which we were not able to fund in this particular budget, but I know that that discussion will continue and 
hope that uh, Metro government is finally able to play a role of some sort in preserving that building that we've been talking about for a long time and we know how important it is. But uh, in this budget, uh, the funding source was not uh, sufficient or uh, considered ideal, but we'll keep trying. But other than that, uh, look forward to seeing everyone in about four weeks, maybe. So. Thank you, Councilman. Next meeting is July 27th, and is there a motion to adjourn? It's the morning. We're adjourned. Mm -hmm. As well. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.